My name is Charles, and I'm from Minnesota. I stumbled upon your YouTube channel at the beginning of this year. I'm a retired forest ranger, having spent the better part of three decades working for the U.S. Forest Service's Law Enforcement and Investigations Division. Since my retirement, I've had plenty of time on my hands, and over the past few months, I've spent a lot of that time listening to various anthologies that you've published. I think it's awesome that you publish the stories of regular folks like me. So, with that in mind, I think I have a story that you might be interested in. It seems a little strange that I'm so excited to tell you about this, as it's not exactly the kind of thing most people want to hear. I used to wonder how you get so many people wanting to share their bad memories with you. But after having thought about it for a while, I think I've figured it out. These aren't the kind of things that we can talk about around the dinner table in polite company, and I've never had a single person ask me in the flesh, what was the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? People don't want to know, at least not the kind of people I've ever associated with. But at the same time, these are things that, for whatever reason, we want to share with people. And much like your channel's viewers, I'm pretty apt to lend my ear to a story that's a little darker. So without further rambling, this is the story of one of the truly terrifying moments in my time as a forest ranger. For the vast majority of my career, I was posted in the Voyagers National Park, up near the Canadian border. Since the park is split in two by a series of lakes, it's popular with fishermen and kayakers. But these lakes are also populated by many small islands, many of which are popular camping spots. People come up to the VNP to get away from the city and get some privacy, and it doesn't get much more private than your own personal island, does it? Well, one afternoon I got a call from a chief ranger asking me to do him a little favor. He had gotten a call from the International Falls Police Department, a small border city about 20 miles to the west, after an officer over there had received a missing persons report. Some lady's husband had gone on a camping trip with an old friend and had failed to return after being due back that morning. My husband was to head over to their regular camping spot on a place called Wolf Island to see if they'd moved on or not. The ranger team at VNP is probably one of the most amphibious in the country, definitely the most waterborne in the region. Half of our job consists of policing the waterways and making sure all fishing and boating is within regulation. So not only do we have ready access to kayaks and motorboats, but we're very comfortable operating them. So when I got the call, I headed to the Ash River Visitor Center, which was where we docked our boats. But then, just as I'm prepping the boat to sail over to Wolf Island, I get a second call from the chief. The IFPD had reached out with an update, one I needed to be informed of immediately. According to the chief, this wasn't just a case of two fishermen having overslept after too many Miller lights. The missing man's son had been in touch, and this time it was to warn law enforcement that not only was his father most likely armed, but he had been acting extremely erratically prior to departing for the camping trip. This is not what I'd been hoping to hear when I'd heard that there was an update, but I was more than equipped to deal with the situation. Seeing as I was on the law enforcement side of things as opposed to working solely at the visitor center, I had pretty much all the same options as your average police officer. But that didn't mean that I wasn't feeling a sense of apprehension regarding what I might run up against. Nine times out of ten, incidents in the park are resolved quickly and peacefully. But, as you can probably guess, it's that one in ten that keeps you up at night. So after prepping the boat, I sailed west for around 20 to 25 minutes, until I spotted Wolf Island. After using my binoculars to observe the island from a safe distance, I could make out a slight plume of smoke coming from its eastern side. I could have really done with some kind of bullhorn to call out to the missing camper, but I didn't have the good sense to bring one. So I was forced to bring my boat right up to within about 20 or 30 feet of the shore before calling out using nothing but my lung power. I called out once and then twice, and after the third call received no response, I decided to make landfall in order to get a visual on the campfire, which presumably had been started by our missing camper. I brought the boat up a little closer, hopped overboard, then waded my way ashore, calling out to our missing camper all the while. I could smell the campfire by that point, along with whatever was cooking on it, so I was doubtless within earshot of whoever had been tending to it. But since no one called back, and since I didn't see anyone as I walked up the beach, I figured whoever had made camp had moved on. Yet as I walked further onto the island in search of the source of the smoke, something caught my eye. 
For as long as I live, I'll remember this in photographic detail. It runs in my head on its own sometimes. Like someone pressed play on a remote control in my brain, I saw something falling out of the corner of my eye, and when I looked, I saw it was a raven, landing to join some of its brothers and sisters. But then I saw what it was landing on. There was a man sitting in a camping chair, not quite upright, but not all the way slouched either, with a big old hole in the upper rear portion of his skull. One of the ravens was pushing its beak into the hole while a few others fought over whatever had leaked onto the ground. The body accounted for one of our missing campers, but I didn't have to wait long to find the second. Lying motionless next to the campfire was what remained of the second missing camper. Someone had made the effort to cut off his legs, I'm guessing after he was deceased, and had worked on cutting them into small sections before placing them onto the fire. What had been smelling on the way in hadn't been the camper's late lunch. It had been a section of the second camper's leg sizzling away on the dying embers. I guess the guy in the chair hadn't the heart to finish disposing of his camping buddy and had decided to let nature take its course on both of them. We never did find out why it happened, but we did figure out how the killer had invited his friend on a camping trip to their regular spot. He hadn't hidden anything from his wife or anyone else for that matter which led us to believe that his decision to kill his camping buddy was either a spontaneous one or that he had planned to simply kill him before taking his own life as a way of avoiding any consequences. He obviously wanted to conceal what he'd done, at least at one point we believed he had. But then, this is where another argument for the spontaneous murder theory comes into play. Personally, I don't believe that he'd taken the time to research just how arduous the disposal of a dead body can be. There was no accelerant at the scene, so I don't think he'd planned to burn his friend's body. And when it became obvious that it was going to take way longer than he'd thought, and that law enforcement might well come looking for him or his dead friend before the disposal could be completed, I think he decided to just check out there and then. There was a somber mood among the park staff for a while after that. As far as I knew, nothing like that had ever happened before, and nothing like that happened again for the remainder of my career. As you can probably guess, national parks aren't exactly high crime areas, and at the VNP, the most intense things generally get is catching up to a speeding boating party so you can tell them to slow down. So to have something so terrible happen right under our noses had a real strong effect on our mood during the weeks that followed. Sometimes I think about what happened in that guy's head to make him want to murder one of his best friends. Like I said, we didn't hear about any affairs or betrayals or anything else that might cause a man to temporarily go crazy. It's all just one big mystery. And like so many other of life's mysteries, I think I'm a lot more comfortable living in blissful ignorance. I've always been drawn to the calm and beauty of the great outdoors, so I decided to become a park ranger in a small rural state park known as Croft State Park, nestled deep in the heart of the dense forest. The park was a haven for hikers and nature enthusiasts alike, but little did I know it was also a haven for something much darker and more sinister. I had heard the rumors about Croft State Park long before I accepted the job. People talked of strange occurrences, eerie voices in the wind, and shadowy figures that wandered through most of the night. Most dismissed it as superstitious nonsense, but I couldn't help but be intrigued by the stories. I figured it was probably all just local legend, and I was determined to prove the skeptics wrong. My first few weeks as a park ranger were actually quite peaceful. I spent my days patrolling the serene trails and ensuring the safety of visitors. The park seemed like any other, with the rustling leaves and the chirping of birds providing a soothing backdrop to my working environment. But as the days turned into weeks and summer transitioned into fall, I noticed oddities I couldn't quite explain. One chilly evening, I was finishing my rounds when I heard it for the first time, a soft haunting whisper carried on the breeze, just barely audible over the sound of my footsteps. I stopped dead in my tracks, trying to make out the words. The voice sounded distant and mournful, as if it were calling out to me from the shadows. My heart raced as I scanned the darkening forest, but no one was in sight. I brushed off the experience as a trick of the wind, but the whispers continued to haunt my nights in the park. I heard them when I was alone in my cabin, 
their ethereal tone seeping through the wooden walls. They echoed through the trees as I walked the trails, making me feel like I was being watched at every moment. The park that had once felt like my home now seemed like a foreign foreboding place. As the whispers grew louder, other strange occurrences began to take place. I stumbled upon ancient, weathered totems and symbols etched into trees. They seemed to have no rhyme or reason, but their presence sent shivers down my spine. The wildlife, once abundant, started to slowly disappear, leaving an eerie silence in its wake. The park's beauty had turned into a nightmarish landscape. One moonless night, as I patrolled the park alone, the atmosphere grew thick with an oppressive darkness. I knew I wasn't alone, and the fear gnawing at me for weeks finally erupted. I could hear footsteps that weren't mine, rustling leaves that couldn't be attributed to the wind, and the chilling laughter of children echoing through the trees. But when I shone my flashlight into the dense undergrowth, no one was ever there. Dread settled in as I realized that the stories of Croft State Park were not just tales, but a living nightmare. It was as if the forest had come alive, and evil forces intent on driving me away were tormenting me. But I was a park ranger dedicated to my duty, and I couldn't abandon my post. I began researching the park's history, searching for clues about its dark past. It was then that I stumbled upon an old dusty journal hidden in the back of the ranger station. This was a diary that belonged to a former park ranger, and its entries chronicled a descent into madness. The ranger wrote of the whispers, the symbols, and the strange figures that had tormented him until he had disappeared without a trace. Terrified by what I had read, I knew I had to confront whatever dark presence dwelled within Croft State Park. Armed with knowledge from the journal, I ventured deeper into the park, following the whispers to a long-forgotten clearing. There, I found a circle of weathered stones, their surfaces etched with symbols that matched those I had discovered on the trees. As I stood in the circle's center, the whispers grew more insistent. The shadows around me seemed to take form, merging into a group of ghostly children. They giggled and sang songs from a bygone era, their voices filled with otherworldly sorrow. I knew I had to do something to break the curse that had plagued Croft State Park for centuries. With trembling hands, I recited the words from the journal, calling upon the spirits to release their hold on the park. The children's laughter turned to cries, and the symbols on the stones began to glow in an eerie light. The ground trembled, and the forest came alive with a furious wind. In a blinding flash, the spirits were gone, and Croft State Park fell silent. The whispers faded, and the symbols on the trees vanished, leaving the park in an eerie calm. I knew that I had done something. I don't know if it was what I needed to do, but that experience had taken a toll on me. I don't know how much of it was hallucination from being overly tired or just from being incredibly anxious, but I do know that this was not my imagination. Croft State Park was once a place of beauty and serenity to me, but it had been forever changed in my eyes. I had confronted the darkness that lurked within, and I had survived to tell the tale, but the memory of that night would forever haunt that state park for me. It would never leave my mind, my memory forever etched with a constant reminder of otherworldly forces that can exist even in the most calm of places. I grew up in St. Louis, but I moved to Knoxville after enrolling at the University of Tennessee. During the summer between my freshman and sophomore years, I decided to sign up for a seasonal volunteer ranger program at the nearby Great Smoky Mountains National Park. My career aspirations leaned more towards sitting behind a desk, but the romanticized idea of being a park ranger had always fascinated me. Perhaps it was the allure of working outdoors, rescuing wounded animals, and becoming one with nature. So when the opportunity arose to play the part of a ranger for a month while donning my very own campaign hat, I couldn't resist. For seven long months, I eagerly looked forward to this adventure. However, my initial enthusiasm was met with a dose of reality. The seasonal volunteer program primarily served as a way to secure vacation time for the understaffed ranger teams. We were never entrusted with tasks that required real experience or expertise. Most of the time, Myself and the other two volunteers found ourselves staffing the park's visitor center. The remaining 40% of the time, 
we were tasked with basic administrative work or boundary maintenance. Although it wasn't the exhilarating experience I had envisioned, I preferred the boundary maintenance tasks over being cooped up indoors. Boundary maintenance was essentially a fancy term for fence checking. My responsibilities involved walking long sections of boundary fence to ensure they were in good repair. It was during one of these hikes that I encountered someone I would never forget, even after all these years. I was near Cosby Creek, located on the eastern boundary of the park, an area of particular importance during boundary checks due to an old graveyard called Tritt Cemetery. We needed to ensure that wildlife didn't disturb the resting place of the deceased. After confirming the fences around the cemetery were intact, I continued eastward along the fence line for about 10 to 15 minutes. Suddenly I spotted movement ahead through the trees. The moment I laid eyes on the figure, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was as if my mind momentarily questioned the reality before me. The girl, who moved softly through the trees, was in a horrific state. She was completely naked, her skin marred with clotted blood and dried gore. Every inch of her body, from her hair down to her toes, was covered in blood. It was astonishing that she could even stand on her feet. Without hesitation, I rushed into action. I approached her as she collapsed into the dirt, removed my shirt, and used it to cover her as best I could. Gently, I picked her up and carried her back to my truck. Thankfully, I had found her not far from where I had parked. Exhausted by the time we reached my truck, I realized that there was an urgent care center in Newport, about 12 miles north of Cosby. I drove as fast as I could with the girl in the back seat, repeating, Don't close your eyes, you have to stay awake. She kept her eyes wide open but remained silent, staring at nothing, until we finally arrived at the urgent care center. The medical staff immediately attended to her, and I explained the situation. It was here that my role in this ordeal ended. They informed me that the girl would be transferred to Sevierville, where a hospital with a dedicated emergency room was located. I offered to help further, but they advised me that the best course of action was to return to the chief ranger and inform him of the situation. When I walked into Ranger HQ, covered in blood, the chief and my co-workers immediately sensed that something terrible had occurred. At first, they thought I was the one who had been hurt, but I assured them, it's not my blood. I recounted the events, and the chief took notes. Since we had jurisdiction, the responsibility to investigate what had happened to the girl fell on us. The only other entity that could legally take over would be the FBI, either if we requested their assistance or if they decided to intervene. Our team prepared to investigate, but that's when things took a strange turn. We needed to speak with the girl to understand what had happened. But when the chief contacted the hospital and spoke with the doctors, we learned that she hadn't uttered a word since her arrival. She wouldn't speak to the doctors, the nurses, or anyone else. This wasn't entirely surprising considering the trauma she must have endured, but it complicated our efforts. The doctors advised us to check back the next day, hoping she might open up then. We waited until the early afternoon of the following day and called the hospital again. However, to our dismay, the girl still refused to speak. The chief decided to visit the hospital, and he asked me to accompany him, hoping that my presence might encourage her to talk. We discussed the investigation during the drive to the hospital, unaware of the bizarre turn it was about to take. When we arrived at the hospital, we found the nursing staff in a state of panic. It took a while to figure out what had happened, but when we did, we were shocked beyond belief. The hospital had lost our victim. Surveillance camera footage revealed a man dressed in hospital scrubs, pushing a wheelchair through the hospital's main entrance, just after 1.15 p.m. He wore some sort of ID clip and managed to bypass the reception desk, heading straight for the girl's room. He placed her in the wheelchair and wheeled her right out of the hospital, without any interference from the staff. This was a massive breach of the hospital's protocols, but without any information about the girl or her apparent abductor, we had limited options. The only course of action was to involve the FBI, as we feared that the person who had taken the girl from the hospital might be connected to her initial predicament. We hoped that this would lead to a full-fledged investigation. However, when we followed up with the FBI about a month later, we were met with disappointment. 
Someone higher up in the Bureau had decided that the case wasn't worth pursuing. They weren't interested in allocating resources to a case where the primary charge might be impersonating a healthcare professional. It seemed that without hard evidence or the girl's testimony, the case had hit a dead end. I wasn't satisfied with this outcome. If it were up to me, I would have chased this case to the ends of the earth to find out what had happened to that poor girl. But it wasn't up to me. I wasn't even a full-fledged ranger at the time. When my volunteer stint ended, I went back to my studies, but I never forgot what I had witnessed. Years later, when the time felt right, I decided to share this unsettling story with my daughter. It might seem strange to share such a frightening and bizarre tale with a teenager, but I believe there was a lesson to be learned from it. When I drove back to Ranger HQ after leaving the girl at the urgent care center, I had assumed that the Ranger team and other law enforcement agencies would fight tirelessly to bring her attackers to justice. However, what I learned was that the world wasn't always as just and straightforward as I had once believed. Sometimes even those entrusted with our protection could act indifferently or apathetic. It was a harsh lesson to learn, but I wanted my daughter to understand that life could be unpredictable and that justice wasn't always guaranteed. Monsters might exist, but they come in various forms, and sometimes the pursuit of justice could be fraught with obstacles and bureaucracy. As I shared this story with my daughter, I couldn't help but reflect on how the pursuit of justice had become a far cry from the image of the heroic lawman riding on a fast horse with a shiny badge. In the modern world, justice was more about paperwork, bureaucracy, and budgets. It was a sobering realization, but one that I hoped would prepare my daughter for the complexities of the world she would face. I live next to Yellowstone National Park, a place that has drawn millions of tourists every year for as long as I can remember. It's a breathtakingly beautiful area, known for its majestic landscapes, geothermal wonders, and abundant wildlife. However, my story is not about the park's natural beauty. It's about a chilling encounter I had on the outskirts of this renowned wilderness. The summer of 2020 was an exciting time for many of us, as things started to return to normal after a period of lockdowns. It was during this time that some of my buddies and I decided to have a night out camping near a spot we had frequented in the past. This spot, like many others in the area, operated on a first-come, first-served basis. To secure our place, I headed up there early to make sure our campsite was still set up from an earlier visit that day. As the sun began its descent, I left my house, confident that my friends would join me within the hour. The drive to the location took me about 30 minutes, a picturesque journey through winding roads and dense forests. I had no concerns about being alone since my friends were on their way. Upon my arrival, I immediately noticed something was amiss. My tent and all its contents had vanished without a trace. To provide some context, I had meticulously staked the tent down in multiple areas to ensure it would withstand the duration of my absence. Inside the tent, my sleeping bag and a few miscellaneous items remained which I had left behind to weigh it down. But now, everything was gone, as if it had never existed. Even the stakes and rocks I had placed outside to secure the tent were missing. A chill crept down my spine, as I knew something was terribly wrong. I had not seen any other campers on the way up, and I had no cell service to call for help. Deciding to drive back down to seek assistance and reach my friends, I realized the culprits must still be lurking nearby as they had been there for only an hour or two. My friends urged me to stay, pointing out the weeks of planning that had gone into this trip. Reluctantly, I decided to stay, believing I would eventually locate my belongings in the morning and report the incident to the Forest Service. I didn't want to ruin the experience for my friends. As the night wore on, things seemed relatively normal. Around one or two in the morning, most of my friends decided to call it a night. I opted to sleep in my truck, a decision I now appreciate as one of the wiser choices of that night. I always came prepared with bear spray and a sidearm for protection against any unexpected guests. Though I attempted to relax, I couldn't shake off the unease that lingered from the theft of my belongings just hours earlier. I left my truck window slightly open, thinking I might hear any approaching sounds during the night. 
After about two hours of fitful sleep, my worst nightmare unfolded. At first, I heard rustling noises outside the perimeter of the campsite. The noise was enough to jolt me awake, and I lay motionless in my truck. I knew it couldn't be a small creature like a raccoon. The sound was too significant. Paralyzed with fear, I listened intently to the strange occurrence outside the camp. My first thought was a bear, as there had been recent sightings in the area, and the noise was coming from only 20 to 30 yards away. An unsettling aspect was the eerie silence that surrounded me. Typically, there would be the sounds of grasshoppers or birds, but this time, it was oppressively silent. An ominous sign in the wilderness, indicating the presence of a large predator or something equally foreboding. After approximately 15 minutes of complete silence, I attempted to convince myself that I was merely being paranoid. Just as I was about to fall back asleep, I noticed movement to the right of our campsite, roughly 20 yards from me. To my absolute horror, a figure emerged from the darkness. This was no ordinary person. Not only was it the middle of the night, but we were in someone else's campsite, deep in the wilderness. The figure wore a mask, and I got a chilling glimpse of it, a deer skull. Their attire consisted of a black robe, and that's about all I could discern. I didn't dare leave the safety of my truck to confront this stranger, and so I took the best course of action I could think of. I turned on my truck and began incessantly honking the horn until all my friends were awakened. I rolled down the window and urgently informed them that we needed to leave immediately. The figure remained still, unperturbed by the blaring noise. It was at that point that the situation took a turn for the worse. More of these eerie figures began materializing in front of us, emerging from the dense trees. They all wore similar outfits, but I couldn't comprehend their grotesque masks, which seemed like a macabre collage of deer and other animal skulls. I hastily shifted my truck into reverse and sped away from the campsite, adrenaline surging through my veins. We were pursued by these unsettling figures who seemed to grow increasingly aggressive with every passing moment. They hurled rocks and sticks at us, chasing our vehicle relentlessly. At one point, they were so close that I could see them through my passenger window, their twisted faces contorted with malice. I accelerated, leaving them behind and eventually losing them in the dark forest. As I sped away, I glanced in my rearview mirror and saw only one of them left, peering out from behind a tree. The image of that sinister figure bathed in the dim moonlight is forever seared into my memory. Since that harrowing night, I have vowed never to return to that area. I kept the incident to myself, even when around friends who shared similar experiences. It has been over a year now, and all I can say is that I believe those individuals were part of some sinister cult. I have heard other stories of strange occurrences happening around Yellowstone, cattle disappearing, fences being removed, and other unexplainable phenomena. While I can't say for sure what's happening, I can attest to the palpable sense of dread that washed over me that fateful night, a feeling that has left an indelible mark on my psyche. The story I'm about to tell you is strange all on its own, but to understand why it continues to haunt me long after it occurred, you'll need a little background information. I tied the knot with my now ex-husband in 1987. We were madly in love with each other and had every intention of staying together until we were old and gray. But the truth was, we wouldn't last five years. We had trouble getting pregnant, so we went to a fertility doctor for tests. That's when I found out I was incapable of bearing children. It didn't seem like the end of the world, not at first anyway. We discussed both the possibilities of adoption and living a child-free lifestyle. I thought our marriage was strong enough to survive something like that but I was wrong. When he filed for divorce, I was heartbroken. I had never really experienced true heartbreak until then. If he had said from the get-go, look babe, I can't be with someone who can't have my kids, then at least I'd have had more time for it to sink in and for me to get over it. But it was how he raised up my hopes before dashing them that hurt more than anything else. I couldn't bear to be around him after that. He wanted an amicable split but I just didn't have it in me to remain friends with him. I guess that must make me seem pretty immature to some people, but I just wasn't emotionally equipped to deal with something like that. I left town, moved back in with my parents for a few months, 
and then set about deciding what I wanted to do with my life. It might sound silly, but I had half expected my role in life to be a mother and homemaker. I know that isn't exactly shooting for the stars to some, but it was all I ever really wanted, a simple, happy life. And it took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to realize that I could be happy being something other than a housewife. During that time when I was finally able to go outside without bursting into tears at the first sight of a mother and child, I spent a lot of time hiking woodland trails. The peace and seclusion helped me put my mind back together again. But the more I did, the more I realized something about myself. I could quite happily spend the rest of my working days walking around the woods in relative peace and quiet. When I mentioned that to my dad, he very casually suggested something that changed my life forever. Why don't you apply to the Forest Service? He asked one day. I remember trying to think of a reason why that wasn't possible. I couldn't picture myself being a ranger, but back then, I could hardly picture myself doing anything at all except crying myself to sleep every night after hours upon hours of just terrible television. But then, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there were no reasons I couldn't be a park ranger. Since I didn't have a bachelor's degree, I'd have to intern for a full two years before being offered a full-time position, but that didn't bother me. I sure didn't have anything else going on for me at the time, so I decided to just go for it. Having grown up in Garrett County, Maryland, I sometimes pictured myself walking the Appalachian Trail during the warm summer months, wearing one of those Smokey Bear hats. But when it came time to applying for internships, there was only one place accepting applicants, and that was Acadia National Park up in Maine. I'd never pictured myself living that far north, and I wondered how I was going to survive the winters up there. But it also offered a new start, and a new place, far from the painful memories I wanted so much to leave behind. So, in the late summer of 1992, I packed up my things and moved up to the small hamlet of Seal Harbor. I moved into a small rental house on a street called, and this is not a joke, Hill Away. I never did figure out if it was some sort of nod to Dr. Seuss or not. None of my neighbors had a definitive answer, but it was a nice, quiet place to live, and it made getting to and from the park every day much easier. I interned for two years, completed all the necessary training, and by the fall of 1994, I was a fully-fledged member of the Acadia Ranger team, badge and all. There was a presentation ceremony, which my mom and dad traveled up for, especially. I experienced feelings of pride and self-belief that at one point I'd never have thought possible. I considered it a huge achievement, and there's no denying how happy it made me. But I still felt this sort of baby-sized hole in my life, one I knew that I'd never be able to fill. Now, cut to about a year later, to June of 1995, and I was completing a land inspection near a rocky hill named Connor's Nubble. Once I was done, I turned around and started walking the two miles back to Park HQ. But as I got closer to the shores of Eagle Lake, I decided to take a shortcut between two trails to save some time. It wasn't a well-walked section of the trail, and I had never taken the shortcut before, but I knew the park well enough to know that if I worked my way through the undergrowth, I'd come out on the opposite trail and have a much easier hike back to HQ. So that's what I did. I turned off the trail and was walking through the trees when suddenly something caught my foot. I didn't see the thing at all, meaning I was so caught off guard that the stumble almost sent me crashing into the dirt. So after calling whatever it was a mother lover, I decided to kick away some shrubs to see exactly what had almost taken me out. I figured it'd be a rock of some description, and if it was possible to do so, I planned on digging it up and tossing it to one side to ensure that no one would be tripping over it again. Some might call this a little extreme, but it becomes second nature to make the park as safe a place as possible for visitors and co-workers alike. One thing you learn as a forest ranger is that a lot of things are completely out of your control, which then teaches you to always act on the stuff you can control. Anyway, after stamping my foot down to find the thing that had tripped me, and then kicking away the shrubs around it, I was surprised by what I saw. It couldn't have been a rock. The shape was way too unnatural. After wiping away some of the soil around it, I caught a glimpse of something that looked a lot like a seam. And if it had a seam, then it might just be some kind of box that someone had buried there sometime in the recent or distant past. But no matter what it was, I didn't have the time nor the energy to stop what I was doing and dig it up. So instead, I tried to mark out the spot as best I could, 
stamping down more of the undergrowth to make the clearing more visible, and then made my way back to HQ. I mentioned the thing in passing to one of my co-workers, and although she wasn't exactly shocked, she did show some interest. I know for a lot of you the first thing that comes to mind is some kind of buried treasure, and with Northeast Harbor boasting some summer residents such as the Rockefellers no less, it wasn't out of the question that something valuable had been buried there. But even so, no one was rushing to go dig it up. I mean, I didn't even really know what it was. So while the box remained of interest, digging it up wasn't a priority by any stretch of the imagination. A few days went by, and then one afternoon, I found myself with a few spare hours. But rather than finish early for the day, I decided to grab a shovel, head down to the shortcut near Eagle Lake, and dig up the box to find out exactly what it was. It made for hard and sweaty work, but after maybe an hour or so of digging, I was finally able to see that, yes, it was a box, no bigger than the kind that you'd buy shoes in. It looked like it had been buried there for a long time. I heaved it from the dirt, dusted it off, and set about pulling away the rotten twine from the latch where a padlock might have otherwise been. I'll admit to being quite excited at the time, and it didn't once occur to me that it could have been anything sinister. But when I opened the box and lifted up a rotten piece of cloth away from whatever was inside, I gasped and slammed the lid shut after catching just a glimpse. It wasn't gold or silver or jewels, nor was it a murder weapon from some decades-old murder, as one ranger had suggested with a chuckle. It was a skeleton, the tiny newly formed skeleton of a departed newborn. I didn't touch anything else, I just ran back to HQ to tell people what I'd found. Soon, almost everyone on duty that day was down near Eagle Lake, and not long after, several other state troopers and the whole forensics team arrived. But before they all got there and taped off the scene, our chief ranger looked inside the box just to see for himself what was in there. Like I said, I only got a glimpse, but I saw enough to know what I was looking at. Where is the chief? He took a long, hard look at that poor little thing, long enough to see the things I hadn't. I couldn't bring myself to look at it again for a long time, but when the chief said the skeleton looked all wrong, he was right. I had never seen a baby skeleton before, so it wasn't like I was an expert. But all who saw it agreed that the skull seemed way too large, and the arm seemed way too long, as one of us put it. The poor little thing barely looked human, but it was, because the genetic testing came back positive as being entirely human in origin. In the end, we pieced together a very sad chain of events. Sometime between 1920 and 1930, some unsuspecting mother gave birth to a heartbreaking disabled child. There was a chance that this child died of natural causes because there were no signs of any trauma on the skeleton, but that didn't rule out the possibility that someone had taken it upon themselves to personally end the child's suffering. Then, after the child was gone, someone placed it in what would have been at the time an expensive felt-lined box then buried it deep in the woods where no one might ever find it. Why they might opt to do that instead of giving the child a proper funeral, I have no idea. But the reason couldn't have been a good one. Cut to almost 80 years later and some slowly growing tree root had pushed it further and further to the surface over time until just a nub was sticking above the ground. A little nub that I just so happened to have stumbled over. Seeing as the child's body was found on federal property, we were able to enlist the help of the FBI's DNA analysis unit down in Quantico, like I think I already mentioned. We were hoping that we might get a match on a distant relative that had a file, but nothing came back positive. This little kid had no name, no date of birth, and its only possession was the small improvised coffin we found it in. We also heard from the FBI that the child's large skull, which they called macrocephaly, was probably the result of a genetic disorder such as Weaver's or Soto syndrome. From what I can understand, conditions like those are relatively easy to treat today. But back then, some poor kid born in bad circumstances wouldn't have nearly the same chances. It all makes for a heartbreaking story. Even our most probable theories were nothing but speculation. But no matter which way you cut it, whatever happened to that child had been simply awful. And that's not why the whole thing has haunted me for all these years. Not the story on its own, anyway. Instead, it's been this. Sometimes, in my darkest moments, I feel like that poor baby was my own. I feel like it was a strange kind of destiny that brought me to that shortcut, 
and had me stumbling over its makeshift coffin. I know that probably sounds like I'm losing my mind, and it's definitely not an idea I've ever discussed out loud with anyone, but it really is the way I feel sometimes. I'm not able to have children, but what I was given was the chance to bring peace in the form of a proper burial to a child whose real parents were unwilling or unable to give them one. And in doing so, I think I've been able to get just a taste of how boundless and unconditional a mother's love can be. And for that, I'll always be grateful. I was feeling adventurous and decided to explore the Anastasia State Park independently. I had heard it was beautiful, with stunning ocean views and dense forests. The day was perfect for an outdoor adventurer like myself, with the sun shining and a gentle breeze blowing. I couldn't resist the allure of the unknown, so I set off on my journey. As I began my exploration, I noticed how quiet it really was around me. The only sounds I could hear were the rustling of leaves under my feet and the occasional bird making some sort of chirping sound. I walked for a couple of hours, taking in the breathtaking scenery around me. The ocean views were indeed spectacular, and the dense forests had an eerie yet enchanting quality. But as the sun started to set, I realized I had lost track of time, and honestly, I had no idea where I had ended up. I tried to retrace my steps as best as I could, but every direction I turned seemingly looked the same. Anxiety started to creep in, and a sense of fear began to gnaw at me. The forest had become dark, and the silence once peaceful now seemed almost deafening. The rustling of leaves underfoot now sounded like footsteps behind me. I tried my best to stay calm, but a shiver of unease ran down my spine. I attempted to call out for help, but my voice echoed through the trees without any response. The forest's darkness started to play tricks on my mind, and I could swear I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. My heart raced, and I couldn't control the growing sense of panic. I started to run, hoping to find my way back to civilization. But as I ran, the forest only seemed to get darker and more ominous. Strange noises and whispers filled the air, but I couldn't quite make out what they were saying. After what felt like an eternity of desperate flight, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin. Relief washed over me momentarily, but that relief was short-lived. I noticed the door was slightly ajar, and as I pushed it open, the smell of decay filled my nostrils. The cabin appeared to have not been inhabited for quite some years, but there was fresh blood on the walls. Terror gripped me, and I knew I had to leave that place immediately. I sprinted out of the cabin and back into the darkness of the forest. The footsteps behind me had returned, and I knew I was being pursued. Panic overtook me once more, and I tripped and fell. As I looked up, I saw a shadowy figure looming over me, their features obscured by the dim light. Fear paralyzed me, and the last thing I remember was the sound of my own screams echoing through the forest as I was dragged away into the suffocating darkness. I woke up what felt like many hours later, disoriented and completely confused in the woods. I had no memory of how I got there or what had happened. To this day, I have never returned to Anastasia State Park, and I doubt I ever will. It took me several hours to finally figure out my whereabouts during the daytime hours, and luckily, I was able to follow a trail of smoke from a local campfire. Eventually, I found help. But that night still haunts me in my nightmares, and I've learned to never underestimate the dangers of exploring unknown territories alone. I don't know what happened to me that night or who or whatever that shadowy figure was. The mystery lingers, and I'm left with the chilling memory of that fateful adventure. I hope you don't mind if I share my own park ranger story with you, inspired by the tales you've been sharing. I used to be a ranger at Kenu National Park for seven years, from 1985 to 1992. Kainu, nestled in the Idaho Panhandle, less than 50 miles from the Canadian border, was a place of pristine forests, majestic mountains, and serene lakes in the summer. In winter, it transformed into a vast carpet of snow and ice, with the Sea River to the north and Lake Pen Oral to the south. The park was a land of ridges and valleys, and it was in one of these valleys that I experienced a terrifying encounter on my last day on the job. I was going about my regular duties, minding my own business, 
and enjoying the serene beauty of the park, when suddenly I felt an intense, searing pain on the right side of my hip. It was as if Prime Mike Tyson himself had punched me. The force of the blow spun me around, and I collapsed to the forest floor, disoriented and in agony. But what followed was even more horrifying. Amidst my pain and confusion, I heard the unmistakable crack of a rifle shot echoing through the valley. My first instinct was to think it was an accident, perhaps an inexperienced hunter's mistake. The wilderness often witnessed such mishaps, which is why we had so many regulations in place. I couldn't see the shooter, so I started to call out desperately, Don't shoot, I'm a ranger! With one hand pressed firmly against my bleeding hip and the other waving wildly, I hoped to signal my identity and intent. But instead of a response, the shooter fired at me again. It was incomprehensible. Someone was deliberately trying to harm me. Panic surged through me as I struggled to make sense of the situation. Why would anyone want to harm a forest ranger? As I called out again, I'm friendly, stop shooting. The shooter responded by putting a bullet through the rotting log behind which I had taken cover. I realized that the shooter was not merely mistaken but intent on harming me. My heart raced as I comprehended the gravity of the situation. If I exposed myself again, they could easily take a shot, and I would be defenseless. I had only one option left to fight back. Before rolling onto my front, I checked if my legs were still functional enough to run. Then, I positioned my body towards the direction of my parked truck. The shooter remained silent, watching, waiting for me to make a move. The eerie stillness sent shivers down my spine. Summoning all my courage, I decided to make a bold move to break their focus. With my sidearm as my only weapon, I fired several rounds over the log. The deafening gunfire filled the valley, and then I rolled onto my side and sprinted wildly through the dense forest. Shots rang out behind me, and I heard the terrifying crack as a bullet flew just inches over my head. Running as fast as my adrenaline-fueled body would allow, I desperately sought cover. Eventually, I broke the shooter's line of sight and made it back to my truck, barely escaping with my life. I drove straight to the emergency room in Sandpoint as Ranger HQ was too far away. My biggest fear was losing consciousness due to blood loss, but I was fortunate. A doctor later told me that the bullet had narrowly missed crucial arteries, any deviation in its path and I might not have made it to the hospital. Given that the park was federal land, the FBI launched an investigation and collaborated with our ranger team to search for the shooter. However, by the time they arrived, the assailant had vanished without a trace. They scoured the park for any evidence, from boot prints to bullet casings, but it seemed as if my attacker had left no clues behind. During one of my interviews with the FBI agents, they shared a chilling theory. Months before my ordeal, a team of U.S. Marshals had encountered a violent standoff in Boundary County involving a man named Randy Weaver. This incident had attracted widespread media attention and created a volatile atmosphere. Some agents believed that my attack might be linked to this event, speculating that my role as a federal representative made me a target for revenge, fueled by the infamous Ruby Ridge incident. The FBI never managed to apprehend the person who had shot at me, and to this day, they remain at large. Perhaps they live with the guilt of their actions or the fear of consequences, but regardless, I doubt I could ever accept an apology from them, not until I can afford that second round of hip surgery anyway. The morning sun spilled golden light over the rugged peaks of the park a sprawling expanse of wilderness that had become my charge, my sanctuary, my responsibility. I'd always pictured being a park ranger as a tranquil vocation, a caretaker of nature's grandeur. The job description, however, neglected to mention the moments that would shatter the calm, leaving you with a lingering sense of disquiet that no amount of mountain air could dispel. As I patrolled the familiar trails in my truck, the scent of pine and earth was a constant companion. The park was an untamed thing, both fierce and beautiful, with rivers that carved through the land and forests that whispered secrets. I offered directions to a young couple eager for adventure, their faces alight with the joy of the unexplored. That was part of the job I loved, being a guide to those who sought to lose themselves in nature, if only to find something new within. By midday, I'd made my rounds, checked licenses, 
shared polite nods with anglers who were more hopeful than successful, and steered day hikers away from paths that were less forgiving than they appeared. It was the routine I relished, a steady rhythm like the ebb and flow of the seasons, until it wasn't. It was by chance following the trail of an eagle soaring overhead that I stumbled upon the campsite. Five tents stood in a clearing, a stone's throw from the trail. Their fabric doors were zipped tight against intruders of any kind. It struck me as odd, the stillness of it all. By this hour, the occupants should have been up and about, their laughter and chatter mingling with the sounds of the forest. But there was nothing, only silence. I cleared my throat, the sound harsh in the quiet, and announced myself. Park Ranger, I called out, expecting the rustle of movement, the emergence of sleepy faces, but the forest held its breath, and the silence grew heavier. Anyone there? My voice was louder this time, tinged with the unease that crept into my bones. The absence of response weighed on me as I approached the nearest tent. A flicker of something like dread fluttered in my chest as I reached for the zipper. I'm going to open up, I warned, my hand unsteady. The tent interior was a portrait of orderliness. Sleeping bags neatly rolled, provisions tucked away, no sign of hasty departure or struggle. It was as if the campers had simply vanished, leaving behind a tableau of an interrupted life. The embers of their last fire were cold, and the low hum of insects was the only soundtrack. With methodical precision I checked each tent, finding the same unsettling meticulousness. A sense of wrongness settled over me, like a cloud casting a shadow over the sun-dappled ground. Something about this place, about today, felt off-kilter. I was no stranger to the occasional bout of intuition, the ranger's sixth sense that something in the woods was amiss. This time it screamed at me, a silent alarm that rang clear as a bell in my mind. By the time I rezipped the final tent, my decision was made. I would return to the trailhead, check for vehicles. Perhaps they'd gone into town, I reasoned. But as I made my way back, the unease grew. Each rustle in the underbrush, each snap of a twig, seemed amplified, a chorus of disquiet that sang a warning. I was a man of the wild, a steward of these lands, but in that moment, as the shadows lengthened and a chill descended with the setting sun, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was the one being watched, the one out of place in the untamed vastness of the park. The afternoon waned, light filtering through the towering pines and shards that barely touched the forest floor. I should have been back at the station, filing reports, finishing up paperwork. Instead, I was here, at the edge of a clearing that had no right to be as silent as a grave. I let the engine idle, the soft purr of the truck a stark contrast to the stillness outside. The campsite was just as I left it, tents standing sentinel in their neat little row. I should have felt relief at the lack of chaos, but my gut knotted tighter with every passing second. With a sigh, I killed the engine and stepped out, the door shutting with a soft thud that seemed to echo through the trees. The air was different, charged, almost metallic. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stepped into a different world, one that watched and waited with bated breath. Hello? My voice felt thin, devoured by the expansive silence. I walked the perimeter, boots crunching softly on the forest detritus. The campfire was a scatter of charred wood and ash, the remnants of human warmth long since dissipated. The sun dipped lower, a dying ember on the horizon, and shadows gathered with an eagerness that felt almost sentient. I checked my radio, ensuring it was on and within reach. Not that I expected trouble, but the ranger's creed of be prepared was etched deep in my bones. I approached the tents again, unzipping one and peering inside. It was untouched, a still life of what should have been a bustling campsite. I rezipped it, a whisper of nylon the only sound in a world gone mute. The forest had always been a living thing, full of whispers and rustles, the occasional snap of a branch a comforting reminder of its vitality. But now, it was as if every creature, every insect, had decided to hold its breath. And then, in an instant, it happened. The silence broke, but not with the return of life's symphony. No, it was the absence of sound that marked the change. A silence so profound, so complete, it felt like a shroud. I froze, every sense straining against the unnatural quiet. My hand drifted to the canister of bear spray on my belt. 
the weight of it cold and reassuring against my palm. I scanned the tree line, searching for any sign of movement, any hint of life. But there was nothing. Just the endless expanse of green and the growing dread that I was not alone. That's when I heard it. The softest whisper of a footfall, a muted crunch that sent a shiver down my spine. It was deliberate, a slow measured step that was too heavy to belong to any forest creature I knew. I pivoted, the bear spray raised in a silent threat. Show yourself, I demanded, the authority of my position a thin veneer over the throb of my racing heart. The steps continued, a slow circling of predator and prey. I was no stranger to the dangers of the wild, but this was different. This was a dance with something unknown, something that defied the natural order I had come to know. As the light faded and the forest closed in, I knew I had to make a choice. Wait for the unseen to reveal itself or retreat to the safety of the trailhead. With a final look at the silent campsite, I turned my back on the unknown and chose the path that led away from the deepening shadows. But as I walked, I could feel it. The weight of unseen eyes, tracking every step, every breath, as night fell like a curtain on the day's disquieting end. Dawn broke with a cold clarity that morning, shards of sunlight cutting through the dense canopy, doing little to warm the chill that had settled in my bones. The park, a vast kingdom of green and wild things, had always been my refuge. But since yesterday, it had taken on the menacing air of a crypt. I sat in my truck at the trailhead, the engine idling like a growl in the quiet, staring at the windshield but seeing the abandoned tents. The unease had festered overnight into a hard knot. Five tents, five souls unaccounted for. The solitude of the park now felt like isolation, and the silence of the campsite replayed in my mind, a haunting loop. With a grunt, I grabbed the radio, the static crackle a harsh intrusion. I reported in providing descriptions, license plate numbers. The replies came back, locals, in their twenties, a weekend getaway with friends, friends who had now vanished into the wilderness. I stuffed the radio back into its cradle and stepped out of the truck the crisp air biting at my cheeks. My eyes swept the parking area. Four cars, one truck, a tableau untouched since yesterday. A sigh escaped me, fogging the air as I contemplated the next move. I retraced my steps down the trail, the same path I'd taken countless times before. But now each rustle in the underbrush, each snapped twig, seemed loaded with intent. I was a man used to tracking, used to being the predator, not the prey. Yet the feeling of being watched had clung to me, a second skin I couldn't shake. Reaching the campsite, I found it as I'd left it, eerily pristine, the tent standing mute against the encroaching shadows. My hand hovered over the zipper of the nearest tent, hesitation a bitter taste in my mouth. I could feel the day's end approaching, the light waning, the forest preparing for its nocturnal secrets. The silence was suffocating, the lack of human noise, the absence of laughter and life, it was as if the earth had swallowed them whole. My call for assistance earlier was a decision made with reluctance, but as the sun dipped lower, painting the sky in strokes of fire and blood, I knew it was the right one. As the twilight deepened, a primeval instinct screamed within me. Something was wrong. Something beyond the scope of missing campers and abandoned gear. I was no longer a guardian of the park. I had become part of a darker narrative one written in the unseen and the unknown. I unholstered the bear spray, the canister cool and solid in my grip. I'd faced down charging elk, stared into the yellow eyes of mountain lions, but this, this was a fear without a face, a threat that slithered through the underbrush of my mind, leaving trails of dread. The first star blinked into existence as I made my decision. The campsite gave me nothing, the forest even less so. I would have to return to the station, to mount a proper search. The night was no time to challenge the unknown. But as I turned to leave, a branch snapped with the sharpness of a gunshot, and the forest fell deathly silent once more. The sense of being hunted, of being prey, was a mantle heavy on my shoulders as I made my way back to the trailhead, the darkness at my heels, and the weight of the missing like a shroud upon the land. The sun shouldered its way above the horizon, spilling a pale light that did little to warm the chill in my marrow. I hadn't slept, couldn't even if I tried. The station was abuzz with activity, a stark contrast to the uneasy stillness of the woods. I sipped bitter coffee, 
watching the steam rise like specters into the cold morning air. The faces around me were taut with concern, the weight of the missing campers a silent drumbeat in everyone's mind. A specialist tracker had been called in, a wiry woman with eyes like flint and a gait that was all business. We huddled over maps, spread on the hood of a cruiser, her finger tracing the trails with a predatory precision. I felt the pull, the need to get back out there, to find answers, to find them. With the tracker leading, we made our way to the campsite. The tents looked forlorn in the morning light, a tableau of abandonment that was at odds with the natural beauty surrounding us. I recounted the events of the previous day, my voice sounding hollow in the crisp air. The tracker moved with a silence that seemed to resonate with the forest. We found nothing new at the campsite, no signs of struggle, no traces of their passage. It was as if the earth had simply opened up and taken them. I watched her crouch, examining the ground, her movements precise, almost reverent. She paused, looked up, and met my gaze. We're not alone, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. We pushed further into the woods, away from the campsite, away from the trail. It wasn't long before the tracker held up a hand, her body tense. There was a cave ahead, hidden by the foliage, its mouth open like a dark wound on the mountainside. We approached with caution, the air growing colder as we neared the entrance. A fetid smell wafted from the darkness, the scent of decay. The tracker signaled for me to follow, and we entered the cave, the beam from our flashlights cutting through the blackness. What we found within stopped me cold, a grisly scene, the remnants of violence etched into the very stone. Bones, some fresh, some old, littered the ground. The walls were painted with the evidence of savagery, and in the depths of the cave we saw it. The creature was an aberration, a thing of nightmares made flesh. It was hulking and misshapen, its eyes reflecting our lights with a malevolent intelligence. It moved with a startling speed, its growl a visceral thing that seemed to vibrate through the stone beneath our feet. We fought. The tracker was thrown aside like a rag doll, her screams echoing off the walls. I sprayed the creature with bear mace, but it only seemed to enrage it further. The cave became a blur of movement and terror. I remember the cold shock of falling, the creature's breath hot on my neck and then darkness as I hit the ground. When I came to, the creature was gone. The tracker was silent, and the weight of the dead pressed in around me. I scrambled to my feet, my mind a whirl of panic and fear. The cave, once merely a structure of stone, had become a tomb, a testament to the brutal reality that sometimes the wild is not just indifferent, but cruelly sentient. My consciousness clawed its way back, a reluctant swimmer surfacing from the depths of a dark, cold lake. Pain lanced through my ribs with each ragged breath, a stark reminder of the creature's power. The tracker lay still, her chest barely rising, a grim tapestry of our struggle against the beast etched in the dirt and blood around us. The cave was a cathedral of horrors, its walls wept with the blood of the creature's prey. The stench of death was omnipresent, an assault on the senses that threatened to overwhelm me. We were in the belly of the beast, both literally and figuratively. With effort, I propped myself up against the cold stone, my flashlight's beam a feeble protest against the enveloping darkness. The silence of the cave was absolute, a pressing void that seemed eager to swallow any noise we might make. But the silence was a lie, I realized. It was the creature's accomplice, hiding its movements, masking its intentions. The tracker's eyes flickered open, confusion and fear warring in their depths, before settling into a determined glare. We shared a nod, a silent agreement that we were not yet done, that we would not go quietly into that dark night. We moved, our bodies protesting, a symphony of aches and sharp stabs of pain. We had to find the hiker, the one we had seen moving in the pit, the pit, a grave not yet sealed, a place of waiting for those the creature had chosen to toy with before the end. Our search was methodical, born of a desperation that sharpened our senses. We found her, the hiker, her eyes wide with terror and relief. We fashioned a rope from the detritus of the cave, clothing torn from the bodies of the less fortunate. She was weak but alive, and that was a victory against the darkness. We were not out of the creature's woods yet, though. It returned, a looming nightmare, its visage a grotesque mockery of nature. 
Its eyes held an intelligence that spoke of a malevolent awareness, a knowing that went beyond animal instinct. The fight was brutal, a dance with death in the pale light of our flashlights. I remember the sound of my own breath, ragged and ragged as I faced the monstrosity. It was a battle not just for life, but for sanity, against the realization that such things walked in the same world I had once thought I understood. In the end, it was a rock, a simple, unassuming weapon wielded with the last vestiges of my strength that turned the tide. The creature reeled, its roar a sound that would haunt my dreams for years to come, and then it was on me, its weight a mountain, its breath a gale of rot and malice. But the creature was wounded, its movements sluggish. With a cry that was half scream, half defiant roar, I fought. The beast faltered, stumbled, and then, with a final effort, I drove it off, sending it crashing into the darkness. We collapsed, the hiker, the tracker, and I, a tangle of limbs and exhaustion. The danger was not yet past, but for a moment we could breathe, could allow ourselves the luxury of hope. Outside, the park was waking up, sunlight creeping across the land. But in the cave, we grappled with the aftermath of our encounter, the reality that the world was far stranger and more terrifying than we had ever imagined. The aftermath felt like walking through a dream, the kind that lingers at the edges of your waking mind, too tenacious to be dismissed by the morning light. The creature lay still, a mass of fur and flesh that no longer inspired fear, just a profound sense of sorrow for the lives it had taken. I emerged from the cave into the blinding light of a new day, the air fresh with the scent of pine and the earthy musk of the forest. The rescue teams had arrived, a flurry of motion and urgent voices. I watched them, their faces a blend of relief and horror as they took in the scene. The scattered remnants of the campers, the silence of the tracker, the ragged survivors we were. They asked questions, their notebooks ready to document the unbelievable. I recounted the events, my voice flat, the words tasting of dust and disbelief. The surviving hiker was whisked away on a stretcher, her eyes meeting mine in a silent thank you. I nodded, the gesture a feeble acknowledgement of the bond formed in the shadow of death. I sat on the bumper of an ambulance, the world around me a cacophony of radio chatter and boots on the ground. The head ranger approached, his expression a mix of concern and something akin to pride. You did good, he said, though the words felt hollow against the backdrop of such loss. The report they handed me was a litany of names, each a life snuffed out in the prime of their existence, 26 in total, including the brave tracker who had fought alongside me. The creature, they speculated, was some aberration, a twist of nature's design that defied explanation. But in the end, it was dead, and with it died the nightmare that had gripped the park. I returned to the job, to the routine of trails and tourists. But something fundamental had shifted, the knife I had used to defend us against the creature rested heavy on my hip, its blade stained with the evidence of our struggle. I hadn't cleaned it, a silent tribute to those who hadn't made it out, and a reminder of the thin line between the known and the unknown. I carried more than just the knife now, a 44 Magnum, a weight on my other hip, a concession to the newfound knowledge that the wild held more than just beauty and tranquility. It was a burden I accepted. The weight of it a constant companion as I patrolled the same trails, watched over the same vistas. I became something new in the wake of that encounter, a guardian not just of the park and its visitors, but of the thin veneer that separates civilization from the wild chaos that lurks in the uncharted shadows. Each rustle in the underbrush, every snapped twig, now held the possibility of hidden dangers. But I was ready. Ready to protect, to serve, and if necessary, to confront the darkness. The creature had changed me, honed me into something harder, more vigilant. I was no longer just a park ranger. I was a sentinel at the edge of a mysterious and untamed world, forever watching, forever waiting. It was supposed to be just another ordinary, boring summer job. I needed a way to save money for the upcoming school year. So my geology professor offered to put me in touch with a local caving group. From June to August, the group hosted camps for children ages 12 to 14. Over the course of each four-day, three-night session, campers would hike along limestone rivers, learn about underground ecology, receive guided tours of three different caves, and even spend the night in one. 
Along the way, of course, they would be treated to the usual cringy team-building activities, cold bug-infested showers, and barely edible food familiar to summer camp attendees everywhere. My task, on paper, was a simple one. I was to guide the campers through the caves in groups of about 20 and keep an eye on them while they stayed overnight. We worked in pairs, with one guide at the front of the group and another at the rear, to make sure that no one got lost. We carried helmets, three sources of light, walkie-talkies, first aid kits, and extra rope, even though the caves that we worked with were well-mapped and well-trafficked. No one expected anything to go wrong. Well, almost no one. Scoutmaster. Dan got his nickname from his khaki short shorts with too many pockets, his knowledge of knots, and his obsession with being prepared. In over 40 years as an organizer, Dan Raffold had never lost a camper, and, as he was fond of telling us, he planned to keep it that way. We were expected to find our way through each cave at least five times before we even began escorting campers through them, and every guide lived in constant fear that the scoutmaster would suddenly turn up to inspect their gear equipment or quiz them on first aid procedures. As a college boy from the city with no experience, I had expected Dan to be especially hard on me, but he held us all to the same stern standard, no more, no less. The excitement in the air during those first green, cool weeks of summer was infectious. By the time we had mowed the green lawn of the main campground, cleaned the facilities and learned the layout of each cave, I was surprised by how eager I was for the campers to arrive. Unfortunately, I had forgotten what preteens could be like. The body odor, the bullying, the constant boundary pushing. It was tough enough just to get them quiet and moving in the same direction, let alone to make them understand the importance of safety underground. There were times when I almost wanted one of them to wander off, just so that they would finally learn their lesson. But then I thought about what it would be like to be alone in the dark so far underground, feeling the cold, damp air on your skin, and knowing that it was just a matter of time until your light ran out. As a new guide, I spent the first three weeks at the back of the group, keeping a head count, and radioing the leader, Miriam, about any issues. Miriam was a lanky, sunburned redhead who'd been working as a guide for five summers now. She had a sheepdog attitude toward the campers. As long as they were all present for each count, she couldn't have cared less about their eye-rolling complaints and snide comments about her height or her freckles. What really mattered to Miriam, the reason she kept coming back, were the caves themselves. The fast-flowing underground streams, the beautiful alien rock formations that could be found nowhere else the unique wildlife that had never seen the sun. For her, our work was more like a stroll through a beloved park, with the minor inconvenience of herding a group of accident-prone campers. Thanks to her enthusiasm, I also began to enjoy my time spent in the caves, except for one of them. It was just my luck that it was that cave where I was told to lead my first tour. In theory, Silverload Cave was the easiest option for a first-time guide. The other two caves, Pine Knot and Church Falls, each had their own drawbacks. Pine Knot Cave was like a maze, with so many levels and passages that sometimes even experienced guides lost their way. Church Falls Cave was small, but there were a few tight squeezes where one or two campers inevitably discovered their own claustrophobia and needed to be helped through. Silverload Cave, however, featured large and well-explored passages, with few pits or other dangers at least on the main road. Even so, the place gave me a bad feeling. Maybe it was the sheer size of its high-ceilinged galleries. No matter where you directed the beam of your headlamp, there was still a lot of darkness left over. There was also the fact that Silverload was one of the most well-known caves in the area, which meant you might find yourself suddenly face-to-face -face with other cavers or drunk local teenagers. Mariam and I had never had any problems, but still, there was something unsettling about running into strangers in that lightless subterranean world. I think what bothered me most about Silverload Cave was the graffiti. There's usually graffiti in the more popular caves, but the images in Silverload just felt wrong. Worm-like black squiggles, faces not quite animal, not quite human, spray-painted on the stone in lurid colors of lime green and purple. My heart raced whenever I rounded a corner and caught one of them in the beam of my headlamp, sneering at me like it knew some awful secret that I didn't. Then, of course, there was the history of the place. According to Scoutmaster Dan, Native Americans had mined precious metals in Silverload Cave for centuries, 
until they suddenly and inexplicably stopped over a millennia ago. Later, during the Civil War, Silverlode Cave had been a hideout for Confederate guerrilla fighters. Imagining some illiterate farm boy getting his legs sawed off by lantern light while listening to the echo of his own screams was enough to make the cave feel hostile, if not downright menacing. Miriam didn't seem to mind or even notice, but she wasn't leading the campers that day. I was. To make matters worse, it was the group's final cave tour, which meant that we'd be spending the night in the cave. I had done overnights before, but only in Pine Knot or Church Falls, never in Silverlode. So far, the worst things to happen were a twisted ankle and a camper who woke up screaming because a cave cricket crawled into his sleeping bag. Between the cool air, the coziness, and the complete darkness, I had actually found caves to be pleasant places to sleep, so far. As many times as I had been through Silverlode Cave with Miriam, however, I had never spent the night there, and I wasn't looking forward to the prospect. I knew right away that the three boys in the back of my group that day would be trouble. Alex hid Kyle's headlamps in his bulky pockets. Kyle dumped Sean's water on his head during the safety meeting, and Sean tried to push Alex into the creek on the hike to Silverlode Cave. The trio talked over us constantly, their preteen voices cracking in the humid summer air. Even Miriam, who almost never lost her cool, wound up shouting. Her words reverberated eerily through the tunnels so that I could hear her anger, but not what she'd said. In fact, there were times when I wondered whether the voice I was hearing was even Miriam at all. The constant tension grated on my nerves and kept me from paying attention to things that I'm sure I would have noticed otherwise. Things like the shadowy figure that seemed to be following our group. The first time I saw it, I thought it was just another caver, backlit by one of their companion's headlamps. When it appeared again, however, I wasn't so sure. Maybe it was just a shadow that happened to look sort of human, but if it was, then what was casting it? And why did it seem to be moving closer each time? I warned myself to cut it out. There was clearly no one else in the cave with us. We would have heard them, and besides, it was impossible to navigate through the jagged rocks with no illumination. I considered radioing Miriam about it, but I didn't want to risk the campers overhearing and getting scared, or making myself look like an idiot. As it turned out, I didn't have to. We were about 15 minutes from the first break spot, when my walkie-talkie started to go off. At first it was just a rushing sound like wind, or the creek that flowed through the cavern. But then it changed, gibbering, scratching, a voice whispering my name. Since Miriam's talk button was pressed down, there was no way I could respond to ask her what was going on. I called a halt to the group. Moments later, there was a loud crack, and the noises stopped. We had paused on a low plateau where dripping stalactites hung from the ceiling. It wasn't so low that we had to crawl, but standing up wasn't exactly comfortable either. I was grateful for my knee pads. The twenty campers packed into a circle, swigging Kool-Aid from plastic bottles and wondering what was going on. Mariam scrambled over to me, her face a mask of pale anger. I think one of those kids pinched my walkie-talkie. Whoever it was, they must have freaked out when you called a halt and dropped it. I heard something rattle when she shook the plastic device. Well, either way I found it, and it's completely dead. I groaned. It had barely been an hour and already something had gone wrong. Mariam must have seen the look on my face because she gave my shoulder a reassuring squeeze. You're doing fine. Let's just keep the group close enough to see each other, okay? She bit her lip. There was something she wasn't telling me. Hey, have you noticed that? Ouch, let go of my leg. Alex, or maybe Sean or Kyle, suddenly started shouting. There was a small rock slide. I'll handle this, Mariam hissed and disappeared. And for a while, it seemed like she did. Since Miriam and I couldn't contact each other by radio, she turned on the infrared setting on her spare headlamp and hung it around her neck, where it bobbed in the gloom like a glowing red eye. That way, I could be sure that I wasn't getting too far ahead. Except, as we moved through the cave, I could have sworn I saw other dim red lights moving in the darkness, some further back, others closer up. I told myself that it was probably just Miriam's secondary headlamp reflected in dripping water or mineral veins in the walls, but I knew that didn't make any sense. There were too many of them, and they were moving with a will of their own. I tried to distract myself, 
by throwing myself wholeheartedly into my explanation of Silverload Cave's history and geology. But every time I looked up, the danger in the dark felt closer. Two hours later, we'd reached the large chamber that would serve as our campsite. It was a wide, flat area, formed naturally by a curve in the subterranean stream. It was only about 8 p.m., but I knew from experience that getting 20 campers fed and bedded down would take at least two more hours. I kept an eye out for the shadowy figure or the phantom red lights, but there was no sign of anything strange while we all unpacked. When the campers had finished eating and were getting ready for lights out, Mariam approached me. I wanted to ask you earlier, have you noticed another caver around? My blood ran cold. Mariam went on without waiting for a response. It's just strange that someone would be in here this late, someone other than a few loud local teenagers, I mean, and whoever they are, why wouldn't they be using any light? To be honest, I hesitated. I've got a bad feeling about this. Should we, I don't know, call it off? I silently prayed that she'd say yes. Everything about this trip was wrong. Wrong like those eerie graffiti faces spray painted on the walls. Wrong like the rusted Civil War era bone saw we'd passed near the entrance. Wrong like the abandoned veins of precious metals that lead downward into the dark. Miriam shook her head. Do you want to explain to Scoutmaster Dan and 20-odd parents why they have to come pick up their kids at 1 a.m. on a weeknight? Because that's what will happen, assuming we get them all out of here on no sleep and with just one working radio. She had a point. Whoever or whatever was out there, it hadn't made any hostile signs toward us so far. Just ignoring it and hoping it would go away wasn't the best option. It reeked of helplessness and desperation, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. The campers muffled laughter and whispered conversation suddenly sounded sinister. As I performed the final bed check, I kept expecting to find one camper's sleeping bag ripped to shreds or squirming as some monstrous unnameable thing with too many legs came bursting out. Despite my fears, all 20 campers were present and accounted for. After a long day of caving, even Alex, Kyle, and Sean were already fast asleep. Unlike them, I couldn't bring myself to crawl into my sleeping bag or close my eyes. I was too afraid that I'd wake up and find myself being dragged off into the dark. There was no dawn underground, but Miriam and I had our alarm synchronized for 6 a.m. That would give the campers a total of six hours to pack up, eat, trek out of the cave, and get cleaned up before their parents arrived to pick them up. The early wake-up was met with groans and complaints, but we were used to that. The important thing was to get them moving. After a breakfast of granola bars and sports drinks, we rounded everyone up for the morning head count. 18, 19, 20, 21. It was impossible. I thought for sure I had miscounted, but Miriam's count returned the same result. As I scanned the group for an unfamiliar face, I told Miriam to dig the roster out of her rucksack. She returned moments later, angry, confused, and scared. The roster's gone. So are my spare headlamps and the extra food. It's like a bear went through my pack. I checked my own pack and found that it, too, had been ransacked sometime during the night. I shivered. Whatever had done it would have been just inches from my head, and I hadn't even noticed it. Time was of the essence. We couldn't count on our spare lights any longer. Miriam nodded to the assembled group of 21 campers and whispered, Are there any faces you don't recognize? Anyone who stands out? It could have been the pale kid standing at the edge of the group with a blank expression on his face, his shirt buttoned up wrong and his boots unlaced. It could have black-haired boy with glasses who'd somehow gotten his arms and legs covered in gray-green cave mud. It could have been the skinny one with a blonde bowl cut who was chomping on his sixth granola bar like a wolf gnawing on a bone. It could have been any of them. In the past weeks, all of those preteen faces had started to blend together. I'd been so distracted by everything that had gone wrong that I was no longer sure exactly who I had come into the cave with. The campers, too, didn't seem to notice that anything was amiss, and some instinct screamed at me to keep it that way. We needed to get out of Silverload Cave and fast. Ironically, Alex, Kyle, and Sean were the only ones I felt sure of, so I put them right behind me in line. I knew they wouldn't like that one bit but I figured they would do or say something stupid to alert me if some horrible imposter came crawling across the ceiling to slit my throat. 
The campers were always quiet on their first morning in the cave. Usually it was just the uncanny feeling of waking up in absolute darkness that did it, but there was something more at work this time. Even the densest of them had seen the fear and confusion on my face. They knew that something was off, and they seemed to realize for the first that they were dependent on us to get them out of here. The goofing off that we'd had to deal with on the trek into Silverload Cave had been replaced by nervous jitters and whispering. I took a deep breath, forced myself to turn my back on the campers, and began to lead us out of Silverload Cave. One of the first things that Scoutmaster Dan taught us about caving was the importance of pausing occasionally to note the landmarks behind you. Unlike the terrain above ground, a cave can seem completely different when observed from the opposite direction. Even longtime guides like Miriam sometimes experience the gut-plunging feeling of looking around at the twisting passages and realizing that nothing at all looked familiar. It hadn't happened to me, not until we began our journey back that day. As we left the main chamber behind, we reached the first sink, a bend in the creek where the water disappeared, only to reappear further along in the cave. The path should have been to the right, but it wasn't. There was only the creek, disappearing between yet another jagged stone wall. The way to the exit had disappeared. I wanted to believe that I'd just made a mistake, that what I was seeing was just the result of my own slowly building panic, but Miriam had noticed it too. She kept mumbling under her breath, rummaging in her rucksack for the plastic-coated map that had disappeared along with the rest of her gear. As an experienced guide, she was taking the impossible change a lot harder than I was. She knew it was wrong, and I had a nasty feeling that if she stayed in the chamber much longer, she'd shut down completely. Most caves have more than one way in or out, and Silverload was no exception. We normally led the campers via the easiest route, the one that followed the stream, but that was apparently no longer an option. The lower passages tended to flood, and even when the water subsided, it left snarls of dead leaves, wood, and trash. Muck that fed some of the largest insects and spiders that I'd ever seen. I didn't like my odds of getting the campers through that mess, so I opted for the alternative route through the upper galleries. I tried to swallow, but my throat was dry with cave dust. All right, campers, I grimaced. We're going to take a little detour. It was tougher than I remembered. The tunnel grew so narrow that the stone walls scraped against my shoulders the rough ceiling so low that I occasionally felt the long, alien legs of a cave cricket as it skittered through my hair. These upper passages had a nasty slope. While crawling along them, you were constantly sliding down and to the right, toward a jagged black crevasse that, to the best of my knowledge, had never been explored. It wasn't wide enough to fall into, not even for the skinniest of campers, but it was unsettling. I couldn't shake the fear that it might suddenly begin to expand like a grinning toothless mouth and swallow us whole, or that some unspeakable horror might come slithering out of its lightless depths. I looked back at the campers, their faces flushed with effort, sweaty hair plastered to their foreheads beneath their cheap plastic helmets, and reminded myself that the unspeakable horror was already here among us. But as to what it was or what it wanted, I had no idea. Just an hour left, I reminded myself. In an hour, we'd come crawling out into the sunlight, where surely everything would make more sense. It would turn out to be some stupid mistake, like a wrong turn, or a misplaced gear bag, or a miscount on our way out of the cave. Nothing more. It had to be. I'm not sure how I knew something was wrong. Maybe it was the absence of sound. The kids had been chattering like chipmunks for hours, but now they were silent. Maybe it was the smell. Our flashlight beams had revealed that the passage was a crypt, its floor strewn with half-decomposed animal skeletons. Or maybe it was the fact that there was no light. I'd taken my eyes off the campers for just a few seconds, and now I couldn't see any of them. Mariam. I tried to call, but the word wouldn't come out. Instead, I dropped to my knees and crawled forward, my heart pounding. Then I stopped. The infrared light. Back in the main chamber, Miriam had turned on the infrared setting on one of her headlamps so that I could follow her. Her light was the only one with this setting, or at least, it should have been. Yet I could see a second dim red light somewhere in the darkness ahead of me, and another, and another, twenty of them. The same number of campers. 
They were moving, sliding actually, silently toward the center of the chamber like a pack of ravenous wolves. No longer children, their bodies had become emaciated and twisted, their bones peeking through thin, bluish skin. One turned to face me, and I caught a glimpse of its face, a grotesque, twisted parody of a human child, with hollow eyes and a gaping, lipless mouth that seemed to stretch unnaturally wide. My instinct was to flee, to crawl back the way I had come, but the thought of leaving Miriam and the campers behind paralyzed me. I needed to do something, but what? Then it hit me. I still had my whistle. I reached for it, but as I brought it to my lips, I hesitated. What if the sound attracted more of those things? I couldn't take that risk. Instead, I used my hand to cover the whistle's opening, muffling the sound as much as possible. I blew as hard as I could, and the shrill sound filled the chamber. The creatures recoiled, covering their ears with their bony hands. Their heads jerked in my direction, their empty eye sockets filled with rage and confusion. I seized the opportunity to scramble back the way I had come, not looking back until I was back in the upper galleries. The creatures hadn't followed me, but I could still hear their guttural, inhuman cries echoing through the cave. I crawled as fast as I could, determined to get back to the campers and Miriam and lead them out of the cave. But when I finally reached the spot where I had left them, they were gone. There was no sign of them anywhere. I called out Miriam's name, but there was no response. Panic set in as I realized I was alone in the dark with those creatures somewhere behind me. I crawled as fast as I could, not caring about the narrow passages or the jagged rocks that scraped against my skin. I just wanted to get out of that cave and away from those things. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't find the way out. It was as if the cave had shifted and rearranged itself, leading me further into its depths. Hours turned into days, and still, I crawled through the endless passages, my food and water running out. I knew I was lost, and I knew I would never escape the cave. The creatures were always just behind me, their voices echoing through the darkness, and now here I am, still lost in this never-ending nightmare, with no way out. If you're reading this, please, whatever you do, don't go into Silverlode Cave. There are things in there that should never see the light of day, and I fear that I am now one of them. In the summer of 2015, my best friend Scott and I, along with his oldest son David, embarked on our annual fishing trip to Morgan Monroe Reservoir. This tradition had been our escape from the grind of the work week, a cherished ritual we looked forward to every year. I would meet up at Scott's place, where we would load our fishing gear into his trusty old truck, eager to hit the road. At that time, I was only 28 years old, and I'd often tease David about enjoying his youth warning him about the impending realities of adult life. Scott and I had shared a friendship spanning over a decade, one that resembled a brotherhood more than a mere friendship. We'd also worked together for the same amount of time, cementing our bond and treating each other like family. Our journey to our favorite fishing spot was always filled with excitement, and this year was no different. As we drove, we discussed our plans, with a pit stop for bait being our first order of business. I suggested we needed more bait, which irritated Scott slightly, but he agreed, understanding the desire to start fishing as soon as possible. Our pit stop at a small gas station in Martinsville provided us with worms and other essentials. We loaded up our supplies and continued the journey, listening to some classic rock tunes on the way. All three of us were bubbling with anticipation, eager to cast our lines into the water. As we arrived at our destination, a sign welcomed us but it bore an ominous message. Closed due to animal attack. The trail leading to the water was shrouded in shadows as the sun began to set. However, we paid little heed to the sign or the encroaching darkness. Both Scott and I were armed and we felt confident in our ability to protect ourselves. We wasted no time setting up our gear by the water's edge, engaging in friendly banter about who would catch the most fish. David was the first to cast his line, boasting that he would outfish us. Scott and I scoffed and quickly followed suit, casting our lines into the water. Hours passed, and the night was filled with laughter and discussions ranging from cars and girls to work-related stories. At one point, David stood up, announcing that he needed to relieve himself. I handed him a flashlight, mindful of the darkness that had settled in. David took the light and disappeared into the woods. 
Around the same time, we began to hear an eerie knocking sound in the distance. Knock, knock. A shiver ran down my spine, but I initially dismissed it, thinking David was playing a prank. As David returned, Scott reprimanded him for potentially jeopardizing our remote location with pranks. However, David denied making the knocking sounds. Then the knocking noise resumed, louder and more unsettling than before. Knock, knock. I stood up, grabbing David's flashlight, directing it towards the source of the sound. But my beam revealed nothing unusual. Suddenly, something large crashed nearby. I pointed the flashlight in its direction and discovered a massive rock, possibly weighing 10 to 20 pounds or more. Scott began to worry that someone might be messing with us, but David raised the possibility of a bear. Fear had crept into his voice and eyes. I, however, knew that bears didn't typically engage in knocking or rock throwing. Concerned, I retrieved my firearm, ready to use it if necessary. For a while, the knocking and rock throwing ceased, and we thought the strange episode had ended. I glanced at my phone and realized it was nearly three o'clock in the morning, though it didn't feel like it. But then, another knock. Knock echoed through the woods, followed by a chilling, inexplicable howl yell. The noise was uncomfortably close, sending shivers down my spine. I asked the others if they were ready to leave and both Scott and David answered in the affirmative simultaneously. We hurriedly packed our belongings and just as we were about to make our escape, another rock landed perilously close. It sounded as though something had hurled a massive boulder rather than a mere rock. All three of us froze, scanning our surroundings with our flashlights. Heavy footsteps were drawing nearer, and it seemed like whatever was responsible was in a hurry. Even with our flashlights, visibility was limited. David piped up, wondering if the area's closure was related to these strange occurrences. Scott and I remained silent, pressing forward down the trail that ran parallel to the water's edge. We still had nearly 100 yards to cover before reaching the truck. Then there was a loud kerplunk, followed by a splash just beside us. It sounded as if something had thrown a colossal boulder into the water. Our hearts raced, and adrenaline surged through our veins, pushing us onward. Both Scott and I had our firearms at the ready, prepared to use them if necessary. We continued to hear disturbing noises, including a blood-curdling screech, reminiscent of a creature in agony. I asked Scott if the remote start worked from this distance. He reached for his key fob, but before he could respond, an abhorrent stench engulfed us. It was a putrid amalgamation of decaying trees and wet dog. The odor suggested that whatever was responsible was dangerously close, perhaps within arm's reach. We heard low growls just ahead, along with a loud crash and knocking noises, as if something was slamming trees together. Finally, we reached the truck, its four windows shattered, and we discovered the source of the screeching sounds. A mangled raccoon. The gruesome sight did little to alleviate our panic. We piled into the truck and Scott started the engine. When the truck's lights illuminated the area in front of us, we saw it. A dark, seven-foot-tall creature with reddish-yellow eyes. David pleaded with his dad to go faster, and Scott floored the gas pedal. A deafening bang reverberated through the air, causing the back of the truck to sway. However we pressed on, our eyes wide and unblinking, the terror palpable. We arrived at Scott's house and stepped out of the truck, examining the damage more closely. The windows were shattered, and a colossal rock now rested in the back. The loud bang had been the Bigfoot throwing the rock at us. Scott looked at me, finally breaking the silence with disbelief in his voice. Is that what I think it was? I replied, I think so. David, still in shock, attempted to explain the situation to his wife, but she dismissed it, assuming he had been drinking and wrecked the truck. I recounted the story to my wife, who merely laughed in disbelief. Despite our harrowing experience, it seemed that no one cared or believed us. As 2023 rolled around, we had not returned to that fishing spot. I often wondered if that Bigfoot had ever encountered anyone else in its remote habitat, and I hoped that they wouldn't meet the same terrifying fate as we had that eerie night in 2015. On a muggy late summer afternoon in the heart of Georgia, my husband, our six-year-old son and I found ourselves in search of a camping adventure. 
Instead of opting for a well-trodden, paid camping ground, we yearned for something a little more off the beaten path. Rumors had whispered to us about an old, abandoned camping site, a place no longer attended to or maintained. Our curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to check it out. As we pulled up to the entrance, we were greeted by a sight that immediately sent chills down our spines. The gate to the old check-in booth was securely chained shut, a stark symbol of the site's disuse and neglect. This meant we'd have to park our car in the tree-lined wilderness and carry our camping gear on foot. After a short walk through the overgrown foliage, we began to spot remnants of old campsites, picnic tables covered in moss, fire pits choked with weeds, and other signs of abandonment. We pressed on, determined to find a spot near the tranquil pond we'd heard about, and continued our hike until we stumbled upon what seemed like the perfect camping spot. It was about a 15-minute trek from our car, nestled deep within the woods. As evening descended, we set up our campsite with a sense of anticipation and excitement. Our sun eventually succumbed to the weariness of the day and fell into a peaceful slumber. My husband and I sat by the crackling campfire, enjoying the solitude. The silence stretched for miles around us, making it a bit overwhelming, but it was precisely when the silence was at its peak that something extraordinary occurred. Out of nowhere we heard it, six loud, heavy, bipedal steps emanating from the water's edge. It was as if someone had emerged from an inner tube in the water and taken several deliberate, ground-shaking strides onto the shore. My initial thought was that a park ranger or police officer had discovered our car, located our campsite, and was making their way towards us to ask us to leave immediately. Yet the sound was unlike anything I had ever heard before. It didn't resemble the cautious steps of an animal like a deer, muskrat, beaver, or even a bear, which shouldn't have been in our region. Instead, it was heavy and deliberate, far more intimidating than any animal could ever be. My husband, a tough guy who wasn't easily rattled, sprang to his feet, feeling defensive and genuinely afraid. At that moment, my blood ran ice cold. We hastily turned on our flashlights, instinctively grabbing a nearby pocket knife and a sturdy stick, prepared for whatever might be approaching. We waited in tense silence for the intruder to reveal themselves. Strangely, no park ranger or officer announced their presence, and no deer darted into view. It was just eerie silence. Then, true terror set in. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone with malicious intent was lurking nearby, waiting for the right moment to strike. I mustered the courage to quiver out a shaky, hello, much like in horror films just before a gruesome attack. But there was no response, just continued silence. Suddenly we heard branches cracking, not on the ground but overhead, all around us. Rapidly and loudly, pine cones fell to the forest floor, echoing the snapping branches. It sounded as if a hundred squirrels had simultaneously gone mad, ascending the trees and sending the forest into chaos. But no matter where we shone our lights, we saw nothing. The cacophony continued relentlessly, as if it had no intention of ceasing. We stood there petrified, unable to do anything except listen and wait for any sign of movement. It was as though we were being toyed with. Sounds came from above, below, in the trees, in the water from every direction. There were no animal sounds, no growls, grunts, or squeaks. The noises and their patterns were not natural, normal, or recognizable. I felt utterly cornered. All I wanted was to wake our child, hold him in my arms, abandon our belongings, and sprint back to the car as fast as humanly possible. However, we were a good 15 minute walk from the car, and I could hardly move let alone run into the dark woods with this unknown presence surrounding us. It all became a blur, but I remember us retreating to the tent, huddling inside with our son, waiting for whatever would happen next. The noises persisted, loudly and without respite. Sometimes they were close, and at other times, they seemed far away. Sometimes they were loud in the water, and then in the trees. What kind of creature or entity could exist both on land and in the water moving with such incredible speed and making its presence known in so many places simultaneously. It was becoming maddening. But that was the extent of it, terrifying, unexplained sounds. We never slept, waiting for the first rays of daylight to break so we could make our escape. Shortly after sunrise, the noises ceased entirely. 
Finally, we ventured down to the water's edge, looking for footprints or any other evidence of what could have caused all those bizarre sounds. There, we discovered one puzzling thing, a large tree trunk from a fallen tree that appeared to have been stabbed or shredded with no natural patterns or signs of wildlife. It was as though the tree had been repeatedly stabbed and gouged with a very large knife, leaving deep gashes and splinters. These cuts were fresh, and they definitely hadn't been there the previous day. In the stark light of day, we left that eerie place without any idea of what had caused those bizarre sounds in the woods. Perhaps there was a reason why they had closed down that campground. Even years later, it still baffles me. I've been unable to rationalize or explain it away. It was something very, I'll just say, unnatural. I've spent most of my life in East Tennessee, surrounded by the tales of old wives and urban legends about the eerie creatures that roamed the dense forest. As a child, I dismissed these stories as mere attempts to scare us away from venturing into the wilderness, believing they were concocted to keep us safe from ravines and getting lost in the vast wilderness. However, the tales lingered in my mind, and as I grew older, my curiosity got the better of me. I started to delve into these stories in my spare time, drawn to the enigmatic creatures said to inhabit these woods. While the locals were fixated on the legend of Bigfoot, I found myself intrigued by the Dogman, although I kept this fascination unofficial. After high school, my sole ambition was to become a park ranger, a job that would allow me to immerse myself in the beauty of nature, even when it was at its most perilous. There are countless stories I could recount but one that haunts me to this day involves a group of hikers from a couple of years ago. It was early October, a time I typically made my annual pilgrimage to Klingerman's Dome. The view from the top, with trees ablaze in a kaleidoscope of autumnal colors, always reaffirmed my career choice as a park ranger. On that particular day, I was on patrol when a distress call came in, directing me to the cabins near Fontana Lake. A woman met me there, her eyes filled with worry. She explained that her husband, son, and brother-in-law had gone fishing at the lake and had not returned. I gathered the necessary information about their descriptions, names, and the details of their truck and boat before setting out to search for them. She mentioned they were heading up to Wolf Creek. I informed the station and then proceeded to drive down to Flat Branch, suspecting they might have ventured into the river there. The journey was lengthy, but getting anywhere deep in the backwoods of the Smoky Mountains always was. Upon arrival, I spotted three trucks parked on the side of the road, two of them with empty boat trailers. One of the trucks matched the description given by the wife, giving me a starting point for my search. I approached the water's edge and scanned in both directions, hoping to spot them returning from their fishing expedition. But my hopes went unanswered, and there was no sign of them. Nearby I found a house, and decided to ask the occupants if they had seen the missing trio. The man there mentioned he had been fishing himself the previous day, and recalled seeing a boat resembling the one I described, with two men and a boy aboard, heading west. I inquired if he had a boat to transport me to Wolf Creek, to which he hesitantly agreed, his demeanor shifting from friendly to wary. He consented to ferry me across the river, but refused to take me all the way to Wolf Creek. I accepted his offer, and... After a quick dash back to my truck for my backpack, he transported me across the river and promptly departed. It was approximately a mile to the remote campsite I believe they had used. I began walking along the river's edge, keeping a vigilant eye out for any signs of them. It wasn't long before I spotted a boat resting on the shore, appearing to match the description. Approaching the boat cautiously, I hoped to find the missing party calmly sitting by a campfire, ready to head home but my optimism quickly waned when I reached their campsite. There were only two tents, both of them ravaged as if some force had torn into them. I ventured inside each tent, discovering scattered sleeping bags and camping equipment strewn about, trying my best not to disturb the scene. However, it was the second tent that revealed a more disturbing truth. Inside the disheveled tent, I noticed conspicuous droplets of red. Nearby lay a notebook, and I gingerly picked it up to peruse its pages. October 3rd. We set out for our annual fishing trip this morning, much to Mom's chagrin, but we reassured her that we'd be back the following day. 
The drive to the boat launch was long, filled with our anticipation of the bountiful fish we'd catch and stories of the region. Dad tried to spook me with tales of a cryptid living in the area, but I dismissed it as a jest. We reached the boat launch and embarked on the water without much trouble, except for Uncle Roger's near tumble while trying to release the boat. He didn't find it nearly as amusing as Dad and I did. As we ventured further into the lake and cast our lines, Uncle Roger seemed to relax, especially after a few beers. Laughter echoed from our boat as we enjoyed ourselves. Although we caught a couple of small fish that required release, we finally hit the jackpot when we reached Wolf Creek. Uncle Roger managed to catch three largemouth bass, and I caught two. Dad had a colossal one on his line, but it eluded our grasp. With dusk approaching, Dad suggested we head to one of the secluded campsites. We moored the boat by the shore, securing it to a massive tree. We unpacked our gear, pitched our tents, and Dad lit a campfire while Uncle Roger cleaned the fish. We relished our meal and exchanged stories late into the night. Dad mentioned a promising fishing spot further west, planning to visit it early the next morning before we returned to our cabin. The middle of the night. I awoke to a strange commotion outside the tent. Dad was absent, and I could hear rustling and what seemed like something pawing the ground and snorting. I surmised it was Dad playing a prank, trying to frighten me. I had dismissed their attempts to scare me with cryptid tales earlier, confident I wouldn't be deceived again. I resisted the urge to turn on the light or investigate, knowing my father and uncle would probably run away, pretending to be the very creature they had warned me about. I anticipated that, come morning, they would discuss the eerie sounds they claimed to have heard to perpetuate their prank. Instead, I rolled over and attempted to return to sleep, but Dad's antics continued relentlessly. He stomped around and growled, attempting to gain my attention, but I remained steadfast in my determination not to be fooled. When morning arrived, I ventured outside the tent, expecting to find the campsite intact and my father and uncle with cheerful expressions, ready to break their prank. To my astonishment, the campsite lay in ruins. Uncle Roger asked if I had heard any noises during the night, and I feigned compliance, claiming I had heard something like a creature outside our tent but was too fearful to investigate. He pretended to search for Dad, displaying genuine concern. I remained patient, expecting my father to end the charade, but as the morning progressed, my anxiety grew. Dad was nowhere to be found, and Uncle Roger eventually suggested we begin searching for him. By noon, we decided to set out in search of Dad, with Uncle Roger acting as though Dad had simply gotten lost in the wilderness. I wanted to reveal that I hadn't fallen for their ruse, but I couldn't bring myself to spoil their fun. Uncle Roger was deeply troubled, yet he concealed his emotions, asserting that Dad was likely already back at the campsite. As the sun dipped lower in the sky, we abandoned our search and returned to the camp. Twice we lost our way, and each time we retraced our steps to reach the campsite. The region had few established trails, and it was evident that people had not explored these parts extensively. Upon our return to the campsite, I rushed to our tent in the hope of finding my father there. However, my search yielded no results. We hastily consumed our meager supper and retired for the night with Uncle Roger vowing to wake me when Dad returned. October 4th. Uncle Roger never woke me. Dad did not return. I suggested we seek help, but Uncle Roger revealed that Dad was the only one with a phone. We debated our next course of action when we suddenly heard rustling in the woods, and the birds fell silent. We scanned our surroundings and discovered the source of the disturbance. A creature was approaching us. It stood tall on its hind legs, producing loud, bone-cracking sounds as it moved. This monstrous being was massive and I was paralyzed with fear. Uncle Roger urgently pulled me behind the tent and we tried to conceal ourselves. However, the creature spotted us and unleashed a deafening roar. We were mere feet away and I could see blood on its claws and teeth, sending shivers down my spine. What, what should we do? I whispered. Uncle Roger raised a finger to his lips, and the creature turned its attention to our tent, as though searching for something. Come on, Uncle Roger whispered. We silently slipped away from the monster. We descended the creek's bank and walked downstream, concealed by the water. We hoped the rushing water would muffle any sounds and help us evade our pursuer. 
Time dragged on as we made our way downstream, our nerves on edge. We reached a bridge, a small wooden structure that spanned the creek. Our options were limited, and we sought refuge under the bridge, praying that the creature would lose our scent and leave. We huddled together in the shadows, the daylight fading into dusk, and the temperature dropping rapidly. Without our jackets, we shivered, with the cold air contrasting with the adrenaline coursing through our veins. As I began to doze off, Uncle Roger nudged me. I looked up, and he motioned for me to remain silent. I was about to ask why when I heard a creaking sound on the bridge directly above us. It was not the steady rhythm of a hiker passing by, but a slow, deliberate progression, as if someone, or something, were stalking us. I listened intently as each board groaned under the weight of whatever was creeping above. My teeth chattered in fear, and I bit my tongue to stifle the noise. The creature seemed to pause, as though it had heard something, its movements tentative as it assessed the situation. We strained our ears, and I heard sniffs, a creature trying to detect our scent. For the first time I noticed a slight breeze, and it occurred to me that it might carry our scent downstream or upstream. Another slow footstep sounded, causing the board to creak, and for a brief moment, it appeared the creature was moving away from us, heading to the far end of the bridge. Hope surged within me, but it was short-lived. The creature abruptly stopped, and with a quick jerking motion, dipped its head under the bridge and peered into our hiding spot. We remained frozen, our hearts racing, as the monstrous creature on its hind legs, resembling a nightmarish dog, scrutinized the area beneath the bridge. Darkness enveloped us, offering precious little cover. The creature's gaze shifted toward us, and our hearts pounded in our chests. Daylight had dwindled to dusk, and our hideout provided some shadows that rendered us nearly invisible. However, our safety was short-lived as the creature approached. My mind locked in terror, unsure of what course to take. Running would likely expose our location, and it appeared our only option was to face a horrific demise. At that moment, I felt Uncle Roger lean closer. He was right in front of me and I saw him pick up a stone the size of his fist. I realized he intended to shield me, offering himself as a sacrifice to protect me. Tears streamed down my face at the thought of my father falling victim to this monstrous creature. As I braced myself for the inevitable, I saw the creature's terrible claws inch closer to Uncle Roger's face. It was a defining moment. Suddenly the creature halted, raising its head to sniff the air. The hair on its back bristled and then in an instant it vanished. Uncle Roger cautiously stood and I tried to do the same, though my legs felt weak. I unintentionally dislodged some stones, creating a minor noise that prompted Uncle Roger to hiss at me. We stood in silence, waiting for the creature to spring from its hiding place at any moment. After several agonizing minutes, we dared to move away cautiously. We descended the creek's bank and walked downstream through the water. Where are we going? I whispered. There's a bridge downstream, Uncle Roger whispered back. If we're quiet enough and the creature loses our scent, we can hide under it and hope it goes away. I focused on walking as silently as possible in the rushing water, its noise masking our movements. It felt like an eternity before we reached the bridge a small wooden structure spanning the creek, providing hikers with passage over it. There was little cover. We sought the deepest shadows at the far end of the bridge, our hearts pounding. Time seemed to slow as I sat on the uncomfortable rocks, trembling. Neither of us had our jackets, and the temperature had plummeted as the sun disappeared. I was nearly dozing off when Uncle Roger nudged me. I looked up and he motioned for me to remain silent. I was about to ask why when I heard a creaking sound, someone or something was slowly approaching on the bridge above us. It wasn't the steady gait of a hiker on the trail, it was a cautious, deliberate step, as though the entity were stalking us. I listened intently, as each board groaned under the weight of whatever was inching closer, one slow, deliberate step at a time. My teeth chattered with fear as I fought to keep quiet. It couldn't have been very loud and Uncle Roger barely heard it, but he motioned for me to stop. I bit my tongue, trying to suppress any noise and continued to listen. There was nothing to hear. The creature above us had halted its advance, as if it were listening to ascertain whether it had detected something. I strained my ears, desperate for any sign of movement. Then I heard sniffling. It was the creature, attempting to pick up our scent. 
for the first time, I realized a slight breeze blowing, aligned with the water's flow. However, I had no way of determining which side of the bridge the creature was on, and the wind could either save or doom us. Another deliberate footstep sounded like an explosion as the board groaned beneath the weight. For a brief moment, it seemed like the creature was moving away toward the far end of the bridge. Hope flickered within me as another step followed, and then another. I silently sighed with relief as I heard it step off the bridge and onto the trail. However, my relief was short-lived as I saw a face peer around the corner, gazing under the bridge. It was the creature, a monstrous dog-like being, Standing on its hind legs, its presence a grotesque nightmare. Daylight had faded to dusk, and there was minimal illumination. Our only advantage lay in the shadows, making us nearly invisible. Yet the creature approached steadily, and I feared our safety was slipping away. My mind raced with thoughts and I felt paralyzed. Running would only reveal our presence more quickly, and it seemed we had no choice but to face a dreadful end. In that moment, I was certain of what had befallen my father. Tears streamed down my face as I imagined him torn apart by this monstrous entity. As I braced myself for the end, I felt Uncle Roger lean closer. He was right in front of me, and I watched as he picked up a stone, roughly the size of his fist. I understood his intention, to protect me at the cost of his own life. Tears flowed more intensely, obscuring my vision. The creature's claws drew closer to Uncle Roger's face again. This was it. Then abruptly it stopped. It lifted its head and sniffed the air, its back bristling. In an instant, it vanished again. It was like we were in a terrifying loop. Uncle Roger and I slowly stood, and I tried to follow suit, although my legs felt unsteady. We remained still, listening for any signs of the creature emerging from its hiding place. After several agonizing minutes, Uncle Roger led the way back to our camp. We believed that changing into dry clothes and resting were our best options. The warmth of the campfire and the dry clothes offered a welcome respite from the cold and dampness. I nestled into my sleeping bag and wrote this message, hoping that someone would find it if we didn't survive. I prayed that my father had been as fortunate as we were. I read through the entire message, my heart heavy with concern for the boy, his uncle, and the fate of the father. If my suspicions were correct, the situation was dire. Despite the impending danger, I felt compelled to search for them. I began with a meticulous examination of the tracks around the camp, specifically those near the tents. It seemed that the boy and his uncle had initially headed toward the creek, and the creature's tracks followed suit. I followed the erratic tracks, occasionally losing them, but eventually picking up drops of blood that confirmed their direction. The tracks ran along the creek, and I noticed that the boy and his uncle must have returned to the campsite after initially leaving. However, there were no signs that the father had come back with them. As I circled the campsite, I made a disturbing discovery. An adult's tracks led from one of the tents to the edge of the woods and stopped abruptly. There was a dark stain on the tree bark a few feet up, likely from a late night bathroom break. However, the tracks never returned as though the person had vanished. I searched the area thoroughly but found no indication of the father's whereabouts. Finally, I realized there were specks of blood higher up on the tree bark. I expanded my search and found tracks of the creature, accompanied by drops of blood. My heart sank at the implication. I followed the trail of the creature, hoping against hope that my instincts were wrong. However, each step deepened my dread. I attempted to radio the station to report the situation, but inexplicably, all I received was static. Frustration and urgency gripped me as I realized that communication had been compromised. I adjusted my backpack, ensuring my sidearm was loaded, and ventured deeper into the cave. The deafening sound of the rain outside gave way to an eerie silence within the cavern. Each step I took echoed in the vast darkness. As I crept deeper, I felt a sense of foreboding that intensified with each passing moment. Two thoughts weighed heavily on my mind. Firing my gun in this confined space would likely deafen me and the putrid stench that pervaded the cave was nauseating. My flashlight pierced the darkness, revealing the cave's expanse, a rough, uneven floor scattered with boulders and stones. The walls were rugged, devoid of any ancient cave drawings. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the sound of my footsteps, my breathing, and my racing heartbeat. The tension was unbearable, and I pressed forward with trepidation, 
every step feeling like a descent into a nightmarish abyss. Doubts filled my mind, and I contemplated retreating, but a nagging sense of responsibility compelled me to continue. As I ventured deeper into the cave, the rain's distant roar outside diminished, replaced by an eerie stillness. I could hear my own footsteps, my rapid breathing, and the pounding of my heart echoing through the cavern. Just as I contemplated retreating, a movement ahead caught my eye. It was substantial, as large as a person. Panic surged within me, and I instinctively pressed myself against the cave wall, forgetting momentarily that my flashlight remained on, betraying my position. I heard a shuffling sound growing closer, and I frantically pointed my flashlight in the creature's direction, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that I needed to gather more information, but I couldn't afford to be taken by surprise. I withdrew my sidearm, clutching it tightly as I cautiously advanced, my light illuminating the cave's interior. And then, I saw it. The creature, a nightmarish amalgamation of a dog-like form, elongated and standing on its hind legs. It loomed only a few steps away, its grotesque appearance etched into my memory. Fear surged through me, but I couldn't afford to hesitate. My only option was to confront the abomination that stood before me, standing between life and death in the darkest depths of the cave. The creature, a nightmarish and wounded beast, recoiled from the blinding light of my flashlight and emitted a guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Panic surged within me, and I fought to control my trembling body, fearing I might lose control of my bodily functions in sheer terror. Instinctively, I raised my gun and pulled the trigger, unleashing a deafening blast that left my ears ringing. The creature roared in response, its proximity to me making the sound almost inaudible over the ringing in my ears, and it darted deeper into the cave, its malevolent intent palpable. As the echoes of the gunshot faded, I stumbled, struggling to regain my balance and composure. My desperate need to find the missing hiker compelled me to press on, despite the overwhelming dread that coursed through me. I scanned the cave floor, searching for any sign of blood or injury, but there was none to be found. It seemed that my shot had merely startled the creature. The realization that it was still at full strength filled me with dread, for I knew that it would perceive me as an invader in its domain. With my flashlight cutting through the darkness, I ventured deeper into the cave, my senses on high alert, watching for any sudden movement. I had no clue where the creature had disappeared to, nor whether it was preparing an ambush. A sudden gust of air brushed against my skin and I reacted on pure instinct, leaping backward just in time to evade the deadly swipe of claws through the air. My heart raced as I rolled and fired my gun blindly, the flashlight casting a feeble glow on my target. I squeezed the trigger repeatedly, desperate to hit the creature, but it dodged every shot, retreating with unnatural speed until it vanished from sight, leaving me to hope that at least one of my shots had connected. I ejected the spent magazine from my gun, replacing it with a fresh one all the while chastising myself for not conserving my limited ammunition. In my mind, I reasoned that there was no use in dying with a full magazine. Following the trail of blood drops left by the wounded creature, I proceeded deeper into the cave. A pervasive chill permeated the air, making me shudder as I pressed forward, a sense of impending doom weighing on my mind. It felt like a tomb, my tomb, but I shook off such thoughts and continued my pursuit until the blood trail came to an abrupt end. I illuminated a small puddle with my flashlight, scrutinizing the ground for any clues. The absence of blood beyond that point filled me with unease, as if I had walked into a trap. I scanned every inch of the cave, from floor to ceiling, but the creature remained elusive. My instincts screamed that it was a trap. With my heart pounding, I started backing out of the cave, my eyes darting around scanning for any sign of my relentless pursuer. Then it struck me like a speeding bulldozer, a sudden brutal impact to my back that sent me sprawling. My flashlight landed several feet away, and I had no idea where my gun had ended up. Gasping for breath, I struggled to move, but my body refused to cooperate. The creature circled around me, growling and bristling, a palpable menace. I knew it was closing in for the kill. Panic gripped me as I willed my body to move. I watched as my arm slowly reached out towards the distant flashlight. Just as I grasped it, I saw the creature crouch, ready to lunge. I clicked the flashlight to strobe mode, directing its blinding beam at the creature's face. It screamed and swiped at the light, as if trying to fend it off. 
Summoning every ounce of strength, I rose to my knees, keeping the light trained on the creature. When it turned away, I frantically scanned for my gun. It lay a few yards away, and I attempted to crawl toward it, ignoring the pain from my freshly broken nose. Aware that my life hung in the balance, I couldn't afford to feel the pain. I reached for the gun, and just as the creature charged at me with renewed aggression, I aimed and fired. The impact sent the creature tumbling, but it remained on its feet, growling defiantly. My magazine emptied. I fumbled to reload, berating myself for not being more cautious with my limited ammunition. I justified it with the thought that there was no point in preserving bullets if I didn't survive. I resumed my pursuit, exhilarated by a trail of fresh blood drops that indicated I had wounded the creature. Though the drops were infrequent, I knew that at the speed it was moving, it must have suffered a severe injury. As I continued into the depths of the cave, an eerie chill gnawed at my resolve. It felt like a tomb, and the thought of it being my own tomb gnawed at my mind. But I pushed through, following the blood trail until it vanished. My flashlight revealed a small puddle. The final traces of blood, and the absence of any more tracks, filled me with dread. I knew it was a trap. My instincts screamed at me. In a desperate retreat, I backed out of the cave, my eyes darting in all directions. Then out of nowhere it struck with the force of a freight train, ramming into my back. I sprawled on the floor, my flashlight a few feet away. Gasping for air, I lay defenseless as the creature circled me, its growls growing more menacing. I could feel its intent to kill. My mind screamed at me to move, but my body refused to cooperate. The creature's breath, visible in the dim light, signaled that my time was running out. With a Herculean effort, my arm was the first to regain mobility. Slowly, I reached for the flashlight. The creature paused just as I got a grip on it. I directed the strobe at its face again, and it howled, clawing at the blinding light. Summoning all my strength, I rose to my knees, keeping the light trained on the creature. When it turned away, I frantically searched for my gun, which I found a few yards away. I attempted to run for it, but my body's full recovery remained elusive, and I fell flat on my face. Ignoring the pain of my broken nose once more, I crawled toward the gun with every ounce of energy within me. It seemed like an eternity until I grasped the grip and aimed it at the creature, which was charging at me full speed. I squeezed the trigger at the perfect moment, sending it crashing down with a horrific scream. It writhed and clawed at its face, blood pouring from its numerous wounds, but even in agony, it refused to surrender. Minutes passed, and it finally ceased its frenzied movements, becoming eerily still. My flashlight revealed that I had struck its eye, leaving nothing but a bloody hole. I dared not approach it, standing at a safe distance, gun at the ready in case it made a final move. Its squeals devolved into moans, and then a heavy sigh before it lay still. With caution, I directed the flashlight toward the creature, cautiously optimistic that the threat had ended. Remembering my original purpose, I tried to regain my bearings and ventured further into the cave. My primary thoughts were finding the missing hikers alive and hoping there weren't more of these creatures lurking in the shadows, for I knew I couldn't endure another confrontation like the one I had just faced. I retraced my steps through the cave, passing the blood-stained battleground where I had faced the creature. Shell casings and blood were scattered on the cave floor, serving as grim reminders of our encounter. I wondered how I had avoided getting hit by a stray bullet, and I looked to the spot where the creature had fallen, but to my bewilderment, it was gone. I scanned the area, frantically searching for any sign of its presence, but it had vanished without a trace. Fear coursed through me as I checked my gun, realizing I had only two rounds remaining. The creature's absence was unnerving. It could be lurking anywhere, biding its time for a final strike. Despite the unsettling turn of events, I knew there was nothing more I could do. I was defenseless, carrying a corpse on my back. I holstered my gun and continued, leaving the creature's whereabouts a terrifying mystery. As I neared the cave's exit, the world outside had transformed. Daylight struggled to penetrate the thick fog that now blanketed the valley. The mist obscured everything below except for the distant peaks of the mountains, which remained untouched by the suffocating haze. I glanced over at my backpack, left waiting patiently for my return, and retrieved my water bottle. I took a moment to savor the last sip, 
knowing I would need every ounce of energy to complete my grim journey. Sitting on the precipice of the cave, I looked down at the valley below, pondering how to descend with my burden without risking both our lives. For a fleeting moment, the temptation to toss the hiker's body down crossed my mind, but I quickly dismissed it as an undignified option. Rummaging through my backpack, I found a set of bungee cords and used them to secure the body to my back, forming a macabre backpack. It wasn't an ideal solution, but it was the best I could manage under the circumstances. With the gruesome load secured, I began the treacherous descent, my heart pounding with each precarious step. There were moments when I lost my footing and nearly tumbled to my death, but my determination to honor my mission and the hiker's memory spurred me on. Finally, I reached the bottom unscathed, but a new challenge loomed ahead. The thick fog obscured my surroundings, and I had no clear path to follow. I decided to move straight ahead, hoping that the fog would lift as I ventured further. The rain had transformed the forest into a soggy marshland with the soft ground and swollen streams posing additional obstacles. At times, I waded through knee-deep water, the cold seeping through my clothes and draining my energy. With each step, my thoughts oscillated between the missing hiker and the relentless creature that had pursued me. I hadn't discovered any other remains in the cave, suggesting that the creature hadn't had the opportunity to bring its other victims there. My relentless pursuit had forced it to retreat prematurely. Throughout the journey, I kept my ears attuned for any signs of the creature following me, but the eerie silence of the forest raised concerns. Wildlife often fell silent in the presence of a predator, and I couldn't shake the feeling that danger still lurked nearby. Nevertheless, I couldn't afford to dwell on my fears. My sole focus was to make it back to the safety of my truck, my primary goal to honor the hiker's memory and provide his family with closure. Exhaustion gnawed at my every step, and two thoughts persisted in my mind. The whereabouts of the other hikers and the relentless pursuit of the creature. The cave had revealed no other remains, suggesting that they might still be alive. If that were the case, they were counting on me to find them. My journey seemed endless, and I pushed forward with the determination born of desperation. The relentless pursuit by the wounded creature loomed over me like a dark cloud, my constant companion in this eerie silence. After what felt like an eternity, I reached a turning point, a fleeting glimmer of hope on the horizon. I heard the faint sound of running water, the soothing flow of a creek. Hope surged within me, momentarily eclipsing the fear that had gripped me for so long. But hope was short-lived, for I heard a solitary footstep behind me, and I whirled around, my macabre burden nearly unbalancing me. The thick fog obscured my view, and I strained to see through the mist, my heart pounding. My senses sharpened, and I knew I was being pursued. My pursuer was relentless, determined, and a harbinger of death. The boy had given voice to my darkest fears, and I knew I couldn't afford to slow down or become an easy target. With renewed determination, I set my course toward the sound of the creek, my every step guided by the instinct for survival. The marshy terrain slowed my progress, and the cold water sapped my strength, but the specter of the pursuing creature pushed me forward. As I reached the banks of Wolf Creek, I knew my strength was waning. The creature had entered the water behind me and was steadily gaining ground. The creek grew deeper, forcing me to swim, the frigid water sapping my energy further. My relentless pursuer was a mere few yards behind me, and I knew my chances of survival were slim. It was impossible to see whether the creature could swim, but I couldn't afford to turn and find out. With every ounce of energy, I swam to the far side of the lake, praying for salvation. I reached the shore, utterly exhausted and chilled to the bone, and lay there, expecting the creature to descend upon me at any moment. To my astonishment, I looked back and saw the creature standing on the far shore, unable or unwilling to cross the water. It was grotesque, its single eye socket oozing gore, internal organs visible through its many wounds, and its right leg wounded, causing a severe limp. The rage burning in its remaining eye was unmistakable, but it seemed unable to pursue me further. A wry smile played across my lips as I lay there, catching my breath. It appeared that the creature couldn't swim, and for the moment I had eluded its clutches. As I slowly rose and continued my journey back to the truck, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief mixed with exhaustion. I had survived the relentless pursuit, 
but I knew my battle with the creature was far from over. Upon reaching my truck, I opened the door and knocked gently on the cabin door. When the woman inside saw me, her expression shifted from fear to relief. Are you all right? She asked in a trembling voice. I hung my head wearily. No, but I will be after some much needed rest. I have unfortunate news. I found your husband, but your son and brother-in-law are still missing. A man and a young boy emerged from the cabin, their eyes filled with curiosity and apprehension. The man looked at me quizzically. Who are you? He asked. She's the ranger who came looking for all three of you, the woman explained. I don't understand, I replied, my fatigue evident. Your tracks were confusing. I followed them to the bridge, but they doubled back to the campsite. The boy chimed in, explaining how they had rested and then slipped away to a boat, rowing across the river to escape. I couldn't help but smile at their resourcefulness, relieved that they had survived. I'm very glad you did, I said sincerely, pulling them both into a grateful hug. As the boy's eyes welled up with tears, he asked, you said you found my dad? My face grew somber as I nodded. I did, but it was too late. So he's... The boy began. I nodded again, my heart heavy. Where is he? He asked, his voice trembling. He's in my truck, but you don't want to see him like that. Before I could utter another word, he sprinted to the truck and peered inside, finding the passenger seat empty. He turned to the bed of the truck, and upon seeing his father's lifeless form, broke into sobs, sliding down the side of the vehicle. I'm so sorry, I murmured, turning to the grieving family. The woman embraced me tightly, expressing her gratitude. Don't be, she said. Without you, we might have lived in false hope for weeks, months, or even years. You've given us a chance for closure and the opportunity to properly grieve. Tears welled in my eyes as I gently placed the hiker's body on their couch, covering him with a blanket. The boy, still overwhelmed by grief, sat in a nearby chair, his gaze fixed on the covered form. Knowing I had done all I could, I excused myself and left the cabin, my mind heavy with the weight of the day's events. I had fulfilled my duty, but I couldn't shake the feeling of impending danger from the relentless creature. As I drove back home, I called the ranger station and reported the harrowing ordeal in detail, informing them that I would be taking the following day off. After a long shower and collapsing into bed, I had only one thought on my mind, a return to Wolf Creek, armed with more firepower, to put an end to the creature that had haunted my nightmares. But that, as they say, is another story. I've always had a soft spot for the wilderness, a kind of sanctuary where the world's chaos takes a back seat. That's why I became a park ranger. The year was 1986, and let me tell you, it was a time unlike any other. Neon lights, cassette tapes, and movies that have now become classics. But even in that vivid era, the park was my refuge. It was a place where time seemed to slow down, where the air was crisp and the pine trees stood tall and proud, like sentinels guarding a sacred place. My colleagues and I had a routine. After a long day of patrolling, maintaining trails, and ensuring the park was as pristine as Mother Nature intended it to be, we'd gather at the ranger station. It was a humble building, but it was ours. We'd pop a VHS tape into the VCR and let the flickering screen take us to galaxies far, far away or to the heart of a love story. Those movie nights were a simple pleasure, but they meant the world to us. They were a slice of normalcy in a job that often reminded us how unpredictable nature could be. But even in the most serene settings, oddities have a way of creeping in. It was late spring and the park was alive. The air was filled with the scent of freshly cut grass and pine, a combination that always made me feel more alive. I was walking past a cluster of picnic benches, lost in thought when something caught my eye. A Halloween mask, the kind that covers your entire head, was lying on the ground as if discarded in haste. It was designed to look like a vampire, complete with exaggerated fangs and a menacing expression. I stood there for a moment, puzzled. Halloween was months away, and even if it weren't, what was a mask doing here, in a place where the only masks you'd expect to see were those of animals in their natural habitat? I radioed it in. Base, this is Stuart. Found something odd near the picnic area. Over. Go ahead, Stuart, came the reply, crackling through the radio. 
It's a Halloween mask, a vampire to be exact, just lying here on the ground. There was a pause. Well, that's a new one. Log it and keep an eye out. Could be kids messing around. Will do, base. Over and out. I picked up the mask, its plastic surface cold to the touch, and logged it as instructed. But as I went about the rest of my day, the mask stayed on my mind. We've all got stories, little oddities that punctuate our daily routines. But this felt different. Like the opening line of a story, I wasn't sure I wanted to read to the end. That night, as the credits rolled on another movie, I looked around at my colleagues, each lost in their thoughts or in casual conversation. I wondered if any of them felt it too. The subtle shift in the air, the sense that our sanctuary had been touched by something we didn't quite understand. And so, the mask became a part of our lore, a small mystery in a place filled with ancient trees and timeless landscapes. But as I'd soon find out, some mysteries have a way of digging their claws in, refusing to be forgotten. Little did I know this was just the beginning. The lake had always been a place of solace for me. Tucked away and surrounded by a quarry, it was a hidden gem in the park. The water's surface was like a mirror, reflecting the sky and the surrounding trees. It was a place where you could lose yourself in thought, where the world's problems seemed far away. But that evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the water, the lake felt different. It felt like a place hiding a secret. I was making my rounds, the setting sun painting the sky in hues of orange and pink. The air was cooling down, a welcome respite from the day's heat. I drove my truck down the narrow path that led to the lake, the tires crunching on the gravel road. I parked and stepped out, taking a moment to breathe in the fresh air. That's when I saw it, a small object on the wooden dock that jutted out into the lake. Curiosity peaked, I reached for my binoculars. As I focused the lenses, the object became clearer. It was another mask, just sitting there, as if waiting to be discovered. My heart sank. This was no coincidence. Someone had been here, in a place that required a key to access. A place that was off limits to the public. I grabbed my radio. Base, this is Stuart. I found another mask. This time it's by the lake, on the dock. Are you sure? The voice on the other end sounded incredulous. As sure as I'm standing here, we've got a situation. This area is supposed to be locked up. Understood. We're sending a team to your location. Stay put and keep an eye out. Roger that. I stood there, watching the mask from a distance. It was unsettling this intrusion into a place I had always considered safe. I felt exposed, like a deer that senses a predator but can't see it. The team arrived, and we documented the find snapping Polaroid photos, and sealing the mask in an evidence bag. But the questions remained. How did it get here? Who had the audacity to breach a restricted area? As we left the lake, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I scanned the tree line, half expecting to see a figure lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing. Just the rustling of leaves and the distant call of a night bird. The lake had given up its secret, but it felt like there were more to come. Back at the ranger station, the mood was somber. We were all thinking the same thing, but no one wanted to say it out loud. This was more than a prank. It was a violation, a breach of the sanctuary we were sworn to protect. And it was my job, our job, to find out who was behind it. As I clocked out for the night, I looked back at the park, its dark silhouette framed against the night sky. It was still beautiful, still a place of refuge, but it had lost some of its innocence and I couldn't help but wonder what else it was hiding, what other secrets were buried beneath its tranquil surface. This was no longer just about masks. This was about preserving the sanctity of a place I loved, and I was determined to get to the bottom of it, no matter what it took. Summer had settled over the park like a warm, comforting blanket. The days were long, the air was thick with the scent of blooming flowers, and the sound of laughter from families enjoying their vacations filled the air. But for me, the season had lost some of its luster. The masks had become a dark cloud hanging over the park, a riddle with no answer. I was driving my truck through a particularly dense section of pine trees, the air conditioning fighting a losing battle against the heat. The towering pines seemed to close in around me, their branches forming a natural tunnel. It was a part of the park that always made me feel like I was entering another world, a place untouched by time. 
but today it felt different. It felt like the trees were whispering secrets, secrets I was not privy to. I parked the truck and stepped out, my boots crunching on the bed of pine needles that carpeted the ground. I was about to head back when I saw it, a mask propped up against the trunk of a pine tree, as if it were casually resting there. My stomach lurched. This mask was eerily similar to the first one I'd found, but distinct enough to be a different one altogether. I grabbed my radio. Base, it's Stuart. Found another mask. This one's near the pine grove. A sigh came through the speaker. Copy that, Stuart. Log it and bring it in. We'll have to discuss this at the next briefing. Will do. I approached the mask cautiously, as if it were a wild animal that might bolt. I picked it up, its plastic surface now warm from the sun. I looked around, half expecting to see someone watching me, but I was alone, or at least it felt like I was alone. Back at the ranger station, the mask was logged and sealed in an evidence bag, joining the others in a growing collection that no one wanted. The room was thick with tension as we discussed the finds. Halloween was still months away, and the nearest store that sold masks like these was miles away. The internet wasn't an option. This was 1986, after all. Someone had gone through a lot of trouble to place these masks, and the why of it was driving us all a little crazy. We need to increase patrols, said my supervisor, breaking the silence. And let's get some volunteers from the community to keep an eye out. We can't let this go on. Nods of agreement filled the room. We were all thinking the same thing. It was time to take action. As I left the station, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were missing something, something crucial. The masks were a message, a signal of something darker lurking in the shadows. And as much as I wanted to believe it was just a prank, a voice in the back of my mind kept whispering that it was something more. I looked out over the park, its beauty now tinged with an undercurrent of menace. The pine trees swayed in the wind, as if nodding in agreement. This was a mystery that refused to be ignored, and I had a sinking feeling that things were about to get a lot more complicated. I needed answers and I needed them fast. The park was my sanctuary, a place I'd devoted years to protecting. These masks were an intrusion, a violation that I couldn't let go unanswered. That's why I found myself driving to the local college, where a man named Eric Pierce was said to have the kind of knowledge that could shed light on our mystery. The campus was quiet, the academic year having ended a few weeks back. I parked my truck and made my way to the history building, a brick structure that had seen better days. The hallway smelled of old books and floor polish, a scent that took me back to my own college days. I found Pierce's office at the end of the hall, its door ajar. Come in, he said before I could knock, as if he'd been expecting me. Eric Pierce was a tall man, his hair graying at the temples. His office was a labyrinth of books and papers, a lifetime of knowledge crammed into a small space. He gestured for me to sit, and I took a seat across from his cluttered desk. Nick tells me you're dealing with a rather unusual situation, he began, getting straight to the point. That's one way to put it, I replied, recounting the events of the past weeks, the masks, and the growing sense of unease among the rangers. Pierce listened intently, nodding as if he'd heard this kind of story before. When I was done, he opened a drawer and pulled out a folder, handing it to me. Ever heard of James Finley? he asked. I opened the folder to find newspaper clippings about a local criminal who had vanished without a trace years ago. What caught my eye was a detail about Finley's modus operandi. He wore Halloween masks during his robberies. This is starting to make sense, I muttered, the pieces of the puzzle falling into place. Pierce nodded. Finley disappeared in the woods near your park. Some say he buried his loot there, but no one's ever found anything. So you think these masks could be connected to Finley? It's a possibility, he said, pushing another folder toward me, but there's more. I opened the second folder to find missing persons reports. Three men, all in their late twenties to early thirties, had gone missing in the area over the past few months. These men were last seen near the park, Pierce continued. Locals say they were looking for Finley's treasure. A chill ran down my spine. So you think they might have found something they shouldn't have? Pierce leaned back in his chair, his eyes meeting mine. When people go looking for things, they often find more than they bargained for. I thanked Pierce for his time and took the folders with me, my mind racing as I drove back to the ranger station. If Pierce was right, 
we were dealing with something far more sinister than a simple prank. These masks were a warning, a sign that the park's secrets were darker than any of us had imagined. And as I pulled into the station, I knew one thing for certain. It was time to dig deeper, to unearth the truth hiding beneath the surface. Because whatever was going on, it was far from over. The ranger station was buzzing with activity when I walked in, folders in hand. I could feel the tension in the air, a palpable sense of urgency that had settled over us all. I briefed my colleagues on my meeting with Professor Pierce, laying out the clippings and missing persons reports on the table. The room fell silent as they absorbed the information, the weight of the situation sinking in. We need to involve the community, said my supervisor, breaking the silence. We can't keep this under wraps any longer. We need eyes and ears out there. And so, we organized a community watch, reaching out to locals who knew the park like the back of their hand. Hunters, fishermen, hikers, people who had a vested interest in keeping the park safe. We held a meeting at the ranger station, laying out the facts and asking for volunteers. The response was overwhelming. It seemed the masks had struck a nerve, turning a local oddity into a community-wide concern. Armed with flashlights and walkie-talkies, the volunteers patrolled the park in shifts, their eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. We set up a hotline for tips, and the calls started coming in. Most were dead ends, strange noises that turned out to be wildlife, shadows that were just tricks of the light. But then we got the call we'd been waiting for. A local fisherman was out on the lake, his boat drifting near the quarry, when he saw it. A figure standing on the dock, shrouded in darkness. He couldn't make out any features, but the figure seemed to be staring right at him. Then, as quickly as it appeared, it vanished into the trees. My heart pounded as I listened to the fisherman's account, my mind racing with possibilities. Could this be the person behind the masks? And if so, what were they up to? We organized a search party, combing the area around the lake and the dock, but it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Whoever this person was, they knew how to cover their tracks. We found nothing, not even a footprint. It was as if they'd vanished into thin air. The community watch continued, the volunteers more determined than ever, but as the days turned into weeks, the leads dried up. It was as if the park itself was keeping its secrets, refusing to give up the ghost. And then, just when we thought it was over, another mask appeared. This time, it was found hanging from a tree near one of the hiking trails, its empty eyes staring down like some sort of twisted guardian. I stood there, looking up at the mask, a sense of dread washing over me. This was far from over, and the message was clear. We were not alone. Someone was watching us, toying with us, and there was nothing we could do but wait for their next move. As I drove back to the ranger station, the sun setting behind me, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were on the edge of something dark, something that threatened to consume us all. And as much as I wanted to believe we could stop it, a voice in the back of my mind whispered the chilling truth. We were in over our heads, and the worst was yet to come. The summer was drawing to a close, the days growing shorter, and the nights cooler. The community watch had been disbanded, the volunteers returning to their lives, the sense of urgency fading away like the setting sun. But for me, the mystery of the masks was a wound that refused to heal, a puzzle with missing pieces that haunted my every thought. I was on the night shift, the park bathed in the soft glow of the moonlight. I drove my truck down the winding roads, the headlights cutting through the darkness. I was about to call it a night when my radio crackled to life. Stuart, you there? It's Paula. I'm here, Paula. What's up? I think you should come to the station. There's something you need to see. Her voice was tinged with a note of urgency that sent a chill down my spine. I turned the truck around and headed back to the station, my mind racing with possibilities. When I walked in, Paula was standing by the table, a look of disbelief on her face. Laid out before her was a series of Polaroid photos, each one more unsettling than the last. They were pictures of us, the rangers, taken from a distance, our faces clearly visible in the frame. Where did you find these? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. In the mailbox, no return address. They were wrapped in a plastic bag, along with this. She handed me a note, its message scrawled in a shaky hand. Stop looking, or the masks won't be the only things you find. My blood ran cold. This was a threat, a warning that we were getting too close to something we weren't meant to see. 
We need to go to the police, said Paula, her voice tinged with fear. I agree, I replied, grabbing my jacket. Let's go now. We locked up the station and headed to the parking lot, our footsteps echoing in the empty night. And that's when we saw it, a mask hanging from the rearview mirror of my truck, its hollow eyes staring back at us. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, my legs trembling beneath me. This was no longer a game, it was a hunt, and we were the prey. We need to get out of here, said Paula, her eyes wide with terror. But before we could move, the sound of footsteps echoed from the darkness, slow and deliberate, drawing closer with each passing second. We turned to look, and there, emerging from the shadows, was a figure wearing a mask, its face a grotesque parody of a smile. I reached for my radio, my hands shaking, but it was too late. The figure raised its hand, and in it was a camera, its flash bursting forth, blinding us in a burst of light. When my vision cleared, the figure was gone, vanished into the night. But the message was clear. We were not alone, and the eyes that watched us were not those of a friend, but of a predator, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And as we stood there, trembling in the darkness, I knew that the masks were just the beginning, a prelude to something far more terrifying, something that lurked in the depths of the park, a darkness that now knew our names. I sat down at my old wooden desk, the one that seen more years of service than any piece of furniture should. The creaking chair beneath me felt like it was sharing my burden as I opened my laptop. I navigated to the online community that had become my confessional, my sanctuary. My fingers hesitated over the keys before I began to type. Hey everyone, it's Ryan again. I can't thank you enough for the support you've given me. Your words have been a lifeline in a sea of chaos. I finally told Jen, my wife, about everything. It was like lifting a boulder off my chest. But I've got more to share, and it's heavy. I paused, thinking about Lisa. She was a good ranger, one of the best, but she'd been different lately, haunted. I continued typing. First off, Lisa, my fellow ranger and friend, has resigned. She's been having nightmares, the kind that follow you into the waking world. Nightmares about the Whistler. I remembered the last time I saw her. She looked like she hadn't slept in weeks, her eyes ringed with dark circles, her skin pale as winter. She'd pulled me aside, her voice trembling. Ryan, it's getting worse. The whistler, it's like it's coming closer, even in my dreams. Last night it was right in front of me, whistling that god-awful tune. I felt calm, too calm, like it was lulling me into something terrible. I'd wanted to help her, but what could I do? We were rangers, not ghostbusters. And now she was gone resigned and retreated from this cursed place. I couldn't blame her. I miss her, I typed, but I'm glad she's out of this hellhole. She deserves better. We all do. I thought about how I'd finally spilled everything to Jen. It was a hard conversation, filled with disbelief, fear, and finally, a quiet understanding. She didn't fully grasp it, how could she? But she knew I wasn't a man given to flights of fancy. The relief of sharing it with her made me feel like I'd shed a couple of decades. I told Jen everything I wrote. It was hard, but necessary. She's worried, but there's a newfound openness between us. Secrets are heavy, folks, and we're all carrying too many as it is. I wrapped up the letter. I'll be partnered with a new guy, Zach, starting tomorrow. He's young, fresh out of college, and I worry for him. This place, it changes you. I'll keep you all posted. Until then, stay safe and keep your eyes open. You never know what's lurking in the dark corners of the world or your mind. I hit submit and leaned back, staring at the screen as if expecting immediate answers to unasked questions. The room felt colder, as if acknowledging the weight of my words. I shut the laptop with a sigh. It was done, another chapter in a story that seemed increasingly like a horror novel. But this was no fiction, and the next chapter was waiting to be lived, whether I was ready or not. And so, in the dim light of my desk lamp, Surrounded by the wilderness that was both my workplace and my haunting ground, I braced myself for whatever would come next. The night was darker than usual, the kind of dark that swallows up the stars and leaves you feeling like you're standing at the edge of an abyss. I was paired with Ranger Jack, a grizzled veteran who'd seen more years in the park than most of us combined. His eyes had that far-off look, 
like he was always seeing something the rest of us couldn't. Quiet night, I said, breaking the silence as we patrolled the trails. Quiet's not always good, Ryan, Jack replied, his voice tinged with a gravity that made my skin crawl. Sometimes quiet's just the deep breath before the storm. I glanced at him, intrigued and uneasy. You speak like a man who's seen that storm. He sighed, as if debating whether to open a door long kept shut. Finally, he spoke. Ever heard of the Whistler? I felt a chill run down my spine. I have. Lisa told me about her nightmares before she left. Jack nodded, his face a mask of grim understanding. Well, I've got a tale of my own. Happened back in the 90s. I was a rookie, eager to prove myself. Got a call about a bear near one of the cabins. Turned out it was no bear. He paused, as if reliving the memory. It was a stormy night, much like this one. I reached the cabin and found a family and a young couple all scared out of their wits. They told me about a creature, something that stood on two legs and had eyes like burning coals. And then, in the middle of the storm, it broke into the cabin. I felt my heart pounding in my chest. What happened? It took the young woman, Jack said, his voice barely above a whisper. Broke the glass door and took her just like that. We heard her screams and then nothing, just the wind and the rain. I was speechless. The weight of his words hung in the air, heavy and suffocating. And management? I finally asked, my voice tinged with anger and disbelief. What did they do? Jack chuckled, a dry, humorless sound. What they always do. Covered it up. Said it was a bear attack. But those of us who were there, we know the truth. We heard the whistling, that eerie tune that still haunts my dreams. I looked at him, seeing the years of burden etched into his face. Why are you telling me this? Because you need to know, he said, locking eyes with me. You need to know what you're up against, what we're all up against. I nodded, a newfound sense of dread settling over me. Thanks, Jack. I wish I could say it's good to know, but he cut me off. No need to say it. Some truths are better left unspoken. But now that you know, you can't unknow it. Remember that. As we continued our patrol, the silence returned. But it was a different kind of silence, filled with unspoken fears and haunting melodies. And somewhere, in the dark recesses of the night, I could almost hear the faint strains of a whistling tune, a lullaby from the depths of a nightmare. And so we walked on, two men bound by a secret, a terror that neither of us could escape. The night was thick with mist, the kind that blurs the line between the earth and the sky, making everything feel close yet infinitely far away. I was on patrol with Zack, my new partner. Young guy, fresh out of college, full of that kind of optimism that only comes from not knowing any better. Beautiful night, isn't it? Zack said, his eyes scanning the horizon. Depends on your definition of beautiful, I replied, my gaze fixed on the fog that was rolling in, thicker and faster than I'd ever seen. We got the call around midnight. A couple, Jared and Emily, experienced hikers, had gone missing. Their family was worried, and with good reason. This park, it's not like other places. It has a way of swallowing people whole. We need to find them, and fast, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Zack nodded, his face serious. Let's do it. We followed the trail they were last seen on, our flashlights cutting through the fog like knives through butter. But the fog was relentless, swallowing up the light, the trees, the very path beneath our feet. And then we heard it, the whistling, a tune so eerie it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I stopped dead in my tracks, grabbing Zack's arm. Wait, I whispered, my eyes darting around trying to locate the source of the sound. What is it? Zack asked, his voice tinged with fear. The whistler, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. We need to go back, now. But before I could say another word, Zack broke free from my grip and ran into the fog, shouting the names of the missing couple. I cursed under my breath and ran after him, my heart pounding in my chest. I found him a few minutes later, standing still, his face pale as a ghost. He was staring at something, something I couldn't see, something hidden in the fog. What is it? I asked, my voice shaky. It's them, he said, pointing to a shape in the fog. Or what's left of them. I looked closer and felt my stomach churn. It was Jared and Emily, or at least what was left of them. Their bodies were torn apart, as if by some wild animal. But I knew better. Animals don't whistle. We need to go, I said, 
grabbing Zack's arm and pulling him away from the gruesome sight. But what about them? he asked, his eyes filled with tears. We can't help them now, I said, my voice filled with a sadness and resignation that comes from years of seeing things you can't unsee. But we can help ourselves. We made our way back to the cabin, our hearts heavy, our minds filled with images we'd rather forget. But some things you can't forget, no matter how hard you try. As we reached the cabin, I looked back one last time, half expecting to see a figure emerge from the fog, whistling that eerie tune. But there was nothing, just the fog, thick and impenetrable, like the mysteries that haunt this place. And so we walked on, two men forever changed, bound by a secret that neither of us wanted but couldn't escape. And somewhere, in the depths of that fog, I knew the whistler was watching, waiting for the next soul to claim. The morning after the fog, the park felt different, like a room where someone had rearranged the furniture while you slept. Zack and I were called into the office, a cramped space filled with the smell of stale coffee and old files. Management wanted to see us. Sit, said the man behind the desk, a faceless suit from the higher-ups. His eyes were cold, calculating like he was sizing us up for coffins. We're reassigning you, he continued, shuffling some papers. Effective immediately. I looked at Zack. His face was a mask, but his eyes betrayed a flicker of relief. I couldn't blame him. After last night, the farther away from that trail, the better. Any questions? The suit asked, clearly uninterested in any questions we might have. Just one, I said. What's going to happen to that area? Are you closing it off? The man chuckled, a sound devoid of humor. This park is a business, Ranger. We can't afford to close off an entire section just because of some unfortunate incidents. I clenched my fists, biting back the words I wanted to say. Unfortunate incidents? Is that what we were calling it now? We're done here, the man said, dismissing us with a wave of his hand. As Zack and I walked out, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders, only to be replaced by another, heavier one. We were safe, for now. But what about the next pair of rangers assigned to that godforsaken trail? What about the hikers, the families, the kids? Hey, Zack said, breaking my train of thought. You okay? I looked at him, really looked at him, and saw a young man trying to make sense of a world that had just shown him its darkest corners. I'm fine, I said, forcing a smile, just thinking about what's next. He nodded, understanding the unspoken words. We were both thinking it. Once you've seen the things we've seen, what's next seems like a question with no good answers. As we reached our new station, a cabin on the opposite side of the park, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I scanned the trees, the trails, half expecting to see a figure emerge from the shadows. Let's go, I said, ushering Zack inside. We've got work to do. But as I closed the door behind us, I couldn't help but wonder, was it work we were doing or something else? Something darker, something that had nothing to do with trails and hikers and the great outdoors. I shook off the thought, focusing on the tasks at hand. There were trails to patrol, families to assist, a job to do, but as I settled into the routine, a thought kept nagging at me, a thought as persistent as the fog that rolled in that fateful night. We were safe for now, but the whistler was still out there, and something told me our paths would cross again, in this life or the next. I sat down at my computer, the screen glowing in the dim light of my cabin. My fingers hovered over the keyboard, hesitant. I had a story to tell, a warning to give, but how do you put into words something that defies all explanation? Finally I began to type, my fingers flying over the keys as I poured out the events of the past few weeks, the nightmares, the fog, the whistler. As I wrote I felt a strange sense of relief, as if the very act of putting it into words made it less terrifying, less real. I hit send, my post disappearing into the ether of the online community I had come to think of as a second home. It was a place for people like me, people who had seen things, experienced things that defied all logic and reason. A place where the inexplicable was the norm and skeptics were shown the door. Almost immediately, the responses began to pour in. Words of support, of sympathy, of sheer disbelief. But among them, one caught my eye. A message from someone who claimed to have experienced something similar. A ranger from another park, miles away, but worlds apart. We need to talk, the message read. 
I think we're dealing with the same thing. My heart pounded as I read the words, my mind racing. Could it be? Could there be someone else out there who had seen what I had seen, who knew what I knew? I typed a quick reply, my fingers trembling with a mixture of fear and excitement. I'm listening, I wrote. Tell me everything. As I waited for a response, I couldn't help but think about Zack, about Ranger Jack, about all the others who had walked these trails, patrolled these woods. Were we all part of something bigger, something darker than any of us could have imagined? Finally, the reply came, a detailed account of events so similar to my own that it sent chills down my spine. The fog, the disappearances, the eerie whistling that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. We need to meet, the message concluded. We need to figure out what this is and how to stop it. I sat back in my chair, my mind a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. For the first time in weeks, I felt something I had almost forgotten. Hope. Hope that there was an answer, a way to stop the nightmares from becoming reality. But as I sat there staring at the screen, another thought crept into my mind, unbidden but undeniable. What if we were wrong? What if this was something that couldn't be stopped? Something as old as the hills, and as relentless as the fog that rolled in that night. I shook off the thought, focusing on the here and now. I had a meeting to arrange, a mystery to solve, but as I typed my reply, agreeing to meet in a neutral location, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were playing with fire, that we were about to step into a world from which there was no turning back. And somewhere, in the depths of that endless night, I knew the whistler was listening, waiting for the moment when we would venture too far and the hunter would become the hunted. I sat down with a stack of old reports, newspaper clippings, and a map of the park. My eyes were bloodshot, my hands shaky. I had been up all night trying to find a pattern, a clue, anything that might tell us how to stop this thing. Jen walked in, her face etched with concern. You need to sleep, she said softly. I can't, I replied, my voice tinged with desperation. Not until I figure this out. She sighed, knowing better than to argue, and left me to my obsession. Hours passed in a blur as I pored over the documents, my eyes scanning the text for any mention of fog, whistling, or unexplained disappearances. Slowly, a pattern began to emerge, a series of incidents stretching back decades, each one occurring in a different part of the park, but all sharing the same eerie similarities. I grabbed a red marker and began to mark the locations on the map, my hand trembling as the dots connected forming a shape that I couldn't quite place, a shape that seemed almost deliberate. My phone buzzed, snapping me out of my trance. It was a message from the ranger I had been in contact with, the one who had experienced something similar in another park. I found something, the message read. Something big, we need to meet, now. I quickly typed a reply, agreeing to meet him at a location halfway between our parks. As I grabbed my coat and headed for the door, I took one last look at the map, my eyes widening in horror as I finally recognized the shape. It was a circle, almost perfect in its symmetry, and at its center was the trail where Zack and I had encountered the fog, the place where Jared and Emily had gone missing. I felt a chill run down my spine as the realization hit me. This wasn't random. It was a trap, a web spun by something ancient and malevolent, and we were the flies. As I drove to the meeting point, my mind raced with questions. What was this thing? How could we stop it? And most importantly, what did it want? I arrived at the location, a deserted rest stop off the highway, and waited. Minutes turned into hours, but there was no sign of the other ranger. Finally, my phone buzzed, a new message lighting up the screen. Don't trust anyone, it read. It's not what it seems. Before I could process the words, a low, haunting whistle filled the air echoing through the trees and sending a wave of terror through my body. I looked around, my eyes straining to see through the darkness, but there was nothing there. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the whistling stopped, replaced by a silence so complete it felt like a void, a nothingness that swallowed everything in its path. I sat there, paralyzed by fear, my mind screaming at me to run but my body refusing to move. And as I sat there, staring into the abyss, I knew one thing with chilling certainty. It was here, and it was coming for me. I've always had a thing for the wilderness, 
the way the trees stand tall like ancient guardians, the way the wind whispers secrets through the leaves. It's like nature's own cathedral. So when I heard about Amica Lola Falls State Park, it wasn't a question of if I would go, but when. I spent the morning packing my gear. My old backpack, worn from years of adventures, seemed eager to be filled with camping essentials. A compact tent, a sleeping bag, a portable stove, and a can of bear spray, just in case. Maps of the park were spread across my kitchen table, trails and landmarks marked in red ink. I felt like a general preparing for battle. Only my enemy was the chaos of modern life, and my allies were the towering pines and cascading waterfalls. The drive to the park was uneventful, but the moment I stepped out of my truck and onto the soil of Amica Lola, I felt like I had crossed into another world. The air was different here, crisper, cleaner, as if purified by the trees themselves. I took a deep breath, letting the scent of pine and damp earth fill my lungs. It was like inhaling freedom. I shouldered my backpack and started my hike. The trail was well marked, but not overly manicured, a sign that this park still respected the wild's untamed nature. As I ventured deeper, the sounds of civilization faded away, replaced by the symphony of rustling leaves, chirping birds, and my own steady footsteps. It was as if the forest was welcoming me, pulling me further into its embrace. The sun hung low in the sky, casting golden rays that filtered through the canopy of leaves, creating a mosaic of light and shadow on the forest floor. I felt a sense of peace wash over me, a tranquility that I hadn't felt in years. My worries, my stress, the never-ending to-do lists, they all seemed trivial now, dwarfed by the majesty of the world around me. But as the sun dipped closer to the horizon, a thought nudged its way into my peaceful reverie. I still needed to set up camp. I looked at my watch and realized that time had slipped away from me. In the city, the setting sun was just a signal that the workday was ending, but out here, it was a deadline. Darkness in the wilderness was an entirely different beast. I quickened my pace, my eyes scanning the terrain for a suitable campsite. The forest seemed to sense my urgency, the trees whispering as if discussing my predicament. I knew I had to find a spot soon, somewhere I could pitch my tent and build a fire before the curtain of night fell. And just like that, as if answering my silent plea, I spotted it. A small clearing near a creek, the water glistening in the fading sunlight. It was as if the forest had presented me with a gift, a perfect sanctuary in the heart of the wild. As I stepped into the clearing, I felt a sense of accomplishment, but also a hint of apprehension. The sun was setting, and the forest was preparing for its nocturnal life. I shook off the uneasy feeling. After all, this was what I came for to be one with nature, to find peace in the solitude. But as the sky darkened, I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest was holding its breath, waiting for something, or someone, to break the silence. And so, with the last rays of sunlight disappearing behind the trees, I began to set up camp, unaware that the tranquility I had found would soon be shattered. The clearing by the creek was a godsend, like a sanctuary carved out by Mother Nature herself. The water flowed gently, its surface shimmering in the dying light, as if winking at me. I dropped my backpack to the ground, its weight leaving my shoulders as if taking with it the burdens I'd carried into these woods. I unrolled my tent, its fabric rustling like the wings of some nocturnal bird. The stakes drove easily into the soft earth, each thud a confirmation that I was claiming this little piece of wilderness, if only for a night. The tent stood proud and firm when I was done, a synthetic cocoon that promised a barrier, however thin, between me and the untamed world outside. Next came the fire. I gathered twigs and branches, their forms twisted and gnarled like the arthritic fingers of some woodland giant. The fire pit was a circle of stones, an ancient and primal design that had served mankind since we first stepped out of the caves and into the world. I struck a match, its flame tiny but fierce. The kindling caught, and soon enough a fire was dancing in the pit, its flames licking the air as if tasting the night. I sat back and opened a can of soup, its contents lukewarm but hearty. As I ate, I looked around, taking in the beauty of my surroundings. The firelight cast flickering shadows on the trees, turning them into wraith-like figures that swayed in the wind. The creek murmured softly, a lullaby sung by the earth itself. For a moment, I felt like the last man in the world, 
as if I had stepped outside of time and history into a place that was as ancient as the hills and as fleeting as the mist. But as the sky grew darker, the atmosphere changed. The silence that had been so comforting earlier now felt heavy, as if charged with an unspoken tension. The fire seemed less cheerful, its light struggling to hold back the encroaching darkness. The trees loomed larger, their forms less distinct and more menacing. The wind picked up, its gusts no longer gentle but forceful, as if warning me of something yet to come. I shook my head, trying to dispel the unease that had settled over me. I was an experienced outdoorsman, no stranger to the moods and whims of the wild. And yet I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest had changed, that it was no longer the welcoming sanctuary it had been just hours before. I reached for my book, its pages filled with tales of adventure and courage, of men and women who had faced far greater dangers than a night in the woods. I read by the light of the fire, its glow turning the pages gold, as if imbuing the stories with a warmth and life of their own. But as I read, I became aware of another sound, faint but unmistakable. Footsteps. Not the four-legged kind, mind you, but the deliberate two-legged steps of something, or someone, approaching my camp. I closed the book and listened, my senses sharpening as the footsteps grew louder. I was no longer alone, and as I sat there, staring into the darkness beyond the firelight, I felt a chill run down my spine, colder than any wind that had blown through these woods. And so, with my heart pounding in my chest, I braced myself for what was to come. The footsteps seemed to hang in the air, like an unfinished sentence. I strained my ears, trying to pick apart the sounds of the night, to separate the natural from the unnatural. But the forest was a cacophony now, its once peaceful whispers turned into a dissonant chorus of creaks and rustles. I grabbed my flashlight, its beam a lance of light that cut through the darkness. I swept it around the campsite, its glow turning the trees into pillars of light and shadow. But there was nothing there, no sign of whoever, or whatever, had been approaching my camp. Probably just an animal, I muttered to myself, trying to shake off the unease that had settled over me like a shroud. I was a rational man, a man of logic and science. I didn't believe in ghosts or monsters, in things that went bump in the night. And yet, as I sat there staring into the fire, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone, that I was being watched by eyes I could not see. I retreated to my tent, its fabric walls suddenly feeling as flimsy as paper. I zipped it shut, sealing myself off from the world outside. I picked up my book again, its pages a welcome escape from the tension that gripped me. I read by the light of my flashlight, its beam steady and unwavering, a stark contrast to the flickering firelight outside. But as I read, I became aware of another sound, one that I couldn't easily dismiss, a creaking noise, like the groan of old wood straining under weight. It was coming from the trees, from the towering giants that surrounded my camp. I listened, my heart pounding in my chest, as the creaking grew louder, more insistent, as if the trees themselves were trying to communicate, to warn me of something yet to come. I put down my book and unzipped the tent, my curiosity getting the better of my fear. I stepped outside, my flashlight in hand, and shone it towards the trees. They stood there, tall and silent, their branches swaying gently in the wind. But there was something different about them now, something unsettling. They seemed to lean towards me, their forms twisted and gnarled, as if reaching out to grab me. I shook my head, trying to dispel the illusion. I was letting my imagination get the better of me, turning shadows into monsters, sounds into warnings. I was a grown man, for God's sake, not a child scared of the dark. And yet as I stood there, staring into the depths of the forest, I heard it again. Footsteps. Deliberate, measured, and undeniably human. They were coming closer, each step a punctuation mark in a sentence I did not want to read. I retreated to my tent my hands shaking as I zipped it shut. I sat there, my back against the fabric wall, my flashlight gripped tightly in my hand. I listened, my breath shallow and ragged as the footsteps grew louder as they reached the edge of my camp. And so, with my heart pounding like a drum, I braced myself for the unknown, for the darkness that was about to step into the light. The footsteps stopped, as if hesitating at the edge of the firelight. My heart was a jackhammer in my chest, each beat echoing in the silence that had fallen over the camp. I clutched my flashlight like a weapon, 
its beam aimed at the tent's entrance, ready to reveal whatever intruder dared to step into its light. Minutes passed, but they felt like hours. The tension was a living thing, a palpable force that filled the tent, making it hard to breathe. I strained my ears, listening for any sign, any clue as to what was lurking outside. But the forest had gone silent, as if holding its breath, waiting for the moment to strike. Finally, unable to bear the suspense any longer, I unzipped the tent and stepped outside. My flashlight cut through the darkness, its beam sweeping across the campsite, turning the trees into ghostly figures that danced and swayed in the wind. But there was no sign of the intruder, no trace of the footsteps that had approached my camp. Must have been my imagination, I muttered, trying to convince myself. But even as I spoke, I knew it was a lie. Those footsteps had been real, as real as the fear that gripped me now. I turned back towards the tent, ready to retreat into its false sense of security. But as I did, my flashlight caught something in the distance, a shape that was darker than the night, a figure that seemed to absorb the light rather than reflect it. I froze, my breath catching in my throat. The figure was tall and hunched, its form indistinct but undeniably human, or at least humanoid. It stood at the edge of the forest, just beyond the reach of the firelight, as if hesitant to step into the open. For a moment, we were locked in a silent standoff, each of us waiting for the other to make the first move. I considered calling out, demanding to know who or what was out there, but something held me back, a primal instinct that screamed at me to stay silent, to not draw attention to myself. And then, as if sensing my fear, the figure began to move. It stepped forward, its movement slow and deliberate, as if savoring the moment. My heart pounded in my ears, drowning out all other sounds, as the figure crossed the boundary between darkness and light, between the unknown and the known. As it stepped into the firelight, I braced myself for the reveal, for the face that would haunt my nightmares for years to come. But just as it was about to step into the light, just as its features were about to be revealed, I felt a sudden rush of vertigo, a wave of nausea that swept over me like a tsunami. I staggered back, my vision blurring, my flashlight slipping from my grasp. I tried to scream, to shout, to make any sound at all, but before I could, the world went dark, and I felt myself falling, tumbling into an abyss that had no bottom. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. I blacked out, my consciousness slipping away like sand through my fingers, leaving me alone in the darkness, with the shadowy figure that had stepped out of my nightmares and into my life. I woke up to the sound of birdsong, a melody that seemed strangely out of place given the night's events. My eyes flickered open, squinting against the morning light that streamed through the tent's fabric. For a moment I lay there disoriented, my mind struggling to piece together the fragments of the night before. I sat up, my head pounding like a drum, each beat a reminder of the terror I had felt. I unzipped the tent and stepped outside, half expecting to see the shadowy figure still lurking in the woods. But there was nothing there, just the trees and the creek and the morning sun, all of it bathed in a golden light that seemed to mock my fear. I looked around, my eyes scanning the campsite for any signs of the intruder, but everything seemed to be in its place, just as I had left it. My backpack lay next to the tent, its contents untouched. The fire pit was a circle of ashes, its flames long since extinguished. Even the creek seemed unchanged, its waters flowing gently, as if the night's events had been nothing but a bad dream. But as I started to pack up my gear, I noticed something that sent a chill down my spine. My camping supplies were scattered across the ground, their contents spilled out like the entrails of some gutted animal. My food was gone, my water bottles empty, even my map was missing as if stolen by some phantom thief. I stood there staring at the mess, my mind racing. Had it been an animal, a bear perhaps, or some other woodland creature? But no, that didn't make sense. Animals didn't steal maps, didn't empty water bottles. No, this had been the work of something far more sinister, something that walked on two legs and knew how to cover its tracks. I packed up what was left of my gear my hands shaking as I folded the tent and shouldered my backpack. I felt violated, as if the forest had turned against me, had shown me its darker side. I wanted nothing more than to leave, to put as much distance between me and this cursed place as possible.
As I started to hike back to civilization, my steps quick and purposeful, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the shadowy figure was still out there, lurking in the woods. I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see it emerge from the trees, to hear its footsteps echoing in the wind. But there was nothing there, just the forest and the sky and the path that led back to the world I had left behind. And yet as I walked, I couldn't help but wonder, what had happened last night? What had I seen? What had I heard? And most importantly, why had it let me go? As I reached the edge of the forest, the trees giving way to open fields and paved roads, I felt a sense of relief wash over me, as if I had escaped some great danger. But even as I stepped back into the world of men, I knew that I would never be the same, that the events of that night would haunt me for the rest of my life, a dark shadow that I could never escape. I finally reached the ranger station, its wooden structure a symbol of order and safety in the midst of the wild. I pushed open the door, its bell chiming softly, a sound that seemed almost alien after the silence of the forest. The ranger looked up from his desk, his eyes meeting mine. You look like you've seen a ghost, he said, half joking, half serious. I hesitated, my words catching in my throat. How could I explain what had happened? How could I put into words the terror that still gripped me? I had an encounter, I finally said, my voice barely above a whisper. The ranger leaned back in his chair, his eyes narrowing. An encounter with what? A bear? A mountain lion? I shook my head, my hands trembling as I recounted the events of the night before. The footsteps, the shadowy figure, the blackout, all of it spilled out, like water from a broken dam. The ranger listened, his expression unreadable. When I was done, he sighed, as if weighing his words carefully. Look, it's easy to let your imagination run wild out there. The forest can play tricks on you, make you see and hear things that aren't really there. I stared at him, my heart sinking. He didn't believe me, didn't understand the gravity of what had happened. You think I'm making this up? I said, my voice tinged with desperation. You think I imagined all of this? The ranger shrugged, his eyes meeting mine. All I'm saying is that the wilderness is a strange place. People go missing all the time, swallowed up by the forest, never to be seen again. But most of the time, it's just a case of getting lost, of letting fear get the better of you. I stood up, my body trembling with a mixture of relief and frustration. He didn't believe me, but maybe that was for the best. Maybe it was better to let the world think I was crazy, rather than face the terrifying truth. As I turned to leave, the ranger spoke again, his voice low and serious. You said your map was missing, right? I nodded, my hand on the doorknob. He reached into his desk and pulled out a folded piece of paper, its edges worn and frayed. Found this a few miles from here, near an old trail that's been closed for years. Thought you might want it back. I took the map, my hands shaking as I unfolded it. It was mine, all right, but something was different. Something had been added a symbol or a mark that I had never seen before. It was a circle, drawn in what looked like red ink, near the spot where I had camped. As I stared at the mark, a chill ran down my spine, colder than any wind that had blown through those woods. I looked up, my eyes meeting the ranger's, but he was no longer there. The station was empty, as if he had vanished into thin air. And then, as if on cue, I heard it. The sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, echoing in the distance, growing louder with each passing second. I was not alone, and whatever had been watching me, whatever had let me go, had decided to come back, to finish what it had started. And as I stood there staring into the abyss, I knew that this time, there would be no escape. I pulled my truck into the airport's short-term parking lot, the gravel crunching under the tires like dry bones. The sun was setting, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch out like the years since I'd last seen Riker. My nephew, a city boy, born and bred, but with a yearning for the great outdoors that I could only attribute to some dormant family gene. The terminal doors slid open, and there he was, a backpack slung over one shoulder and a look of weary excitement on his face. He'd grown taller, his features more defined, but the youthful glint in his eyes was as familiar as the mountain trails I called home. Uncle, he shouted, 
dropping his bag and rushing toward me. I braced myself for the impact of a bear hug. Man, it's been too long. Sure has, kid, I said, patting him on the back. You ready for a week in the wild? Born ready, he grinned, retrieving his bag. The drive back to my trailer was filled with talk of college, jobs, and the mundane intricacies of city life. I listened, nodding at the right moments. But my mind was on the week ahead. The Appalachian Mountains were a different beast altogether. Beautiful but unforgiving, like a siren you couldn't ignore even when you knew better. We reached the trailer as darkness settled in, the outline of the mountains barely visible against the night sky. I fired up the grill, the sizzle of steak filling the air with a rustic aroma, potatoes wrapped in foil cooked on the side, a humble but hearty meal for the journey ahead. So what's the plan? Riker asked, digging into his steak with gusto. We'll hit the trail first thing tomorrow, I said. Got a few spots in mind that offer the best views and a good challenge. Can't wait, he replied, his eyes lighting up at the prospect. As the night wore on, the conversation shifted from the mundane to the mysterious. The mountains had their own set of rules, a code that every hiker should know but few ever did. I could see the skepticism in Riker's eyes, a city-bred disbelief in the inexplicable. But he'd learn. They all did. Hey, I said as he got up to retire for the night. Make sure you close the curtains in your room, all right? He looked puzzled. We're in the middle of nowhere, Uncle. Who's going to be peeping through the windows? Just trust me on this one, I said, my voice tinged with a seriousness that made him pause. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Riker nodded, his expression a mix of confusion and curiosity. All right, if you say so. As I lay in bed that night, the curtains tightly drawn, I thought about the red eyes I'd seen years ago, peering through the window like a malevolent force from a world we're not supposed to know. I thought about Dan Williams, a fellow ranger who'd laughed off the warnings and paid the price. And as I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't shake the feeling that the mountains were watching us, waiting to see if we'd play by their rules or defy them at our peril. And so, with the dawn of a new day, our journey into the unknown was about to begin. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee filled the trailer, mingling with the crisp morning air that seeped in through the cracks in the windows. I glanced at the clock, 5 a.m., early, but the mountains didn't wait for anyone. I poured myself a cup and took a sip, the bitterness jolting me awake. I heard Riker stir in the guest room, the creaking of the bed frame cutting through the silence. A few minutes later he emerged, his eyes still heavy with sleep, but a smile on his face. Morning, Uncle, he greeted, sniffing the air appreciatively. That coffee smells like heaven. Help yourself, I said, nodding toward the pot. We've got a long day ahead. As Riker poured his coffee, I started on breakfast. Scrambled eggs, bacon, and some toast. Simple, but it'd give us the energy we needed. We ate in companionable silence both of us eager to hit the trail but savoring these quiet moments before the day's challenges. Just as we were finishing up, Riker's eyes darted to the sliding glass door leading to the front porch. Hey, looks like Barkley wants in, he said, getting up and heading toward the door. My heart skipped a beat. Wait, I yelled, louder than I intended. Riker froze, his hand inches from the door handle. What's wrong? I motioned for him to follow me into the living room, my eyes never leaving the figure outside the glass door. It looked like Barkley, all right, but something was off. The eyes were too vacant, the posture too stiff. I pointed to the corner of the room where Barkley lay on his dog bed, snoring softly. That's Barkley, I whispered, my voice tinged with an urgency I couldn't fully explain. Don't open that door. Riker looked from the real Barkley to the imposter outside, his eyes widening in disbelief. Is that a stray? I shook my head. No, it's something else, something you don't want to invite inside. As if on cue, the figure outside the door vanished, melting into the shadows like a wisp of smoke. Riker let out a shaky breath. What was that? It's hard to explain, I said, choosing my words carefully. Let's just say the mountains have their own set of rules. One of them is to make damn sure it's really your pet trying to get in. Riker stared at me, his eyes searching for a hint of jest. Finding none, he nodded slowly. All right, Uncle. I'll remember that. We spent the next half hour getting our gear ready, the atmosphere tinged with a newfound sense of urgency. As I double-checked the straps on my backpack, 
My thoughts drifted to the red eyes I'd seen years ago and the doppelganger dog that had just tried to enter my home. The mountains were a place of beauty, but they were also a realm of mysteries that defied explanation. And as we stepped out the door, leaving the safety of my trailer behind, I couldn't help but wonder what other lessons the Appalachian Trail had in store for us. One thing was certain, Riker's education had just begun, and so had our journey into the heart of the unknown. The morning sun was a golden disk in the sky, casting its light over the undulating hills and dense forests of the Appalachian Trail. The air was crisp, tinged with the scent of pine and damp earth. It was the kind of day that made you grateful to be alive, and even more grateful to be miles away from the concrete jungle. Riker and I set out, our boots crunching on the gravel path that soon gave way to a dirt trail. We were surrounded by towering trees, their leaves forming a canopy that dappled the ground with shifting patterns of light and shadow. It was peaceful, the kind of peace you can only find in the heart of nature. So what's the plan for today? Riker asked, his eyes scanning the trail ahead as if expecting it to reveal its secrets. We'll head up to Eagle's Peak, I said. It's a bit of a climb, but the view from the top is worth every step. Riker grinned, his earlier apprehension replaced by the thrill of adventure. Lead the way, uncle. We hiked in companionable silence, each lost in our own thoughts, but united by the rhythm of our steps and the beauty that surrounded us. Every now and then, Riker would stop to take a photo or simply stand and breathe, his eyes wide with wonder. It was during one of these moments that I noticed the change. Riker's face grew tense, his eyes narrowing as he scanned the trees around us. You hear that? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. I strained my ears, listening past the rustle of leaves and the distant calls of birds. And then I heard it, a low droning sound, like a siren but distorted, as if being played through a broken speaker. We need to get as far away from that noise as possible, I said, my voice tinged with an urgency that made Riker's eyes widen. But what if it's a weather alert or something, he protested. It's not, I said, cutting him off. Trust me, we need to move, now. We turned and started running, our boots pounding the earth as we retraced our steps. The siren grew louder, then softer, as if playing a cruel game of hide and seek. Just when I thought we'd put enough distance between us and the noise, it blared again, this time so close it felt like it was right on top of us. What the hell? Riker yelled, his hands clamped over his ears, and then we saw it. A towering structure that looked like an old vine-covered telephone pole, but with speakers at the top. It was moving, its base dragging along the ground as if propelled by some unseen force. The siren wailed, a deafening sound that seemed to shake the very air around us. Without a word, Riker and I turned and bolted, adrenaline fueling our steps as we ran like our lives depended on it, because they did. As we put distance between us and that monstrosity, the siren's wail grew fainter, until it was swallowed by the sounds of the forest. We didn't stop running until we were sure it was gone, our breaths coming in ragged gasps, our bodies drenched in sweat. Riker looked at me, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and disbelief. What was that? I took a deep breath, my mind racing as I tried to find the words to explain the unexplainable. Welcome to the Appalachian Trail, I said finally. You're not in the city anymore. We found a clearing a good distance away from where the siren had nearly cornered us. Our breaths were still ragged, our hearts pounding like drumbeats in a war dance. I set down my backpack and took a swig from my water bottle the liquid barely quenching the dryness in my throat. Riker was pacing, his eyes darting around as if expecting the trees to come alive. All right, uncle, spill it. What the hell is going on here? I sighed, looking at him squarely. Sit down, Riker. We need to have the talk. He hesitated, then sat on a fallen log, his eyes never leaving mine. Is this where you tell me about the birds and the bees of the Appalachian Trail? In a manner of speaking, I said, taking a seat beside him. Except these birds and bees can be deadly. I began with the curtains, recounting the night I'd seen those red eyes staring through my window. I told him about Dan Williams, a fellow ranger who'd scoffed at the old tales and ended up a lifeless husk, his face twisted in eternal horror. Riker listened, his eyes widening with each tale. And you're sure this wasn't some animal? Or maybe a trick of the light? I've been a ranger for over two decades, I said. 
my voice tinged with a hardness that made him wince. I know every animal in these parts, and none of them have red eyes that can bore into your soul. He nodded, swallowing hard. Okay, what about that siren thing? What was that? That, I said, choosing my words carefully, is something you don't ever want to get close to. It's a cryptid, a creature that defies explanation. It lures you in with that siren sound, and if it catches you, well, let's just say you don't want to find out. Riker looked at me, his eyes searching for a hint of exaggeration. You're serious, aren't you? As a heart attack, I said. There are things in these mountains that defy logic and explanation. Old folks call them spirits, demons, cryptids, whatever you want to name them. They're real and they're dangerous. He took a deep breath, letting it out slowly as if exhaling his disbelief. So, what do we do? We follow the rules, I said. Always sleep with your curtains closed. Make sure it's really your pet trying to get in, and never ever get close to that siren. He nodded, his face set in grim determination. Anything else? I hesitated, then decided he was ready. There's a creature called the Wampus Cat, six-legged feline, bigger than a lion, with eyes that can hypnotize you. If you see it, avoid eye contact at all costs. Riker chuckled, then stopped when he saw my face. You're not joking, are you? No, Riker, I'm not, I said standing up and shouldering my backpack. These mountains are beautiful, but they're also a minefield of the unexplained. Stick with me, follow the rules, and you'll get through this. He stood up, his eyes meeting mine. I'm with you, uncle. Let's do this. As we resumed our hike, I couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. We'd escaped the siren, but the mountains had more lessons to teach, more rules to enforce, and we were just getting started. We made camp as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple that no artist could ever truly capture. The beauty of it was almost enough to make you forget the dangers lurking in the shadows, almost enough to lull you into a false sense of security. Almost. As Riker set up the tent, I gathered firewood, my eyes scanning the darkening woods. The rules were clear in my mind, each one a lifeline that could mean the difference between life and death. But there were other rules, other dangers that I hadn't shared with Riker yet. How could I, when I barely understood them myself? Fire's ready, Riker called, snapping me out of my thoughts. I returned to camp and sat by the fire, its warmth seeping into my bones as the temperature dropped. Riker joined me, a can of beans in one hand and a look of contentment on his face. This is amazing, uncle, he said, staring into the flames. I can't believe I've been missing out on this my whole life. It's a different world out here, I said, my eyes meeting his. One that can be both beautiful and terrifying. He nodded, his expression growing serious. You mentioned other dangers earlier. What were you talking about? I took a deep breath, choosing my words carefully. There's a creature known as the Wampus Cat. It's a six-legged feline, larger than any lion or tiger you've ever seen. It has golden eyes that can hypnotize you if you're not careful. Riker chuckled, then stopped when he saw my face. You're not kidding, are you? No, I said, my voice tinged with a gravity that made him sit up straight. Making eye contact with a wampus cat can put you in a trance, make you unable to move, and then, well, you become its dinner. He swallowed hard, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and fascination. What do we do if we encounter one? Your best bet is to catch it off guard and shoot it, I said, patting the rifle that lay beside me. If you don't have a gun, Hide and pray it doesn't find you. Running is not an option. He nodded, his face set in grim determination. Anything else I should know? I hesitated, then decided it was time. There are other things. Things I can't even begin to explain. Lights that dance in the sky but aren't stars. Whispers that come from nowhere. Shadows that move on their own. The key is to respect the mountains. To understand that we're merely visitors in a world we can't fully comprehend. He looked at me, his eyes filled with a newfound sense of respect. I understand, uncle. I'll follow the rules, all of them. I nodded, satisfied. Good. That's the only way to survive out here. As we settled into our sleeping bags, the curtains of our tent tightly closed, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that the mountains were testing us, waiting to see if we'd abide by their rules or pay the price for our ignorance. And as I drifted off to sleep, one thought echoed in my mind. The real journey was just beginning, and there was no turning back.
The morning sun broke through the canopy of leaves, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. We were up early, packing our gear and dousing the fire, leaving no trace of our presence. The mountains demanded respect, and we gave it willingly, knowing the price of arrogance. We've got a long hike ahead, I said, shouldering my backpack. We'll head down to the valley, then make our way to the waterfall. It's a sight to behold. Riker nodded, his eyes shining with anticipation. I can't wait, Uncle. This has been the most incredible experience of my life. I smiled, touched by his enthusiasm, but also wary of the dangers that still lay ahead. It's not over yet, kid. Remember, always stay alert. We set off, the trail winding its way through towering trees and overgrown bushes, each step taking us deeper into the heart of the mountains. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves, a smell that I'd come to associate with both life and death. As we walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone, that something was watching us from the shadows. I glanced at Riker, who seemed blissfully unaware, lost in the beauty of the moment. I envied him, wished I could see the world through his eyes if only for a moment. And then I heard it, a soft rustling in the bushes, a sound that was almost drowned out by the chirping of birds and the rustle of leaves. Almost. I stopped, my hand going to the rifle slung over my shoulder. Did you hear that? Riker paused, his eyes scanning the trees. Hear what? Before I could answer, a low growl echoed through the forest. A sound so deep and guttural it seemed to come from the bowels of the earth. I turned, my eyes meeting a pair of golden orbs that glinted from the shadows. Wampus cat, I whispered, my voice tinged with a dread that sent a chill down my spine. Riker looked at me, his eyes wide with terror. What do we do? Remember the rules, I said, my eyes never leaving those golden orbs. Avoid eye contact, and whatever you do, don't run. As if sensing our fear, the creature stepped into the light, its six-legged frame towering over us like a demon from the darkest corners of our nightmares. It growled again, a sound that shook us to our very core, then turned and vanished into the forest, leaving us trembling in its wake. We need to go, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Now. We resumed our hike, each step weighed down by the knowledge of what lurked in the shadows. And as we made our way through the forest, one thought echoed in my mind. The mountains had let us go, but the rules had changed. The stakes raised in a game we were only beginning to understand. And somewhere in the depths of the Appalachian Trail, the golden eyes of the wampus cat watched and waited its growl a chilling reminder that we were merely visitors in a world we could never truly belong. The end was just the beginning, and the real journey had yet to come. My name is Tom Owens. I am a retired worker for the Department of Agriculture, and I'm here to share with you a story that has been the source of much anxiety many questions, and more sleepless nights than I would care to think about. This is but one of the strange things that happened to me during my time working as a timber and silviculture tech for the Forestry Service in Indiana. For a long time, I have held my silence about what happened in fear of what may become of me if I decide to tell this story. I was forced to sign paperwork stating I would forever keep it a secret. Well, today that silence will be broken. Having worked for the Forestry Service for almost 22 years, it's easy to say that a person need quickly learn to respect the forest and its inhabitants, animal or otherwise. A lot of the work involved would probably seem like pretty mundane things, such as marking out trees for timber and preparing locations for seeding and tree planting. A lot of my time was spent alone or in small groups. Bizarre things happened to me in both of those situations, and I can assure you that the feeling of safety in numbers really did not apply in my experience. I cannot recall the exact date when this story takes place, but I know it was early fall of 1988, and I had recently just celebrated my 38th birthday and had been living in Nashville for a couple of years by then. I had been teamed up with Henry Waite and new boy Stanley Holt to scope out timber to be harvested for firewood in the Brown County State Park, just off the Salt Creek Trail. Henry, a towering frame of a man who, at one time at least, would have looked like he could fell a tree with a single blow of an axe if he so wanted to, had been doing this work almost his entire life. He was maybe three or four years off retirement at this point. 
He had deep furrowed lines crossing about his face and forehead, which suggested a more than serious look about him, and had a deep gravelly voice that time had clearly softened. I had worked with him on a number of occasions in the 22 years I had under my belt with the service, and in honesty, I didn't mind the old timer. I mean, he wasn't always the perfect co-worker. He could be awkward when it came to making decisions, and there were times when I would be sweating my tail off moving equipment about, only to find the guy sleeping in the cab of our truck, but I had to accept the poor dude was nearly 70 years old and had clearly done his share of manual labor in his time. I certainly had a lot more time for him than the others, it seemed. Henry used to have some really interesting stories. He used to tell others about stuff he'd heard out in the forest, and stuff he claimed to have seen too. Oftentimes he was alone when these occurrences took place, and the other workers never really paid him much attention, and generally would pass off his stories as mere scaremongering, verging on the ramblings of a senile old man. As for myself, I took his tales with a pinch of salt. Heaven knows you had to. Otherwise, you'd likely find yourself out alone one day and hear something in the distance and end up totally crapping yourself and running back to your truck. Other than this, though, he never was one to talk all that much beyond small talk and chit-chat, but when he was recalling one of his stories, he would come to life, so to speak, and really put a great show on. He was one hell of a storyteller, that's for sure. I can picture him now, with his tufty gray hair wafting about in time to his movement, and the large lump of fur resting upon his top lip, obscuring a rather large portion of his weathered old face, twisting and protruding as he formed his words enthusiastically. There's no telling what you might run into out there, son, he would often exclaim in his gruff, yet somehow gentle voice. But anyway, I'm here to share my own story, and I hope I can portray it as well as Henry often did. I remember the rays of the low-set afternoon sun were still strong for that particular time of year casting a warm glow over the still green forest surrounding us. We had just finished packing our kit bags with the markers and measuring equipment we would need, and were about to set off to the designated area on our charts to begin tagging trees ready for harvest. This was our last job for the day and conversation was thin, as Stan, the new guy, didn't seem like a conversationalist of any kind, and the three of us settled into that semi-comfortable silence that strangers often find themselves in when waiting for a bus or queuing up at the checkouts in the store. He struck me as the sort of person who was simply here to do his job and then go home. He had no interest in it other than the financial reward he would receive at the end of each week of work. Fine by me, I thought, as we quietly made our way along the well-worn path. The route we were taking was one often used by hikers to reach the nearby camping area and a rather nice viewing point. A few minutes passed before anyone broke the silence and it was Henry that did so. Looks like we need to follow the trail as far as the fork, then hang a turn south into the trees, he stated. Then probably another twenty minutes heading slightly east, and we should spot the first few that are ready for the chop, I said. You have been out this way before then I take it? Henry paused a beat before answering. Yep, remember this trail well. Been a few years, mind you. And he gave me a quick glance over his shoulder. I noticed that when I had asked the question, he had straightened his back ever so slightly as he answered. Something the matter, Henry? I asked. Not the location of one of your famous ghost stories, is it? I said jokingly, trying to lighten the atmosphere. Stan gave me a funny look that clearly said he didn't know what I was on about. Henry just scratched at his thinning hair. Ain't no ghosts in my stories, son. He didn't say anything more, just maintained the same pace, trudging ahead along the trail. What stories are you talking about? Stan was looking at me. A look of concern had crossed his face. He was only 20 or 21. His slight build looked out of place in his uniform, and the kit bag looked like it might pull him down to the ground at any moment. Oh, nothing really. Henry likes to tell stories about himself and scary stuff that's happened to him out here. He's quite the storyteller. Wouldn't you say, Henry? I said, glancing past Stan to where he was making his steady progress. He didn't respond. Scary stories? Ha, huh, like what? Stan said. Not ghosts. Witches and werewolves. Ain't that right, Henry? I said, trying again to get a reaction out of him. But still, he remained silent, except this time I saw his shoulders rise and drop in a theatrical sigh. I continued. Rumor has it the poor dude ended up marrying one, I said jokingly, expecting to have to dodge a right hook from Henry. But still, there was no noticeable reaction. I bet there are some really weird things out here, 
Not like people spend much time out wandering about the forest, is it? Stan said, adding his thoughts on the matter. Finally, he spoke. Not true, son. There's plenty of things out here. Not just deer and cougars, though. But sure, there are fewer people relying on the land nowadays compared to when I was your age. And that's for the best, I can assure you. So what about hikers and such? Should they worry about these... things? Asked Stan. He's been out here all of an hour and already he's lapping it all up, I thought. I wasn't that gullible when I was so young. Things is right, boy. I don't rightly know what someone should call them, Henry said. Sometimes I wonder if they're even really of this world. Okay, let's not scare the crap out of the poor guy before he's even done any work, Henry. We've got a lot to get on with this afternoon, and we need all the help we can get if we want a chance of getting home in time to see the sunset, I interjected. Henry chimed back with, All I'm saying is, it's best to keep an eye out for weird crap out here. We're alone and a good few miles from, well, anybody, if you think a bow. That's enough, man, I cut him short. For Pete's sake, can we just get on with finding these trees and doing our jobs? My temper was fraying. Henry wasn't normally like this. Usually he just wanted the same as me. Do a good job, then get on with making it back to the truck safely before it gets dark. I too had heard strange noises when working out alone, but your mind plays tricks on you when there's no company. The last thing I wanted was to be stuck out here in the pitch black with a rookie and Mr. Stephen King himself, lugging all this crap about with us. Henry just grunted something at me and carried on walking. Stan was eyeing me with a look of worry about him, but didn't press the matter any further, much to my relief. It wasn't much longer before we reached the fork in the trail that Henry had mentioned earlier. He set down his bag and took a seat on a fallen tree whilst I took out the chart and made note of our destination from where we were. Looks like we cut through in this direction, I pointed out. Then it should be only another twenty minutes further on. Is it okay if I go take a leak? asked Stan. I shouldn't have finished my flask of coffee on the drive over here. Does a bear crap in the woods? replied Henry. Stan seemed a little embarrassed, but said no more and cut off the path through the tree line for a little privacy. The trees were a lot denser in the direction we were headed. Not much sunlight made its way through the thick canopy provided by the trees and foliage. There was a slight chill in the air now, it seemed, and a gentle breeze had picked up along with what was the beginning of the even chorus of bird songs. So what do you make of him? I took the opportunity to ask Henry, Who? What do you mean who? Stanley, the new guy. You know, been with us the past couple hours on his first day. Or is your memory going in your old age? My memory is just fine, actually. I was just thinking about something else is all. Something else? Henry didn't reply. Care to elaborate? I asked after a moment. Just the last time I was up here. Not one of my best days at work, from what I remember. Some really weird stuff started happening. Oh God, can you drop the weird stuff thing already? I replied tensely. For the first time that afternoon, I felt a strange sense that something was not quite right. Like the sensation we were being observed or something. Jeez, have you let him get to you too? I thought to myself. I shook the feeling off and a moment or two later Stan returned and we made our way east as planned. Though this time I was paying a lot more attention to our surroundings. The area we were in occasionally received reports of large carnivores such as mountain lions, gray wolves, and black bears. It sometimes paid to keep a casual idea of your surroundings. I didn't fancy unknowingly being stalked by a mountain lion or such. About halfway to the marked area on the map, I began feeling my legs start to protest at carrying the large weight on my back. I wasn't unfit by a long run, far from it in fact, but as we were no longer on the marked path, it was surprising how much more energy was required to make progress through the undergrowth. Where we were headed was only just over a half mile from the trail as the crow flies, but the going was much tougher and more time-consuming. I began to wonder how long Henry would go before he too started to slow, but to my surprise, he carried on without a problem. Stan, on the other hand, was clearly not as used to the hard trek with the extra weight. Dark sweat patches had formed around his armpits, and I noticed him occasionally wiping the sweat from his brow. Suddenly in the distance somewhere came the sound of what I could only say was a chainsaw. Well, close to the sound of one anyway. It had an unusual buzz to it that undeniably sounded a lot closer than the noise of the chainsaw itself. All three of us stopped to listen. None of us seemed to be able to tell which way it was coming from. 
Didn't realize we were near a logging site out this way, I thought out loud. We're not. The closest one is about 40 miles from here, countered Henry. Could just be someone gathering some firewood, I said. Weirdly, the noises I normally associated with the forest had stopped. The breeze had died too. Sweat beaded on the back of my neck and slowly made a cold trail down right to where my belt was. I shivered slightly in response. I scanned our surroundings looking for the source of the noise, but the trees created a weird acoustic and I found it impossible to tell. Strange, Henry said. It sounds wrong. What do you mean? I asked. It sounds like it's on a loop, just the same buzzing noise on repeat. He was right. I hadn't noticed it at first, but it was clear now. There was no deviation in the tone of the chainsaw noise. Not like when you cut wood and the tone and pitch change as the engine works more and less to cut through the trunk of a tree. Something wasn't right about it, and it just made me want to be as far away as possible from it. Whatever it was, was giving me chills down my spine. Suddenly the sound stopped. Without warning, we were plunged into complete silence. No leaves rustling in the wind. That breeze was gone too, but most strange of all, not a single bird was singing. Not a single note. My unease grew even more, to a point where I actually felt like there was a lump in my throat I couldn't swallow. We should just keep mo- Click. The sound came before I could finish my sentence. I glanced over to where the noise had come from and I saw Henry aiming a .38 revolver high above his head. What the fu- Boom. He fired it. The surrounding area echoed the sound across the whole place and the forest itself seemed to come alive as hundreds of birds flocked from the treetops and made a quick getaway from the loud noise. In the distance, I noticed a few deer dart from the cover and disappear into the thick vegetation of the forest. You crazy son of a gun, why the hell do you have that out here? I asked angrily. You know we could lose our jobs if they find out you carry one of those in a company vehicle. Calm down, son. It's just a bit of protection. This is bear country, don't forget, said Henry crossly. Besides, nobody will find out as long nobody says anything. He eyed Stan and me as he said this. Geez. All right, just put the thing away before you blow someone's head off waving that about. Can we just get on and get home already? I said, throwing my arms up into the air and pushing past them both in the direction of the trees to the east. The chainsaw noise had disappeared too. Whoever it was were now probably scared someone lunatic was out here with a gun in the middle of nowhere. Henry scowled at me as I passed him, but soon matched my pace and was walking along beside me. Stan was following on behind. He didn't seem the least bit worried about what just happened. Guy's an idiot, this one. How can he not give a damn about him randomly firing off shots when he's just met the man? I wondered. You can thank me later, Henry said to me under his breath. What for? Bringing a gun with you to work so we can all get fired? No, for probably saving your tail back there, he said. From what? You really are crazy, aren't you? They have been following us for a while now. Goosebumps covered all over my skin and I suddenly went cold. The hell are you on about Henry? Don't mess about, this is not funny, man. Look, I'm not going to say anything, so just drop the act, will ya? I said. My mind went back to the chainsaw noise, wondering if he wasn't just trying to scare the living crap out of me. Because if he was, it was damned well working. Them things? You might not have seen them. But I did. See, I know what I'm looking for. I've seen them before. The last time I was out these ways, like I said earlier. What things, Henry? I thought those were just stories you made up to scare people. Holy hell, it was getting me worried enough as it is. I don't want to hear any more of it, I said. Look, all I know is that they mean bad trouble. They aren't natural, whatever they are. People go missing out here regularly and nobody seems to give a damn about it. Whole groups of people have gone out hiking and never return. Campsites are found undisturbed, but the owner just outright disappears. Then, the next you hear about them is a random piece of their clothing turns up out of the blue. Usually a shoe or something. No blood on it or scratches or anything. Normally within a few days of them disappearing. But whatever turns up is usually far away from where they went missing. Too far for them to have got there themselves in the time that they are gone. We're talking miles away. Something strange happens in this forest. So keep your eyes peeled, son. It might just mean the difference between going home tonight and not. This was the most I'd ever heard Henry say when not recalling one of his many stories. Something about the way he was looking at me and the way he said it told me he was being serious. 
So why aren't telling Stan the same thing? If it's that dangerous here, I countered. Because I don't trust him as far as I can breathe. Something different about him compared to before. He won't look me in the eye. Also, in case you haven't noticed, he hasn't said a damned word since we left the trail back there. He was right. Stan had not said a word since he left us and came back. He didn't even flinch when Henry had fired the gun a minute ago, and he was standing right next to him. It should have nearly deafened him. I thought about what he was telling me and tried to process it all. The sun was getting lower and the light level in the forest suddenly seemed a lot darker. All right, let's just say you're right. We're in the crap and being followed by... Whatever it is and something's not up with Stan. I glanced over my shoulder to make sure he couldn't hear us. Stan was ambling along behind us and staring hard straight back at me. Uh, ye... You all right back there, Stan? I stumbled over the words, oozing suspicion. He just smiled back and carried on walking, then looked out to his right into the trees. Damn, what was up with his eyes? They looked as though they were glistening as if he was going to cry. But his posture and his body language were nothing but confidence. Yet at the same time, the way he was walking seemed off, slightly rigid or something. Henry drew my attention away as he started speaking again. If I'm right, which I'm almost certain I am, we need to make it back to the truck and out of these trees, and fast. What if we don't make it back to the truck? I asked fearfully. Then we're screwed, said Henry point blank. By now I was genuinely scared. For the first time in my life, I was fearing for my life, and I didn't even know what I was scared of. We need to turn back. We're only an hour's hike from the truck, and we should have enough daylight left to make it in time. But we need to leave. Now, said Henry. And what about Stan? You think there's something wrong about him? I asked Henry. I think he's one of them, he said. Back when we're at the fork and he came back from having a leak, didn't you notice how quiet everything was? Like complete silence. Not quite, but damn silent. What, but it's Stan. Are you sure you don't need Gla? They can change into other things, came Henry's reply. My mind was racing trying to take it all in. There was so much that didn't make sense. It should all just belong in a horror movie, but now, apparently it was real. It takes them time to perfect it, and usually it's not perfect. They even sound exactly the same as the person they are copying. I'm pretty sure that chainsaw noise back there was one of them. That's why it was sounding like a loop. Almost as he finished speaking, the chainsaw noise started up again, as if on cue. This time, though, it was a lot closer, and I was certain I saw movement behind Henry. We both froze. Henry followed my gaze. What I saw chilled me to the core. In the middle distance was the silhouette of what sort of resembled a person sitting on their haunches. But this person would have easily been at least eight feet tall if they were standing. It took a step closer, and must have covered a good ten meters in one stride. Its skin caught a rare ray of sunlight filtering through the trees. Its skin was pale and sickly looking, and appeared to be painfully drawn tight over the skeletal frame of its body almost to the point of splitting open. I felt my blood run cold, but I couldn't move. I was frozen to the spot with fear. The same seemed to apply to Henry beside me. It cocked its head at us both, like a dog sometimes does. I realized its lopsided mouth was open, and just as it closed it, the chainsaw noise stopped abruptly, only to start again when it opened its mouth for a second time. Inside were luminous serrated teeth, huge teeth, like some dramatic makeup prop. Henry stole a quick glance behind us. Damn, he whispered. Stan is gone. What the hell? I stammered, but I couldn't tear my gaze away from this thing. It was like it was staring straight into my very being. Suddenly it closed and opened its mouth again. This time, instead of the chainsaw, it emitted a loud and clear click. Henry looked down at the revolver in his waistband. Holy crap, it's mimicking the noises we've been making, he said. Almost instantly, the creature lurched forward towards us at an incredible speed, but on all fours, bounding over a fallen tree half its own height like it was nothing. Run! I bellowed. I took off without looking back to check if Henry or the creature was following. I could hear branches breaking behind me, which I'm sure must have been him. As off to my side, I could hear the same, only a lot louder, as if whole trees were being snapped in half. I ran for my dear life, as fast as my legs would carry me. I dropped the heavy bag that was weighing me down, expensive gear crashing to the floor. Damn it, I don't care how much it's worth, 
I thought. The chainsaw noise was underway again, getting nearer and faster as I broke back onto the Salt Creek Trail. My feet pounded the dirt beneath me as I pleaded with my legs to move faster. I suddenly was hit by what I could only describe as a wall of stench. The smell of rotting flesh was unmistakable, making me retch bile into my own mouth and burning my throat at the same time. I looked off to my side, and to my horror the beast was getting closer, bounding through the trees just a few meters off. It locked eyes with me and I nearly stumbled. The thing was smiling at me, showing off row after row of unimaginably jagged, sharp teeth. It opened its mouth and let off an animalistic screech that was high-pitched and shrill, but reverberated around inside my body at the same time. I could hear Henry behind me somehow keeping pace somehow. He was keeping up even though he was in his sixties and we must have covered most of a mile by now. My own lungs were on fire and I could feel the burning in my legs start to become too much to push through. I was running on pure adrenaline and fear. I rounded the last corner before the small clearing, where we had parked the truck earlier. Just a bit further and I was free of this nightmare. As I crested the small hill leading into the car park, my heart sank. There was no truck. There wasn't even a car park. Just another seemingly endless trail. My mind worked overtime trying to figure out if I had made a wrong turn. I was sure I hadn't. There was only one trail anywhere near here, and it was the only one in and out of the forest for miles around. I could hear the creature gaining on me. I dared not look into the trees again to see how close it was. My thoughts changed instantly as I heard the unmistakable noise of someone stumbling behind me. Oh, fuh. Crap. Ugh. Henry had fallen. I skidded to a halt and swung around to grab him. No, keep going, he yelled at me. I hesitated for a split second. No, I can't leave him, I thought. But it was all the time the thing needed. Before I could take one step in Henry's direction, it was upon him. It pinned him face down into the dirt as it looked up at me. Its face was different. It looked like some kind of wolf, but with the torso of a man. What would have been its rear legs were also that of a wolf. Only this thing was standing up now and was at least seven or eight feet tall. All I could smell was rotting flesh, so strong it was making me want to puke again. My mind tried to make sense of it all. Had it changed shape again? I asked myself. The creature opened its wide mouth and let off a horrific screech before leaping away with Henry in its clutches into the tree line. As I stood there dumbfounded, I heard a wet squelching and cracking sound accompanied by a terrible guttural scream. He was dead. Henry was dead. Before I could even process that he was gone, taken by some damned creature, I head the chainsaw off to my side again. Tree branches started thumping and cracking as something made its way to where I was, and fast. There must have been more than one, I realized. I took off again, not even time to think about what savage end Henry must have met. Hell, I didn't even want to try to imagine it. As fast as my legs would carry me, I headed further along the trail that should have taken me back to the truck and to safety. Up ahead there was a turn in the track. Could I have got it wrong? Was the car park further than I had originally thought? All around me, the forest was alive with screeching and branches snapping and the loud clicks of Henry's revolver cocking. It was getting louder the closer I got to the bend up ahead. As I suddenly was on top of the corner the noises reached fever pitch. I was sure I was done for. I rounded the bend only to be confronted with the sudden end of the trail and a wall of dense, thick trees. I was screwed. I was certain that these were going to be the last moments of my life, torn to shreds by something nobody even knew existed. I dove into the trees, not wanting to give up yet, somehow believing I could escape. But in reality, the trees were where they were most at home, leaping about like it was nothing while I blindly tripped and stumbled my way onwards. Without warning, the ground beneath my feet dropped away, and before I knew it, I was falling, down and down, smashing into trees and branches on the way. I looked down at where I would land just in time to see a massive bough from a tree coming straight for my face. I hit it full force and saw stars replace my vision. I tried not to think of the terrible things about to happen to me after those things caught up with me. Then everything simply went black. All I was aware of was a high-pitched whining noise coming and going. I'm not sure how much time passed. The first thing I could sense was movement all around me. Then I could hear shouting. Yes, shouting. That meant people. Something opened my eye and a blinding bright light poured in, stinging my corneas. Then the same to the other. 
I opened them both and was staring face to face with a woman I had never seen before. He's awake, she exclaimed. My head was pounding and there was a tingling sensation down my left side. Suddenly I was aware of a terrible throbbing in my forehead. I let out a pathetic groan in response to the pain. Morphine, said the woman loudly. Her booming words rattled my brain. It's okay, sir. We're going to give you something for the pain. Just try to relax and not move. She was holding my head firmly in place. My eyes scanned over behind her and I saw a male paramedic coming over with a syringe. He just fell out of the tree line straight in front of my rig, a large man said. He was wearing denim and a leather jacket. He looked to be speaking to a police officer who was busy taking notes. I must have blacked out again because I next woke up in the hospital as a nurse was reading my vitals. Hello, sir. Don't worry you are safe now. That was some nasty accident you had back there. You were lucky that 18-wheeler didn't run you over. I opened my mouth, tried and speak, but no matter how hard I tried, no words would come out. It turned out I had suffered mild brain damage as a result of my fall. It took me nearly three years to be able to speak properly again. Endless therapy sessions, and the constant pain of not being able to tell anyone about what had really happened in that forest. Henry and Stan, to this day, are still listed as missing people. Police interviewed me, but all I could say was that I couldn't remember anything that happened that day. I was considered a suspect for a very long time, but they had no evidence of any foul play. I think eventually they got bored and genuinely started to believe I had hit my head hard enough to not remember any of it. I was also visited in the hospital by a representative of my employer. I was basically scared of signing a non-disclosure form about anything that might have happened to me whilst in the forest. I wish that were true. The truck driver visited me also during my time in the hospital. He was a nice man if a bit rough around the edges. Nick Current is his name and I'm still friends with him today, nearly 20 years later. The thing is though, something he told me doesn't quite sit right. The location where I nearly landed directly under his wheels was just outside of Bloomington on the I-46 road, over 10 miles away from where we were working that day. I still don't know what those things were in the woods. I try not to think about it mostly, they just give me nightmares. I'm just glad to have gotten it off my chest so to speak. Maybe tonight, I will sleep a little better finally. I just hope nobody else has to go through the same things that I did almost 30 years ago. I've always felt more at home in the wild expanses of Montana than anywhere else. The crisp air, the scent of pine and earth, the clear, star-filled nights. They're a part of who I am. My name is Robert Blake, a park ranger. At least that's what I used to be. The day that changed everything started out just like any other. The sun painted a golden hue over the morning sky, casting long shadows over the landscape. But the call I received that day was anything but ordinary. Lisa, a young hiker with a taste for the path less traveled, had gone missing. With a sense of determination coursing through me, I prepared myself for the search. It wasn't the first time I had been tasked with finding a lost soul in the wild, and I intended to bring Lisa back, just like all the others before her. I packed my gear, checked my compass, and set out towards the unexplored region where Lisa was last seen, a remote, barely touched part of the park that folks around here tend to avoid. As my boots crunched through the carpet of pine needles, a chill gripped me, unnatural for the season. The forest stood tall and dense, its quietness oddly unsettling. Usually the forest echoed with life, birds singing, leaves rustling, the murmur of a distant creek. That day the silence was profound, an orchestra with no conductor. I shrugged it off as just another quirk of this lesser known part of the forest. The deeper I ventured, the more the forest seemed to change around me. The trees looked distorted, gnarled, as if they held untold stories. Animals I encountered had a strange, almost knowing look in their eyes, their behaviors erring on the side of bizarre. They watched me as I passed, their gaze unsettling, filled with an eerie intelligence. As I progressed, my compass needle started to dance wildly. North was everywhere and nowhere. Static filled my radio, punctuated by fragments of an unintelligible language that sent chills down my spine. This was not normal, not at all, and the realization sank heavy in my stomach. But I couldn't turn back, not yet. 
There was a girl missing, and it was my job to find her. Hours turned into an afternoon when I stumbled upon what I'd been searching for, Lisa's campsite. The tent was torn apart, her belongings scattered around in disarray, but the absence of struggle or blood was eerily ominous. I found her diary, filled with hastily scribbled entries about whispering shadows and eyes in the darkness. As I read, a shudder ran through me. It was unsettling, yes, but also a sign that Lisa was here, and I had to find her. The sun began its descent, and darkness started to creep into the forest. But I couldn't leave. Not yet. I decided to stay, to brave the darkness. Maybe I'd find something in the night that would lead me to Lisa. Looking back, I see now that it wasn't the wisest decision, but at that moment, all I knew was I couldn't leave Lisa alone in this eerie forest. So I stayed, oblivious to the terror that the night would bring. Little did I know, I was stepping into a nightmare that would forever change me, leaving scars that even time wouldn't heal. The sun dipped below the horizon, plunging the forest into darkness. I set up a makeshift camp near Lisa's torn tent, the stark signs of her disappearance a grim reminder of my task. As the last light faded, the chilling silence grew heavier, a tangible entity pressing on me from all sides. I had always loved the night. The darkness was a canvas for the stars, the silence a melody of the wilderness. But that night, under the canopies of the ominous trees, the darkness felt different. It felt alive, almost sentient. The silence wasn't just the absence of noise, it was a void, an emptiness that felt like it was consuming everything, even sound itself. The wildlife, which had unnerved me in the daylight, was now completely absent, their absence only amplifying the sense of dread. I found myself missing their odd behaviors, their strange watchfulness. At least they were a sign of life, a comfort in the increasingly foreign landscape. As hours rolled by, the anomalies I had noticed in the day worsened. My compass needle continued its frenzied dance, oblivious to the laws of nature. The radio's static was a steady undertone, broken only by those cryptic foreign whispers. They grew louder, more insistent as the night grew darker, a grotesque soundtrack to my mounting fear. I began reading Lisa's diary again, seeking some clue, some hint about what might have happened to her. Her frantic entries about the shadows that whispered and the eyes in the darkness took on a terrifying new meaning as I sat in the gloom. Was this what she had felt? The same inexplicable fear, the sense of being watched. Desperate to break the deafening silence, I found myself speaking out loud, calling for Lisa, hoping against hope that she would respond. But my voice sounded strange, distorted, swallowed by the eerie quiet. The forest seemed to be listening, waiting, the dread was a living creature now, curling around my heart in a grip of ice. In the midst of this, I found something peculiar near Lisa's tent, a trail of peculiar footprints leading into the deeper parts of the forest. They were not human nor any animal I could recognize, a bizarre pattern that stirred a primal fear in me, a remnant from ancient times when humans were prey, not predators. I decided then, in a bout of what I now know was folly disguised as bravery, to follow the trail. I had a torch, a gun, a sense of duty that was beginning to feel more like a death wish. I couldn't shake off the feeling of eyes on me, a watchful presence that was neither animal nor human. With a deep breath, I ventured further into the heart of the woods. As I walked, my footprints joined those on the trail, an unwanted dance with an unseen partner. The decision to stay overnight was turning out to be far more terrifying than I had anticipated. The unsettling woods were proving to be more than just a strange, unexplored part of the forest. They were a living nightmare, a labyrinth of fear and dread. But I was in too deep to turn back now. The path before me held untold terror, but it was also the path to Lisa and to answers I desperately sought. That night, in the heart of the disturbed woods, I came face to face with an entity I could neither understand nor explain. I would not find Lisa but I would find fear, a fear so profound that it would change me forever. Following the trail deeper into the forest, I could feel the world shifting around me. It wasn't just the disorientation of the dark or the spine-chilling silence that suffocated every sound. There was something else, something deeper, a presence that I couldn't see but could feel in every fiber of my being. I had started to feel it the moment I stepped into this eerie part of the forest, 
a sense of watchfulness that hung in the air like a specter. But now, as I trudged on, the presence became more palpable, pressing against my senses with a weight that was almost physical. It felt as if the forest itself was watching me, whispering in an ancient, forgotten language. Suddenly, my torch flickered out, and I was plunged into complete darkness. Panic surged through me as I fumbled to turn it back on. All I could hear was the pounding of my heart in my ears, the rush of my own breath. The static from the radio had ceased, replaced by a silence so profound it was deafening. The whispers, now clearer, seemed to come from every direction, their cryptic syllables echoing through the darkness. In the distance, I saw something, a flicker of movement, a distortion in the darkness. I squinted, straining my eyes. Then I saw them, the eyes that Lisa had written about, glowing faintly in the dark, staring at me from the depths of the forest. I can't explain what I felt in that moment. It wasn't fear, not just fear. It was a feeling of being completely and utterly helpless, a small, insignificant creature in the face of something so ancient and vast that it made my existence feel pointless. I wanted to run, to flee, to escape this terrifying place, but my body refused to obey, locked in place by an unseen force. The eyes watched me unblinking. The whispers grew louder, their alien syllables filling the air around me. Then it moved. The eyes shifted, and I saw a form taking shape in the darkness, a mass of shadows that didn't belong to any animal, any human. The presence was no longer just a feeling. It was real, and it was right in front of me. The entity didn't attack. It didn't need to. Its mere presence was a show of power, of dominance. It was a part of the forest, or maybe the forest was a part of it. I could only stand there, frozen in fear, as it watched me with those glowing eyes. And then, it spoke. The whispers converged into one voice, a deep, resonating tone that echoed through the silent forest. It spoke in the same cryptic language, the words sounding ancient and powerful. I didn't understand what it said, but I felt it. A warning, perhaps, or a proclamation. It was a message meant for me, a solitary human lost in the vast, ancient wilderness. As abruptly as it had appeared, the entity receded into the darkness, the eyes fading away, the whispers dying out. But its presence remained, a lurking consciousness that filled the forest. I was left standing in the darkness, my mind reeling from the encounter. I didn't find Lisa that night, but I found something far more terrifying, an entity that was the forest, an ancient consciousness that still haunts me to this day. After the entity disappeared into the shadows, I was left alone in the profound darkness, my mind racing. The glowing eyes, the cryptic whispers, the sheer force of its presence, everything was imprinted on my mind, refusing to fade away. The forest, which had once felt like home, was now an alien world, a maze of terror where I was the prey. The silence was broken by a rustling sound. I spun around, the beam of my torch cutting through the darkness, illuminating nothing but trees. The whispers had died down, but a new sound filled the air, a low hum vibrating through the very ground beneath me. Then it came, a gust of wind, so cold that it seemed to seep into my bones. It whipped through the trees, stirring the leaves into a frenzied dance. A sense of dread filled me, a raw, primal fear that set my heart pounding. I could feel it again, the entity, its presence more intense than before. I started running. The fear, the raw terror, it fueled me, propelled me forward. Branches whipped against my face. Roots seemed to rise to trip me up, but I didn't stop. I ran, my breath coming out in ragged gasps, the cold air stinging my lungs. Behind me I could hear it, the entity. It wasn't a sound, not really. It was the whispers, the hum, the wind, everything merging into a dreadful symphony that seemed to follow me. I could feel its eyes on me, a predator watching its prey. I didn't know where I was going. My compass was useless, spinning wildly. My torch was a feeble defense against the all-encompassing darkness. All I knew was that I had to get away, get out of this terrifying place. After what felt like an eternity, I saw it, a glimmer of light in the distance. The sun was rising, painting the sky with hues of orange and pink. I ran towards it, my entire being focused on escaping the darkness, escaping the entity. As I emerged from the forest, the sun's rays hit me, warm and reassuring. 
I collapsed onto the grass, my lungs heaving, my body screaming from the exertion. Behind me, the forest stood silent, a stark silhouette against the dawn sky. The entity didn't follow me out of the forest. Maybe it couldn't, or maybe it chose not to. But even as I lay there watching the sun rise, I could still feel it. Its presence was like a shadow, a dark imprint on my consciousness. I never went back into the forest after that. The memory of that night, the terror, the entity, it was too much. I still have nightmares, dreams where I am back in the forest, being chased by the entity, its glowing eyes watching me from the darkness. The forest was my home, my sanctuary. But that night, it turned into a terrifying labyrinth, a place of fear and nightmares. It was a reminder that there are things in this world that we cannot understand, cannot explain, entities that are as old as the forest itself, lurking in the shadows, watching, waiting. The morning after the encounter with the entity, I was a changed man. I had ventured into the forest as a park ranger, confident and fearless, only to emerge as a shell of my former self, broken and terrified. As the sun rose higher, painting the world in shades of light, I hobbled back to the ranger station. Every step away from the forest felt like a victory, a triumph over the unspeakable terror that lurked within its depths. I entered the ranger station, my body still shaking from the adrenaline, my mind in turmoil. The familiar space felt foreign, alien, just like everything else since my encounter. I sat at my desk, the report forms in front of me a grim reminder of the task I had failed. I had gone into the forest to find Lisa, to bring her back to safety. Instead, I came back alone, with nothing but a terrifying story and the haunting memory of an entity that defied all logic and reason. How could I write that in a report? How could I explain the unexplainable? I wrote the only thing I could. I reported that I had found signs of a struggle near Lisa's campsite, signs of an animal attack. I couldn't bring myself to write about the entity, the glowing eyes, the cryptic whispers. Who would believe me? I hardly believed it myself. As the days turned into weeks, my life became a monotonous routine. I went through the motions, did my duties, filed my reports, but I could never go back into the forest. Each time I tried, I could feel it calling to me, the entity, its presence like a specter hanging over the forest. Sleep became an elusive friend. Each time I closed my eyes, I was back in the forest, under the gaze of those glowing eyes, surrounded by the alien whispers. I woke up each night, drenched in sweat, my heart pounding, the echoes of the entity's voice still ringing in my ears. I knew then that I could no longer continue as a park ranger. The forest, once my sanctuary, was now a symbol of my deepest fears. The thought of stepping into its depths, of feeling the entity's gaze on me, it was too much to bear. So I quit my job. I left the park, the forest, and moved as far away as I could. I traded the vast wilderness for the bustling city, the ominous silence for the constant noise, the ancient trees for towering buildings. It was a painful decision, a tearing away from a part of my soul, but it was a necessary one. I often wonder about Lisa, about what she saw, what she felt. Did she encounter the entity? Was she as terrified as I was? I wish I could have done more, could have saved her. But in the face of the inexplicable terror, my courage had failed me. The memory of the entity, its glowing eyes, its powerful presence, it haunts me to this day. I am a prisoner of my own fear, trapped in a nightmare that refuses to end. The forest, the entity, it is a part of me now, a chilling reminder of the night that changed my life forever. Moving to the city didn't help as much as I'd hoped. The towering buildings, the constant noise, the ceaseless bustle, they were all alien to me. I felt like a man out of time, lost in a world that was too loud, too fast, too different. But it was still better than the forest, better than the haunting gaze of the entity. My nights remained plagued with nightmares. The entity was always there, its glowing eyes watching me, its cryptic whispers echoing in my ears. I'd wake up gasping for breath, the terror of the encounter still raw, still fresh. It's been years since that fateful night since I left the park and moved to the city. I've grown used to the concrete jungle, the human-made wilderness, but I've never gotten over the fear, the dread that lurks in the back of my mind. One day, while strolling through a city park, I saw a group of children playing near a small grove of trees. The sight of the trees, their leaves rustling in the wind, sent a shiver down my spine. 
I could almost feel the entity's presence, the familiar sense of watchfulness. I quickly left the park, my heart pounding, my palms sweaty. Even the smallest grove was enough to trigger my fear, to send me spiraling back into the terror of that night. I realized then that I would never escape the entity, not truly. There are nights when I lie awake, the city's noise a muted backdrop to my thoughts. I think about the forest, the entity, the mysteries that lurk within the wilderness. I wonder if it's still there, still watching, still waiting. I know that I can never go back, never face the entity again. The forest was my home, my sanctuary, but it's also my greatest fear, a haunting reminder of the terror that lies beneath the serene facade of nature. I sometimes receive letters from my former colleagues, updates about the park, about the forest. They've found more missing hikers, more signs of struggle, more unsolved mysteries. Each letter is a chilling reminder of my encounter, of the terror that I left behind. The last letter contained a photograph. It was an image of the forest, taken near the place where I had encountered the entity. There, in the depths of the wilderness, caught in the camera's flash, were two glowing eyes, watching, waiting. The image sent a jolt of fear through me, the memory of the encounter flooding back with an intensity that took my breath away. I could almost hear the whispers, feel the entity's gaze on me. It was a chilling reminder that the entity was still there, still watching. I know now that I can never escape the entity, never escape the forest. Even here, in the heart of the city, I can feel it. Its presence is a constant specter, a chilling shadow that haunts my every moment. I am forever marked by the entity, forever haunted by the terror of the forest. As I look out at the city skyline, the forest's memory looms in my mind, a reminder of the terror that lurks in the wilderness, the ancient entity that watches and waits. My sanctuary, my home, is now my forever nightmare. Never did I imagine that the forest I considered a second home could become my own personal nightmare. The day started like any other adventure into the Appalachian Mountains. The sun was shining, the sky an expanse of brilliant blue, and the leaves rustled like a hushed lullaby on the summer breeze. Duke, my trusty German shepherd, was beside me, his tongue lolling out in anticipation of our venture into the wild. As an off-duty park ranger, I loved these trips. They gave me a chance to forget the demanding nature of my job and reconnect with the serenity of the wilderness. I'd camped in these mountains countless times before, but this time it was different. It was just Duke and me, two adventurers eager for some solitude and the embrace of nature. I made the drive up to our usual spot, the tires of my trusty truck crunching over the gravel road. Unloading our gear, I couldn't help but feel a sense of peace. I took a moment, drinking in the vibrant greenery around me, the scent of pine and earth, the distant burble of a creek. I've always found something therapeutic about being out here, away from the bustle of everyday life. Duke, as always, was a bundle of energy. He dashed around, sniffing excitedly at bushes and trees, marking our arrival. The sight of him, so happy and carefree, brought a smile to my face. Slow down, boy, I called out to him, but my admonishment was swallowed by the expanse, my voice echoing softly against the distant mountains. Setting up camp was second nature to me. With practiced ease, I pitched our tent on a patch of flat ground near a clear, bubbling stream. I arranged the rest of our gear, double-checking everything was in order before rewarding myself with a break. I cracked open a beer, took a long swig, and watched as Duke splashed about in the stream. Night fell gradually, the setting sun painting the sky in hues of pink and orange, before surrendering to the encroaching darkness. I built a campfire, its warm glow pushing back against the night. Duke settled in next to me, his wet coat steaming slightly in the fire's warmth. The comforting crackle of the fire filled the silence, a melody as familiar as an old song. As I looked out into the darkening forest, its shadows deepening with the waning light, I felt a strange unease. I shrugged it off, attributing it to the solitude and the encroaching night. Little did I know then that this journey would take a turn for the terrifying that these familiar woods would soon become a maze of fear. 
I remember those last moments of peace, the calm before the storm, before I drifted off to sleep. Duke, my loyal companion, lay close, his rhythmic breathing a comforting lullaby. The forest whispered its nighttime secrets, the stars above twinkling like a thousand watchful eyes. Yet, in that peaceful silence, a hint of our upcoming ordeal echoed ominously. If I'd known what awaited us, would I have packed up and left that very night? But of course, the future was a mystery then, obscured by the veil of the unknown. Unaware of the nightmares that awaited us, Duke and I fell asleep to the symphony of the wild, blissfully ignorant of the horrors the following days held. Morning broke with a strange stillness, the usual chorus of birdsong muted, as if the wilderness itself was holding its breath. The first pangs of unease fluttered in my gut, but I shook it off, blaming it on a rough night's sleep. I went about my morning routine, brewing strong coffee over the campfire and sharing breakfast with Duke, who seemed his usual energetic self. Yet, as the day unfolded, an odd disquiet seeped into my bones. Time felt distorted, elastic. Hours seemed to compress into minutes. One moment, the sun was high in the sky, casting long, dappled shadows through the canopy. And the next, the afternoon was already waning, a cool breeze rustling through the trees. I tried to ignore the unsettling sensation, attributing it to my solo sojourn and the strange rhythm of the wilderness. But as the day wore on, the feeling persisted. An hour-long hike felt like minutes, while moments of idle rest stretched out, seemingly endless. As the disconcerting day gave way to twilight, I found another enigma waiting. My meticulously organized camping gear was displaced, items moved or missing entirely. My map and compass, which I'd placed inside my backpack, were found outside, near the edge of our camp. A pot I'd used to heat our dinner was missing, only to be discovered later, filled with rainwater, some distance away from our site. Duke, who usually dozed through the afternoons, was unusually alert. His ears perked up, his gaze constantly flitting towards the dense undergrowth. The sight of him, usually so carefree, now riddled with anxiety, unsettled me more than I cared to admit. The nightfall was eerie, the forest unnaturally silent. I cooked a simple meal, my thoughts racing, my heart beating an anxious rhythm in my chest. I considered leaving, but the thought of navigating the treacherous mountain roads at night kept me rooted. Later, as I lay under the canvas of the tent, the darkness pressing in from all sides, an unfamiliar sound echoed in the distance. A low hum, pulsating, seeming to originate from the depths of the forest. It was a sound alien to the usual symphony of the wilderness, chilling me to my core. Duke stiffened beside me, a low growl rumbling in his chest. I told myself that it was just the wind, the rustling of leaves, anything but the haunting drone that seemed to reverberate through the very ground beneath us. My own reassurances fell flat, the sound continuing unabated, a spectral echo in the quiet night. As the surreal day gave way to an even stranger night, the reality of my situation began to set in. I was alone, lost in an unfamiliar version of my beloved wilderness, with only my faithful dog for company. As the strange sound filled the night, its rhythm matching the pounding fear in my heart, I realized that the solitude I had sought was morphing into a terrifying isolation. I spent the rest of the night in a fitful sleep, the haunting hum a constant undertone to my troubled dreams. The image of my displaced gear and Duke's anxious demeanor haunted me, the forest whispers growing louder, more insidious. Unbeknownst to me then, this was just the beginning, the first strains of a nightmare that would plunge me and Duke into a horrifying ordeal, forever changing our perception of the wilderness we once considered home. Each day brought more confusion, my perception of time growing increasingly distorted. The pulsating hum from the heart of the forest became a nightly terror, an unyielding rhythm that reverberated in my bones, filling my dreams with a sense of impending doom. Even Duke, brave and stalwart as always, had become a shadow of his former self. His eyes, once filled with playful curiosity, were now clouded with a palpable fear. I tried to convince myself that it was all in my mind, a figment of my imagination, a consequence of solitude. After all, I was a seasoned park ranger, a man of the wilderness. I was familiar with every nook and cranny of these mountains, every animal that prowled these woods. But the displaced gear, 
the unsettling hum, the warping time, Duke's strange behavior, none of it fit the pattern of my past experiences. No natural explanation seemed to quell the terror brewing inside me. I was in my territory, yet it felt alien, as if the wilderness itself was turning against me. One morning, I awoke to find Duke rigid with fear, his fur standing on end, his eyes trained on the dense forest. I strained my ears, expecting to hear the eerie hum, but instead, a shuffling noise came from the undergrowth, too heavy to be just the wind rustling the leaves. I grabbed my flashlight, its beam piercing the early morning fog, but there was nothing there, just the dense forest, shrouded in a deceptive calm. The hum returned that night, more ominous than ever, as if mocking my attempts at reasoning. During the following days, I tried to carry on as normal, but the strange occurrences continued. Items were displaced more frequently, Duke's agitation escalated, and the ominous hum became a haunting serenade to the nightmare that was unfolding around me. As a park ranger, I had my share of frightening encounters, poachers, wildlife, harsh weather, but this was different. This fear was not of a known danger, but an unseen, unheard, unfathomable presence that seemed to cloak the forest. This fear gnawed at my sanity, kept me up at night, and made me dread the approaching darkness. Every night was a battle, a struggle to make sense of the unknown terror that gripped me. The once comforting isolation had turned into an oppressive solitude. Duke and I were on edge, our nerves frayed, the tension a heavy shroud wrapped around our little campsite but nothing could have prepared me for what happened next. The terrifying ordeal that was about to unfold was beyond anything I had ever faced in my life. It was a nightmare from which there was no waking, a horror that no amount of training could have prepared me for. As I stoked the dying embers of our campfire one night, an otherworldly presence descended upon our camp, an unspeakable terror that would confirm my worst fears and leave me questioning everything I thought I knew about the wilderness. Little did I know that the pulsating hum that filled our nights, Duke's growing restlessness, and the strange happenings were merely the overture to an encounter that would send us fleeing into the depths of the forest, our very lives hanging in the balance. The night was black as pitch, the fire our only source of light against the enveloping darkness. The humming had grown louder, more insistent, a haunting dirge echoing through the desolate forest. Duke lay by my side, his body tense, every fiber of his being attuned to the unseen menace. The fear was a living, breathing entity now, wrapping its cold tendrils around my heart, squeezing tighter with every beat. I found myself staring into the shadows, my mind churning with horrifying possibilities. My rational side fought to regain control, yet the mounting evidence was hard to ignore. Suddenly Duke growled, a deep guttural sound that sent chills down my spine. His gaze was fixed on a spot just beyond our firelit sanctuary. I followed his gaze, my heart pounding a brutal rhythm in my chest. There, on the edge of the light, something moved. An indistinct shape that was too large to be any regular forest inhabitant. I scrambled for my flashlight, its feeble beam cutting through the darkness. But the light only served to deepen the shadows, the creature lurking just beyond its reach. I could hear it moving, the rustling of leaves the snapping of twigs under its weight. As if it sensed my fear, the creature stepped into the light, its form clearer than I would have liked. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, a twisted fusion of man and beast, its eyes glowing an eerie green. The sight of it, this perversion of nature, drained the blood from my face, and a cold sweat broke out on my forehead. A scream tore from my throat, raw and primal, a feeble protest against the unimaginable horror before me. Duke barked furiously, his usual courage wavering in the face of the monstrosity. The creature responded with a gut-wrenching roar, the sound echoing in the silent night, drowning out the omnipresent hum. Panic took over, obliterating any semblance of reason. I scooped up Duke and bolted, the flashlight dropping from my grasp, plunging our world into darkness. The terrifying roar followed us, a grotesque serenade to our desperate flight. The forest, once my haven, turned into a nightmarish labyrinth. Branches reached out like gnarled hands, clawing at my face and clothes. Rocks and roots emerged out of nowhere, tripping me up. But I couldn't afford to slow down, not with the monstrous presence hot on our heels. The fire, our camp, our gear, 
All were left behind in the chaos. My only thoughts were of escape, of getting as far away from the creature as possible. The forest closed in around me, an impenetrable wall of shadows and fear. Driven by sheer terror, Duke and I ran. We plunged deeper into the forest, our world reduced to the chilling roars of the creature and the thudding of our own hearts. As we ventured further into the unknown, I couldn't help but realize that we were not just running from a creature. We were running from the realization that our beloved wilderness had been transformed into a terrifying realm of the unknown, a place where nightmares came to life. Days and nights blurred into a relentless cycle of fear and exhaustion. The wilderness was no longer a familiar sanctuary. It was a twisted maze of haunting echoes and lurking shadows. Each rustle in the undergrowth was the creature closing in. Every unexpected sound was a signal of our impending doom. The creature, thankfully, seemed to have lost our trail, but the damage was done. The pulsating hum was replaced by a chilling silence that was just as unnerving. The disorientation was severe. I tried to navigate by the stars, my ranger training kicking in, but the dense canopy above offered little assistance. Duke and I moved as stealthily as possible, driven by an instinctive will to survive. Our days were spent in a haze of fear, our nights filled with disturbing dreams and jolts of panic. Our only sustenance was the few edible berries and plants I could identify, and the occasional small game I managed to snare. Eventually, after what felt like weeks but could have been days, we emerged on the other side of the forest. The sight of an open road slicing through the greenery was more beautiful than any mountain vista I had ever encountered. Relief washed over me, a palpable force that left me weak-kneed. Duke seemed to share my sentiment, his tail wagging for the first time in days. We staggered onto the road, our bodies battered, our spirits barely holding on. I tried to wave down the first vehicle I saw, but the driver, probably spooked by my disheveled appearance, sped away. My heart sank, but I gathered what little energy I had left and prepared to try again. The next car, however, was a different story. The driver, a middle-aged man with kind eyes, pulled over and rolled down his window. After explaining our predicament in a hoarse whisper, he readily agreed to take us back to my vehicle. The drive back was a surreal experience. Sitting in the passenger seat, with Duke's head resting on my lap, I watched the familiar landscapes whiz by, a stark contrast to the alien nightmare we had just escaped from. When we reached my parked vehicle, I thanked the driver profusely promising to pay his kindness forward. As Duke and I climbed into the car, the man gave us a sympathetic smile and drove away. As I turned the key in the ignition, I took a moment to process everything we had gone through. The safety of the car felt like a cocoon, shielding us from the horror we had left behind. I stared at the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the creature emerge from the forest. But there was nothing, just the whispering trees swaying in the breeze. We drove away in silence, the echoing roar of the creature still ringing in my ears, a chilling reminder of the nightmare we had survived. The hum may have subsided, the displaced gear was now a distant memory, but the terrifying creature and its haunting presence were forever seared into my consciousness. Little did I know that the horror wasn't over, not by a long shot. The most chilling revelation was yet to come. I returned to my cabin at the edge of the park, a safe haven I never thought I'd see again. Duke and I were silent wrecks, our minds grappling with the terrifying ordeal we had barely survived. The comfort of a hot shower and a soft bed seemed a world away from the nightmare we had fled. After ensuring Duke was settled in, I ventured out to report my encounter to the local authorities. The disbelief was palpable as I recounted my experience, the creature, the hum, the displaced gear. I had expected skepticism, but the outright dismissal stung. Days turned into weeks, but the memories of the creature and the forest were as fresh as ever. Duke and I were forever altered by the experience, our once adventurous spirits replaced by a lingering dread, but the most terrifying part was yet to come. One night as I lay tossing and turning, a familiar sound pierced the silence. The hum. It was faint, almost imperceptible, but unmistakably the same ominous sound that had haunted our camping expedition. A cold fear gripped my heart. Duke's low growl confirmed my worst fears. I shot up in bed, my eyes scanning the darkness outside the window. But there was nothing, just the quiet, isolated landscape bathed in moonlight. But the hum persisted, 
a spectral symphony to my spiraling terror. That's when I noticed it. The flashlight, the same one I had dropped in our panicked flight, was lying on my bedside table. Its presence was impossible, a chilling testament to the inescapable horror that had followed us back. The forest, the creature, the terrifying ordeal. It was all right here in my supposed safe haven. The familiar objects in the cabin suddenly felt alien, menacing. I glanced at Duke, his eyes mirroring my fear. We were not safe. We had not escaped. The nightmare was not confined to the wilderness. It had followed us back, marking our existence with its horrifying presence. That night, sleep eluded me. The hum seemed to grow louder with each passing minute, an ominous lullaby for the dawn that never seemed to come. The cabin, once my refuge, was now just another scene in the terrifying narrative that was my life. The subsequent days were a blur of sleepless nights and paranoia-filled days. The hum persisted, a constant reminder of the creature lurking in the shadows of my mind. The flashlight, despite my several attempts to dispose of it, always found its way back. As I pen down these words, the hum resonates around me, a soundtrack to my living nightmare. The flashlight flickers, casting eerie shadows around the room. Duke, my loyal companion, cowers by my side, his eyes never leaving the window. The wilderness has followed us back. The creature, the terror, the fear, they are all here, shrouded in the seemingly mundane surroundings of my home. There is no escape from this nightmare, no waking up to a bright and sunny day. Our tale doesn't end with a triumphant return. It continues in this never-ending horror that is our reality. This is our life now, forever trapped in a terrifying echo of that fateful camping trip in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. I pulled my truck into the clearing, gravel crunching under the tires like the sound of a campfire. The fire tower loomed above the trees, a skeletal structure that seemed both out of place and yet perfectly suited for this isolated patch of wilderness. I killed the engine and sat there for a moment, taking in the silence that only nature can offer. It was a silence that spoke volumes, filled with the whispers of the wind through the pines and the distant calls of nocturnal creatures waking to their dark world. I grabbed my gear and locked the truck. As I approached the base of the tower, I noticed a small, weather-beaten shed nearby. The door creaked open and out stepped Jim, the ranger I was relieving. He was a grizzled man, his face etched with lines that told stories of years spent under the sun and against the wind. Evening, he greeted, extending a hand roughened by years of labor. You must be the new guy. That's me, I said, shaking his hand. First night on the tower. Jim's eyes narrowed slightly, as if measuring me up, weighing my metal. Well, it's not a job for everyone. Gets lonely up there, and quiet, too quiet sometimes. I think I can handle it, I replied, a hint of youthful arrogance coloring my words. Jim chuckled, a low, rumbling sound like distant thunder. We'll see. Here, he said, handing me a small, tattered manual. Read this. It's got some rules you'll need to follow. I glanced at the manual. It looked like something from a bygone era, its pages yellowed and corners dog-eared. Rules? Yeah, Jim said, his voice dropping a notch. Important ones. Don't ignore them. I flipped open the manual and skimmed through the list. Do not leave the tower. Turn off all lights between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. Do not answer the radio during this hour. The rules read like a cross between standard operating procedures and superstitious folklore. Are these for real? I asked skepticism lacing my voice. Jim locked eyes with me, and for a moment I saw something there. A flicker of earnestness, a shadow of concern. Deadly real, he said. You'd do well to remember them. I nodded, not fully convinced but not willing to dismiss him outright. All right, I'll keep them in mind. Good, Jim said, clapping me on the back. You've got the radio if you need anything, but remember, no calls between two and three. That's your time to be vigilant. With that cryptic advice, Jim headed toward his truck, leaving me standing there with the manual in hand. I watched him drive off, his taillights disappearing into the darkening forest, and then turned my attention to the tower. Taking a deep breath, I began my ascent, each step echoing with a metallic clang that shattered the natural silence. When I reached the top, I unlocked the hatch and stepped into the cabin. It was a small, utilitarian space equipped with the basics, radio, binoculars, a first aid kit, and a bed. 
I set my gear down and took a seat, flipping on the radio and adjusting the binoculars. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with hues of orange and purple, I felt a sense of isolation envelop me, as if the tower were an island in a sea of darkness. And so, my vigil began. I had no idea then how crucial those strange rules would become, how they would test the very limits of my sanity and courage. But for now, I was alone, perched high above the world, a guardian in a tower of secrets and silence. And I was ready, or so I thought. The night settled in like a heavy blanket, the kind that smothers you in its weight. I leaned back in the chair, my eyes scanning the dark expanse of forest through the binoculars. The radio buzzed with occasional chatter, mostly mundane updates from other rangers or weather reports. I had the manual open beside me, its list of rules a curious distraction. I chuckled to myself. Too quiet sometimes, Jim had said. Well, quiet was part of the job description, wasn't it? It was around midnight when the first oddity occurred. A soft glow appeared in the distance, like a campfire that had learned to float. It hovered over the trees, casting an eerie luminescence that seemed to pulse. I squinted, trying to make sense of it. Then I remembered rule four. Do not look at any glowing lights in the forest. I quickly averted my gaze, a chill running down my spine. What kind of place was this? I shook off the unease, attributing it to first night jitters. I reached for the radio, intending to check in, when a static-laden voice broke through. Ranger Tower 6, do you copy? The voice was distorted, almost robotic. I picked up the radio. This is Tower 6, go ahead. The voice crackled again, all clear, over. Something about the transmission didn't sit right with me. It was too emotionless. I glanced at the manual again, half expecting to find a rule about not trusting the radio. There wasn't one but Rule 3 did say not to answer the radio between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. I checked the clock. It was only midnight, but the rule suddenly seemed less arbitrary. I decided to step outside onto the platform for some fresh air, thinking it might clear my head. The wind had picked up, rustling the leaves and carrying with it the earthy scent of the forest. I leaned against the railing, looking out into the darkness. That's when I heard it, a low growl coming from the trees below. It was a guttural sound, filled with menace and intent. My hand instinctively went to the flare gun hanging by the door. Rule five, if you hear an animal in distress, do not go outside. Instead, fire a flare. But this didn't sound like an animal in distress. This sounded like a predator, one that knew exactly what it was doing. I stood there, my senses heightened, every nerve tingling with anticipation. The growl came again, closer this time, followed by the snap of twigs and the rustle of underbrush. Something was moving down there, something big. I backed into the cabin and locked the door, my eyes darting to the manual. I had scoffed at the rules earlier, dismissing them as the ramblings of superstitious minds. But now, alone in this tower, surrounded by an impenetrable darkness that seemed to close in with each passing minute, I felt a creeping realization. The rules were there for a reason, and as the clock ticked closer to the forbidden hour, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was about to find out why. The clock on the wall seemed to tick louder as the minutes crawled by, each second stretching into an eternity. I had returned to my seat, my eyes now darting between the binoculars and the manual. The radio sat silent, as if holding its breath along with me. I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest was watching, waiting for me to make a mistake. It was then that I heard it, a high-pitched wail echoing through the trees like a siren's call. The sound was gut-wrenching, filled with agony and despair. My first instinct was to grab my flashlight and head out, but then I remembered Rule 5. If you hear an animal in distress, do not go outside. Instead, fire a flare. I hesitated, my hand hovering over the door handle. The wail came again, more desperate this time as if pleading for help. My heart pounded in my chest, every fiber of my being screaming to go out there and do something. But the rules, those damn rules, they were etched into my mind now, each one a warning, a boundary not to be crossed. With a sense of resignation, I reached for the flare gun. I loaded it, stepped onto the platform, and aimed it skyward. As I pulled the trigger, the flare shot up into the night, its red light painting the sky like a brushstroke of fire. For a moment, 
The forest was bathed in a crimson glow, and I held my breath, waiting for whatever would come next. What happened then was beyond explanation. Another light appeared in the sky, mimicking the flare's trajectory. It hovered for a moment before descending into the forest, its glow extinguishing as suddenly as it had appeared. I stood there stunned, my mind struggling to process what I had just witnessed. It was as if the forest had responded, had mimicked my action in a grotesque display of mockery. I retreated into the cabin, my hands trembling as I locked the door behind me. I sank into the chair, my eyes fixed on the manual. Rule 5 had saved me from stepping outside. But what had I just invited in? What kind of place was capable of such unnatural phenomena? I picked up the radio, my fingers hovering over the dial. I wanted to call for help, to hear another human voice, to be told that everything was going to be all right. But then I remembered Rule 3. Do not answer the radio between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. I glanced at the clock. It was 1.45 a.m. The forbidden hour was approaching and I was running out of time. As I sat there, contemplating my next move, I realized that the rules were more than just guidelines. They were lifelines, each one a key to survival in a place that defied logic and reason. And as the clock ticked closer to 2 a.m., I couldn't help but wonder what other horrors awaited me, what other rules I would be forced to follow. But for now, all I could do was wait, my eyes fixed on the clock, my mind racing with thoughts and fears. And so I braced myself for the hour that was to come, the hour that the manual had ominously referred to as your time to be vigilant. And God help me, I was. The clock struck 2 a.m., its chimes echoing in the small cabin like a funeral dirge. I reached for the light switch and hesitated, my fingers trembling. Rule 2. Turn off all lights between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. I took a deep breath and flicked the switch, plunging the room into darkness. My eyes strained to adjust, but it was a darkness so complete, it felt like being swallowed by a black hole. I sat there, my back against the wall, my senses heightened to a razor's edge. The radio sat silent on the table, its mute form a grim reminder of Rule 3. Do not answer the radio during this hour. I glanced at the manual, its pages now invisible in the dark, but its rules etched into my memory like commandments on stone tablets. The wind howled outside, its mournful cries weaving through the trees like the wails of lost souls. I strained my ears, listening for any sound that might break the oppressive silence. And then I heard it. Footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps crunching on the gravel below the tower. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat a drum roll of dread. I thought of reaching for the flare gun, but what good would it do in this darkness? And who, or what, was I up against? My mind raced through the possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. Was it a person, defying the rules for some nefarious purpose? Or was it something else, something that called this dark forest its home? The footsteps grew louder, ascending the metal stairs with a rhythmic clang that sent shivers down my spine. I held my breath, my eyes darting to the door, half expecting it to burst open at any moment. But it didn't. The footsteps reached the top of the stairs and then... Silence. A silence so complete it felt like the world had stopped breathing. Minutes ticked by, each one an eternity of anticipation and fear. I dared not move, dared not make a sound, as if my very breath could shatter this fragile moment. And then, as suddenly as it had started, the silence was broken. A scratching sound, like nails on a chalkboard, reverberated through the room. It was coming from the door, from just outside the door. I clenched my fists, my nails digging into my palms, my body taut like a bowstring. The scratching continued, each stroke a violation, an intrusion into this sanctuary I had thought impregnable. And then, just as suddenly, it stopped. The room fell silent again, the tension lifting like a fog, leaving in its wake a sense of relief so profound. It felt like a physical weight being lifted off my shoulders. I glanced at the clock. It was 3 a.m. The forbidden hour had passed. With a sense of disbelief, I reached for the light switch and flicked it on. The room was bathed in light, its familiar contours a stark contrast to the darkness that had enveloped it just moments ago. I was alone, but the sense of isolation had been replaced by something else, a realization that I was not alone in this forest that I was a guest in a world governed by rules I could neither understand nor ignore. 
and as I sat there, my eyes fixed on the manual, I couldn't help but wonder what the next rule would bring, what the next hour would hold. But for now, all I could do was wait, and listen, and hope that whatever had visited me during that forbidden hour would not return. But deep down, I knew it was only a matter of time. The clock read 3.15 a.m., and the cabin was once again a sanctuary of light and normalcy, or as normal as it could be, given the night's events. I had just begun to entertain the notion that the worst was behind me when the radio crackled to life. Ranger Tower 6, do you copy? The voice was clear, human, and filled with a sense of urgency that sent a jolt through my spine. I picked up the radio, my hand still trembling from the adrenaline of the past hour. This is Tower 6, go ahead. Thank God, the voice exhaled. I'm Ranger Mike Thompson. I've been trying to reach you. I need to come up. Can you unlock the door? My fingers hovered over the lock, ready to comply, when a flicker of doubt crossed my mind. Rule 6. If someone claims to be a ranger and asks to be let in, ask for their full name and badge number. Can you confirm your badge number, Mike? I asked, my voice tinged with caution. There was a pause, a momentary lapse that filled the airwaves with static and uncertainty. Badge number 4,579, he finally replied. I was about to unlock the door when another transmission broke through, this one weak and filled with static. Don't. Let. In. The voice sputtered, barely audible over the crackling airwaves. My heart sank. The voice was distorted, but the message was clear. I pulled my hand away from the lock, my body frozen in a state of indecision. Who is this? I demanded, my voice rising in pitch. No answer came, but what followed was worse. A gut-wrenching scream that tore through the radio, filling the cabin with its echo of pure terror. Then, silence. I sat there, the radio now a heavy weight in my hands, my mind racing with questions and fears. Had I just heard a man die? And what had he been trying to warn me about? I backed away from the door, my eyes fixed on its sturdy frame as if expecting it to betray me. I thought of the scratching sounds from earlier the footsteps on the stairs, the rules that had become my lifelines in this night of unimaginable horror. And I realized, with a sense of dread, that the rules had not been written to protect me from the forest. They had been written to protect me from what lived within it. I sank to the floor, my body trembling, my mind a whirlpool of thoughts and emotions. I had been so close to letting whatever it was into this sanctuary so close to breaking the one rule that might have cost me my life. As I sat there, my eyes fixed on the clock, I knew that the night was far from over, that the rules would be tested again, that my sanity and courage would be pushed to their very limits. But for now, all I could do was wait, my eyes darting between the door and the radio, my ears straining for any sound that might pierce the silence. And so, I waited, my body curled into a ball on the floor, my mind a fortress preparing for the next siege. And God help me, it came. The first rays of dawn filtered through the windows, casting long shadows across the cabin. I had survived the night, but at what cost? My body felt like a wrung-out rag, my mind a labyrinth of questions with no answers. I glanced at the clock, 6.30 a.m. The night was over, but its echoes still reverberated through my soul. I heard the distant rumble of engines, and looked out to see a convoy of vehicles approaching. Emergency medical technicians, park rangers, and what looked like a couple of unmarked SUVs. They pulled up to the base of the tower, and people began to spill out. Their movements hurried, their faces etched with concern and curiosity. I unlocked the door and began my descent, each step a reminder of the night's terrors. As I reached the ground, a pair of EMTs rushed over, their eyes scanning me for injuries. Are you okay? One of them asked, her voice tinged with professional concern. I'm not sure, I replied, my voice barely above a whisper. They led me to an ambulance where they checked my vitals and shone a light into my eyes. You're in shock, the EMT said, but otherwise you seem okay. Okay, I thought. I'm far from okay. A park ranger approached, his face stern, his eyes searching. We're going to need a statement, he said. I looked at him, my mind wrestling with the decision. Could I tell them what had happened? Would they even believe me? And what about the rules, the manual that had become my Bible in that godforsaken tower? I can't explain, I finally said. 
my voice tinged with defeat. The ranger stared at me for a long moment, then nodded. All right, you're free to go, but we'll need to talk eventually. I nodded and walked away, my eyes catching sight of a group of rangers examining the base of the tower. They were collecting something, shell casings, spots of blood, evidence of a night that defied explanation. I climbed into my truck and started the engine, my hands gripping the wheel as if it were a lifeline. As I drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the tower receding in the distance, its skeletal frame now a monument to a night I would never forget. And then I saw it, a deer standing at the edge of the clearing, its eyes meeting mine in a moment of shared recognition. As I passed, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. The deer had a shred of a ranger's patch impaled on one of its antlers, and its nose and mouth were stained with what looked like blood. I pressed the accelerator and didn't look back, my eyes fixed on the road ahead, my mind a whirlpool of thoughts and fears. I had survived the night, but the questions remained, each one a haunting reminder of a world that existed beyond the boundaries of reason and logic. And as I drove away, leaving behind a tower of secrets and a forest of nightmares, I knew that some questions were better left unanswered, some rules better left unbroken, and some places better left unvisited. The city lights appeared on the horizon like a distant galaxy, a stark contrast to the inky darkness of the forest I had left behind. My truck ate up the miles, but my mind was still trapped in that tower, in that night of unimaginable horror. I had made it out, but the scars were etched deep, not just on my soul, but on the very fabric of my understanding of the world. I had already made up my mind. I was quitting the ranger service. The city offered anonymity, a refuge of concrete and steel where the rules of nature didn't include cryptic manuals and unspoken horrors. I could find a job, maybe go back to school. Anything to escape the memories, the questions, the rules. As I pulled into my driveway, the weight of the past hours seemed to lift slightly. Home, safety, normalcy. I killed the engine and sat there for a moment, gathering the strength to step out, to cross the threshold into my old life. That's when I saw it, the manual lying on the passenger seat, its pages now dog-eared and stained with the sweat and fear of the night. Rule six flashed through my mind. If someone claims to be a ranger and asks to be let in, ask for their full name and badge number. I grabbed the manual and stepped out of the truck, my eyes scanning the quiet suburban street, half expecting to see a figure lurking in the shadows, but there was nothing. I was alone. I unlocked the front door and stepped inside, the familiarity of my home wrapping around me like a warm blanket. I tossed the manual onto the kitchen table and headed for the shower, desperate to wash away the grime and fear of the past hours. As the hot water cascaded over me, I felt my muscles relax, the tension draining away like water down the drain. And for a moment, just a moment, I allowed myself to believe that it was over, that I had escaped. That's when I heard it a knock on the door. Three slow, deliberate knocks that cut through the sound of the shower like a knife through flesh. My heart stopped, my blood turning to ice in my veins. I turned off the shower and stepped out, my eyes darting to the bathroom window. It was dark outside, the world shrouded in a cloak of night that seemed to stretch into eternity. I wrapped a towel around me and crept to the kitchen, my eyes falling on the manual its presence now a mocking reminder of the world I had left behind, but that had not left me. Another knock, louder this time, more insistent. I approached the door, my body trembling, my mind screaming at me to run, to hide, to escape. But there was no escape, not from this. I looked through the peephole and saw a figure standing outside, its features obscured by the darkness. And then it spoke its voice a chilling whisper that seeped through the door like a malevolent mist. Ranger, let me in. It's safe now. My hand hovered over the lock, my breath caught in my throat, my soul teetering on the edge of an abyss from which there was no return. And then I remembered the final unwritten rule, the one that now filled me with a terror beyond words, beyond comprehension. Some rules are meant to be broken, but some doors are meant to stay closed. Forever. I've been a park ranger at Yosemite for a good chunk of my life, 
Most folks think it's all about chasing down poachers or rescuing lost hikers. Don't get me wrong, that happens. But most days it's more like being a tour guide with a badge. You answer questions, give directions, and sometimes play referee between nature and those who think they can conquer it with a selfie stick. The park is a place of contrasts. One minute you're marveling at the grandeur of El Capitan, and the next, you're dealing with some city slicker who thinks it's a good idea to feed a bear. Yeah, a bear. As if those claws and teeth were just for show. But it's not all headaches and face palms. There are moments that make you laugh so hard you forget you're wearing a uniform. Like the time I stumbled upon a group of grown adults dressed as forest animals, frolicking around like they were auditioning for a Disney movie. They scattered the moment they saw me, their fake tails bobbing through the underbrush. I couldn't decide whether to write a report or a comedy sketch. Then there are the moments that stick with you, the ones that don't make it into the brochures. I remember a night under a sky so clear it felt like you could reach out and pluck the stars. I was sharing that silence with a family who had never seen the Milky Way before. The awe in their eyes, that's the stuff that keeps you going. But let's get one thing straight. Yosemite is not just another patch of earth. It's a living, breathing entity. It has its moods, its secrets. And sometimes, just sometimes, it swallows people whole. You hear stories, whispers really, about hikers who go missing without a trace. Most times they turn up, a little embarrassed, but none the worse for wear. Other times, well, let's just say not every story has a happy ending. That's why when the call came in about a missing hiker on the Cathedral Lake Trail, I figured it was business as usual. A guy named Greg was on the line, all frantic, saying his brother Dave had vanished into thin air. Now I've heard that phrase a lot, but the tremor in Greg's voice told me this was different. He mentioned something about other mysterious disappearances as if Yosemite had suddenly turned into the Bermuda Triangle of National Parks. I sighed, put on my hat, and grabbed my gear. This was no time for skepticism. If someone was lost, it was my job to find them, no matter what lurked in the hidden corners of this majestic but unforgiving landscape. As I headed out, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was more than just another rescue mission. Yosemite was stirring, and I was about to step into one of its untold stories. Little did I know, this one would be unlike any other. The Cathedral Lake Trail is one of those places that can make you forget you're in the 21st century. No cell service, no Wi-Fi, just you in the wilderness. It's a place that demands respect, and most people give it. But every now and then, someone thinks they can outsmart nature. That's usually when I get a call. I pulled up to the trailhead in my Ranger SUV, dust billowing behind me like a bad omen. Greg was pacing near the signboard, his face flushed and eyes wide. He looked like he'd seen a ghost, or worse. Greg, I called out as I stepped out of the vehicle. He turned, relief washing over his face. Oh, thank God you're here. It's Dave, my brother. He's gone, just vanished. I motioned for him to calm down. Start from the beginning, what happened? We were hiking, just like we've done a hundred times. I stopped to tie my shoe and when I looked up, he was gone. Just gone, man. I eyed him skeptically. People get lost here all the time. He probably wandered off the trail. He'll turn up. Greg shook his head vehemently. No, you don't understand. I've heard stories, man. People go missing in places like this and they never come back. What if that's what happened to Dave? I sighed. Yosemite had its share of myths and legends. But this was no time for campfire stories. Look, I understand you're worried, but let's stick to the facts. Did he have any reason to wander off? Was he acting strange? No, nothing like that. We were having a good time, and then he was just... gone. Something about the way Greg said gone sent a chill down my spine. This wasn't just another lost hiker. I could feel it. All right, let's go find your brother, I said, grabbing my pack from the SUV. We set off down the trail, Greg leading the way. The forest was eerily quiet, as if holding its breath. We called out for Dave, our voices echoing through the trees. But there was no response. After about a mile, Greg stopped abruptly. This is where it happened, right here. I looked around. It was a nondescript part of the trail, no different from the miles we'd just covered. But then I noticed it, a narrow opening between the trees, like a doorway to another world. Did you check there? I pointed to the opening. Greg's face paled. No, I didn't even see it. Do you think he went in there? There was only one way to find out. 
I took a deep breath and stepped toward the opening. As I did, a shiver ran through me, as if I'd just crossed an invisible line. Stay close, I warned Greg. We don't know what's in there. But as I stepped into the darkness, I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever was in there already knew all about us. And it was waiting. The forest has a way of swallowing sound, making each step feel like a solitary journey even when you're not alone. Greg followed close behind me, his breaths shallow and quick, like a hunted animal. I couldn't blame him. The atmosphere had changed. The woods felt denser, the air thicker. It was as if we'd stepped into a different realm altogether. We moved cautiously, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, seemed amplified, as if the forest itself was whispering warnings we couldn't understand. And then, there it was, a dark maw in the side of a hill, like a wound in the earth, a cave. Greg's flashlight flickered as he pointed it toward the entrance. Do you think he's in there? I studied the cave. It looked natural, but something about it felt off. Only one way to find out, I said, my voice betraying a hint of reluctance. Greg didn't wait for a second invitation. He rushed toward the cave, his flashlight beam dancing erratically on the walls. Dave, are you in here? I hesitated at the entrance, my instincts screaming at me to turn back. But this was my job, my responsibility. I took a deep breath and stepped inside. The cave was colder than I'd expected, the air damp and heavy. Our flashlights revealed a narrow tunnel that seemed to stretch on forever, its walls slick with moisture. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were descending into the belly of some ancient beast. We hadn't gone far when Greg stopped abruptly, his light focused on something on the ground. What's this? I moved closer and saw what had caught his attention, a shoe, caked in mud and worn from use. It looked like it had been there for a while. Is it Dave's? I asked. Greg shook his head, his face pale. No, but it could belong to someone else who went missing. What if this cave is where they all end up? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. Let's not jump to conclusions. We need to keep moving. But as we ventured deeper, the cave seemed to close in around us. The walls narrowed and the ceiling dropped. I felt a growing sense of unease, as if we were trespassing in a place we had no right to be. Finally, I stopped. We should go back and get more help. This could be dangerous. Greg looked at me, his eyes filled with a mix of desperation and fear. But what about Dave? What if he's in here? I understand, but we're not equipped for this. We need to be smart. Reluctantly, Greg nodded. All right, let's go. As we turned to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The cave seemed to sigh, as if disappointed. But I knew better than to let my imagination run wild. We made our way back to the entrance, the weight of the cave lifting as we stepped into the open air. But as we did, I knew that this was far from over. The cave had revealed a glimpse of its secrets, and I had a sinking feeling that it wasn't done with us yet, not by a long shot. We emerged from the cave like men reborn, the sunlight hitting our faces like a slap of reality. I radioed for backup, my voice tinged with an urgency I couldn't fully explain. Greg sat on a fallen log, his face etched with a mix of relief and dread. He knew as well as I did that we were far from solving this mystery. Within the hour, a search party arrived, armed with ropes, flashlights, and a sense of purpose. I briefed them quickly, pointing to the cave that had swallowed more than just our courage. We go in, we search, we come out, no heroics. But when I turned to lead them to the cave, my heart sank. The cave was gone. In its place, a smooth hillside, as if the earth had healed its own wound. I blinked, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me. But no, it was gone, vanished. The team looked at me, their faces a mix of confusion and disbelief. Where's the cave, ranger? I had no answer. I felt like a fool, a man chasing his own tail. It was right here, I stammered, my voice tinged with doubt. Greg stood up, his eyes wide. I told you, man, this place is cursed. It swallows people, and now it swallowed the cave. The team exchanged glances, their expressions saying what they didn't dare speak. Had the stress gotten to me? Was I seeing things? We'll spread out and search the area, I ordered, trying to regain some semblance of control. Maybe there's another entrance. We combed the woods for hours, our flashlights piercing the gathering dusk. We found nothing. No cave, no sign of Dave, no answers. As darkness fell, I made the call to head back. 
We were chasing shadows. Back at the station, I filed my report, each word a struggle. How do you document the indescribable? How do you explain the unexplainable? I considered leaving out the cave, but that would be a lie. And I was many things, but not a liar. As I handed in the report, my superior looked at me, his eyes searching for something. Sanity, perhaps. You sure about all this? I nodded, my pride swallowed by the enormity of what we'd experienced. Yes, sir. I don't expect you to believe it, but it's the truth. He sighed, setting the report aside. Get some rest. We'll pick this up in the morning. But as I drove home, the weight of the day pressing down on me, I knew there would be no rest. Not for me, not for Greg, and certainly not for whoever, or whatever, was lurking in the hidden corners of Yosemite. The cave had vanished, but the mystery had deepened, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we were all pawns in a game we couldn't begin to understand. A game that was far from over. A year had passed since the cave incident, but not a day went by that I didn't think about it. The questions, the doubts, they gnawed at me like a persistent itch I couldn't reach. I needed answers, even if it meant going against protocol, even if it meant facing whatever had driven me and Greg out of that cave. So I found myself back at the Cathedral Lake Trail, off-duty and heavily armed. I had a GPS, a satellite phone, and enough gear to make a prepper jealous. If the cave was there, I was going to find it. And this time, I was going in prepared. The forest greeted me like an old friend, its towering trees and rustling leaves a familiar comfort. But as I reached the spot where the cave had been, my heart sank. It was just as it had been a year ago, a smooth hillside, no sign of any opening. I was about to turn back, chalk it up to a figment of my stressed imagination, when I felt it. A subtle shift in the air, like the static before a storm. I looked again and there it was, the cave, its dark entrance like an open wound in the earth. I took a deep breath, steadying my shaking hands. This was it. I stepped inside. The cave was as I remembered it, cold, dark, and unwelcoming. But this time, I was ready. I moved cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the darkness, my other hand gripping the pistol at my side. I hadn't gone far when I saw it, the creature. It was more horrifying than I remembered, a grotesque blend of plant and animal, its tentacles writhing like snakes. And it was consuming a human face, one that looked disturbingly familiar. My heart pounded in my chest, but I held my ground. I had come for answers, and I was going to get them. As I moved deeper, I discovered the cave's other inhabitants, people, or what was left of them. They were alive but incomplete, missing arms, legs, faces, and among them, I saw him, Greg. His eyes met mine and for a moment I saw a flicker of recognition, but then it vanished, replaced by the vacant stare of someone who was no longer fully human. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, but I fought it back. This was bigger than me, bigger than Greg, bigger than all of us. This creature, this cave, it was an abomination, and it had to be stopped. As I turned to leave, the creature let out a guttural growl, and I felt a wave of dizziness wash over me. It was trying to hypnotize me, to add me to its collection, but I was ready. I shook off the feeling, my resolve hardened by the horrors I had witnessed. I made it to the entrance, the creature's growls echoing behind me. As I stepped into the sunlight, I knew what I had to do. This cave, this creature, they couldn't be allowed to exist. I was going to seal them off, once and for all. I didn't waste any time. I drove straight to the hardware store, my mind racing faster than the engine. I bought fast-drying cement, a mixing tub, a trowel, and a few other supplies. The cashier gave me a curious look, probably wondering what kind of home improvement project required such urgency, if only he knew. As night fell, I returned to the Cathedral Lake Trail. The forest was a different beast in the dark, its familiar landmarks transformed into looming shadows. But I had no time for fear. I had a job to do. I reached the cave, its entrance like a dark scar on the earth. I mixed the cement, my hands steady despite the gravity of what I was about to do. This was it, the point of no return. I started sealing the entrance, each scoop of cement a step closer to trapping the creature inside. I worked quickly, my body running on adrenaline and sheer will. I couldn't afford to make a mistake, I had to get this right. As I laid the final layer, I heard it, a guttural, inhuman shriek from deep within the cave. It was a sound of pure rage, of primal fury. 
It echoed through the forest, sending a shiver down my spine. The creature knew what I was doing, and it was not pleased. But then, something unexpected happened. The shriek turned into a chorus, a cacophony of voices joining in. It was as if all the souls trapped inside had realized their predicament, and were crying out in despair. Among those voices I thought I heard one that sounded familiar. Greg. My heart sank. I had warned him not to enter the cave, but he hadn't listened. And now, he was part of this nightmare. I'm sorry, Greg, I muttered, my voice barely a whisper. I'm so sorry. I laid the final scoop of cement, sealing the cave and its horrors inside. As I stepped back, I felt a wave of exhaustion wash over me. I had done it. The creature was trapped, its reign of terror over. But as I made my way back to the car, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. The creature was trapped, yes, but it was still alive, and as long as it lived, the threat remained. I drove home in silence, my thoughts a jumble of relief and regret. I had done my duty, done what had to be done, but at what cost? As I lay in bed that night, the events of the past year replaying in my mind, one thought kept nagging at me. Had I really solved anything, or had I merely contained it? The creature was trapped, but it was still out there lurking in the hidden corners of Yosemite, a dark secret in a place filled with natural wonders. And as I drifted off to sleep, one question haunted me. What happens when a creature with an insatiable hunger runs out of food? I didn't have an answer, and that terrified me more than anything. Days turned into weeks, and the weight of what I'd done settled in like a permanent fog. I kept up with my duties, patrolled the trails and assisted hikers, but a part of me was always back at that sealed cave. I'd done my job, protected the public from an unimaginable horror, but the cost was a burden I'd carry for the rest of my life. I avoided the Cathedral Lake Trail, made excuses to stay away, but fate has a way of pulling you back to the places you'd rather forget. A group of hikers had reported strange noises, unsettling cries that didn't belong to any animal they knew. My superior insisted I investigate. You know that area better than anyone, he said, unaware of how true that was. I arrived at the spot in the late afternoon, the sun casting long shadows through the trees. I approached the sealed cave cautiously, half expecting to find it just as I'd left it. But what I saw made my blood run cold. The cement seal was cracked, chunks of it scattered around like the aftermath of an explosion. The cave was open. A wave of dread washed over me. Had it escaped? Was it out there? Hunting? Feeding? I considered calling for backup, but what would I say? That a mythical creature had broken free? They'd think I'd lost my mind. Summoning every ounce of courage, I stepped into the cave. The air was thick, suffocating, but there was something else. A smell, sweet and rotten at the same time. I flashed my light around, my hand trembling. And then I saw them. Bodies, or what was left of them, strewn around like discarded dolls. They were drained, hollow, as if every ounce of life had been sucked out of them. Among them, I saw the creature, or rather its remains. It was shriveled, lifeless, its tentacles limp, and its eyes dull. As I stood there trying to make sense of the scene, I heard it, a soft, almost inaudible whisper. I turned around, my flashlight beam landing on a figure standing at the entrance of the cave. It was Greg, or something that looked like him. His eyes were black, soulless, and his mouth was twisted into a grotesque smile. Before I could react, he spoke, his voice a chilling monotone. You thought you could trap it, contain it, but you don't understand. It's not just a creature, it's an idea, a hunger that can't be contained, and now, it's a part of me. Before I could move, he lunged at me impossibly fast. The last thing I felt was an excruciating pain as darkness enveloped me. My final thought was a realization, a terrifying truth I'd failed to see. The creature was never the real horror. The real horror was what it awakened in us, what it unleashed. And that horror was now free, unbound by cave walls or cement barriers. As my consciousness faded, I understood one terrifying fact. The hunger had found a new host, and it was insatiable. I was 24, restless, and carrying the weight of a life that had already seen too many wrong turns. The city was a maze I couldn't navigate anymore, a labyrinth of mistakes and missed opportunities. 
So, when I saw the job posting for a park ranger position in a state park, it felt like a lifeline thrown my way. I grabbed it without a second thought. The park was a sprawling expanse of wilderness, a place where nature still held dominion, towering pines, endless trails, and the kind of quiet you can't find just anywhere. It was the kind of place where you could lose yourself, and maybe, just maybe, find something too. My duties were straightforward. Maintain the trails, assist visitors, and most importantly, keep an eye out for fires. The park had a history, you see. Old timers would talk about the great fire of 76 like it was yesterday, a cautionary tale whispered around campfires. But it was the North End Watchtower that caught my attention from day one. They called it the Sentinel, a 100-foot tall structure made of old pine. It stood there like a guardian, overlooking the park, a small cabin perched on stilts. It was as if it had sprouted from the earth itself, a part of the landscape yet apart from it. The first time I climbed those wooden stairs, each step creaking under my boots, I felt a strange mix of awe and unease. The tower was equipped with the bare essentials, a wooden chair, a table, and a single light bulb that dangled from the ceiling, swaying gently as if moved by some invisible hand. From up there, the world looked different, smaller, yet infinitely expansive. I could see the winding trails, the darkening forest, and the distant hills rolling away like waves in a frozen sea. But what I couldn't see was what lay hidden in those shadows, the secrets that the trees whispered when they thought no one was listening. The park was considered safe, a haven for families and nature enthusiasts alike. But every paradise has its serpents. We were not far from a correctional facility, and the park had its share of unwelcome visitors, criminals, squatters, and others who sought the anonymity that only a vast wilderness could provide. As I sat there in that tower, the setting sun casting long shadows that seemed to reach for me, I felt a shiver run down my spine. It wasn't just the chill of the evening air, it was the realization that I was a small, fragile piece in a much larger, unfathomable puzzle. I shook off the feeling, reminding myself that I was there to do a job. I was the eyes and ears of this place, its first line of defense. And so I settled into my chair, my gaze scanning the horizon, my hand resting on the walkie-talkie that connected me to the outside world. But as the darkness deepened, enveloping the tower and everything it stood watch over, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me too. And whatever it was, it wasn't just passing through. It had been there long before me, and it had stories to tell. Stories that I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. And so began my first night at the Sentinel, a watchtower that had seen more than its share of fires, but none like the one that was about to ignite inside me. The ranger station was a modest building, a rustic cabin that served as the nerve center of the park. It was where we clocked in, got our assignments, and occasionally heard stories that made us question the wisdom of wandering too far off the beaten path. That evening, as I was going through the logbook, noting the day's activities and incidents, the door swung open. A woman walked in, her face flushed, eyes wide with a mix of fear and disbelief. She was in her early thirties, dressed like someone who had come to enjoy a simple hike, but had found something else entirely. Can I help you, ma'am? I asked, setting aside the logbook. I, I think someone's following me, she stammered, her voice tinged with panic. Sit down, please. Take a deep breath and tell me what happened, I said, motioning to the chair across from my desk. She sat, her hands trembling as she recounted her experience. She had been walking on the Cedar Ridge Trail, a popular route that offered stunning views of the valley. But today, she said, the beauty of the landscape was marred by something unsettling. She had heard strange noises, whistles that mimicked the calls of a wood thrush, but were too mechanical, too deliberate to be natural. And then I saw it, she continued, her voice dropping to a whisper, a shadowy figure, just beyond the trees, it was watching me. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. This was not the first time we had reports of suspicious activities, but something about her story struck a chord. Maybe it was the way she described the whistles, or perhaps it was the genuine fear in her eyes. We'll look into it right away, I assured her, picking up the walkie-talkie to alert the other rangers. The search yielded nothing. We combed the area, flashlights piercing through the gathering dusk, but found no signs of anyone lurking in the woods. 
The woman left, grateful but not entirely convinced. And who could blame her? The forest has a way of holding on to its secrets, of swallowing up traces of any transgressions. As I prepared to head out for my night shift at the Sentinel, my thoughts kept drifting back to the woman's story. I tried to shake it off, to chalk it up to an overactive imagination, or perhaps an animal that had strayed too close to the trail. But deep down, I knew better. The park was a sanctuary for many, but it was also a hiding place, a vast expanse where one could easily become predator or prey. I grabbed my gear and made my way to the tower, the woman's words echoing in my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that her story was a harbinger of things to come, a warning sign that I couldn't afford to ignore. As I reached the base of the sentinel, I noticed something that made me stop in my tracks, a new carving on the wooden frame, a pair of eyes staring back at me. It was as if the tower itself was watching, waiting to see what I would do next. And in that moment, I realized that the night ahead would be a long one, filled with uncertainties and shadows that couldn't simply be explained away. I climbed the wooden stairs of the sentinel, each step creaking under the weight of both my boots and the apprehension that had settled in my gut. The tower loomed above me, its timbers aged by years of weather and watchfulness. It was a relic, a sentinel in the truest sense, standing guard over a wilderness that was as beautiful as it was unforgiving. Reaching the top, I unlocked the cabin door and stepped inside. The room was sparse, functional, a space designed for vigilance rather than comfort. A wooden chair, a table cluttered with maps and a radio, and that single dim light bulb hanging from the ceiling, its glow more a suggestion than an illumination. I set my gear down and took a seat, my eyes instinctively scanning the horizon through the cabin's windows. The sun had dipped below the tree line, casting the world in hues of twilight. It was that in-between time, when day gives way to night, and anything seems possible. I picked up the walkie-talkie and checked in with the station. All clear at the Sentinel, I reported, my voice steady despite the unease that tingled at the base of my skull. Copy that, came the reply, a static-laced acknowledgement that did little to dispel the growing tension in the air. I leaned back in my chair, allowing myself a moment to breathe. That's when I saw it, a new set of carved eyes on the railing of the tower's stairs. They were crude but deliberate etched into the wood as if to say, I see you. My heart skipped a beat. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped outside, shining its beam on the railing. There they were, those twin circles staring back at me, accompanied by something new, a piece of reflective material, torn and tattered, wedged into a crack in the wood. I felt a shiver crawl up my spine. This was no random act, no idle defacement. It was a message, a silent communication from someone, or something, that knew more than it should. I returned to the cabin, my mind racing. Could it be related to the woman's report? Or was it something else? Something born from the hidden corners of this vast, untamed land? I couldn't say, but the weight of the unknown settled over me like a shroud. I sat back down, my eyes now darting between the windows and the radio, the outside world, and my only link to human contact. I considered calling it in, reporting the new carving and the reflective scrap, but hesitated. What would I say? That I was spooked by a piece of cloth and some etchings in the wood. As I grappled with the decision, a sound broke the silence, a dragging noise, like something being pulled across the wooden floor above me. My blood ran cold. There was no floor above me, just the roof and the open sky. I gripped the arms of my chair my knuckles white with tension. Whatever was happening, whatever was unfolding in the shadows of this ancient watchtower, it was clear that I was no longer the sole watcher in this wilderness. And as the night stretched on, I couldn't shake the feeling that those carved eyes were not just markings on a railing. They were a pair of lenses, and behind them lay a gaze that saw right through me. The night was settling in, a thick blanket of darkness that seemed to absorb sound as much as light. I sat there, my eyes straining to make out shapes in the gloom, my ears tuned to the subtlest of noises. The radio sat silent on the table, a mute witness to the tension that filled the cabin. Then it came, a creaking sound, low but distinct, rising from the wooden bones of the tower. It was the kind of noise you'd expect from an old structure, but this was different. 
It was as if the tower itself was shifting, adjusting its stance in preparation for something. I grabbed the walkie-talkie. Did anyone else hear that? I asked, my voice tinged with a nervousness I couldn't quite conceal. A moment of static, then a reply. Probably just the wind or the tower settling. These old structures make noise. I wanted to believe it to accept the simple explanation and return to my watch. But as I sat there, another sound reached my ears, a scraping noise, like wood being dragged across wood, coming from the stairs leading up to the cabin. My pulse quickened. I rose from my chair and cautiously stepped outside, flashlight in hand. I swept the beam down the stairwell, half expecting to catch a glimpse of something, someone lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing, just the empty stairs descending into darkness. I was about to turn back when my flashlight caught something on the railing, a fresh set of carved eyes, their gaze meeting mine as if challenging me to look away, and beside it, another piece of reflective material, this one larger, as if torn from a piece of clothing. My mind raced. This was no coincidence, no trick of the light or the wind. Someone was out there, watching me, marking their presence in the most unsettling way. I retreated to the cabin, my back against the door as if that could offer some measure of protection. I considered my options. I could call for backup, but what would I report? Sounds, carvings, torn fabric? It was hardly enough to warrant an emergency response, yet every instinct screamed that this was anything but normal. I sat back down, my eyes now darting between the windows, each pane a potential entry point, each shadow a hiding place. I felt trapped, caught in a web that was tightening with every passing minute. I picked up the radio one more time. If anyone's near the Sentinel, maybe swing by, just to check things out, I said, my words a mix of request and plea. Will do, came the reply, but the words offered little comfort. As I set the radio down, another creak echoed through the tower, this one louder, closer, as if whatever was out there had taken another step toward me. I gripped the arms of my chair, my senses on high alert, my body a coiled spring ready to snap. And in that moment I knew, with a certainty that chilled me to my core, that I was not alone. The tower, the sentinel, was living up to its name, but the question remained. Was it guarding me, or was it guarding something from me? The night was a tapestry of shadows, each one darker than the last, each one a potential hiding spot. My eyes were drawn to the windows, to the world beyond the glass that seemed both near and infinitely distant. I was a sentinel in a tower that had become a cage, and the bars were closing in. Then I heard it, a soft, deliberate footfall on the stairs below, followed by another, and another. Someone was climbing the tower, their movements slow and calculated, as if savoring the ascent. At the same time, another sound reached my ears, a rustling from above, like fabric scraping against wood. My blood ran cold. I was trapped, sandwiched between two unknown entities, one ascending, one descending, both converging on my position. Adrenaline surged through my veins, drowning out reason, amplifying instinct. I had to act, and fast. I grabbed my boots and flung them onto a lower landing, their thud echoing through the wooden structure. Almost immediately, the footsteps below quickened, rushing downward to investigate the noise. Seizing the moment, I stepped out onto the landing, my heart pounding in my chest. With a quick glance up and down the stairwell to confirm I was alone, I climbed over the handrail and hung off the side of the tower, my fingers gripping the wood, my feet searching for purchase on the narrow ledge below. It was a desperate move, a gamble that left me exposed to the elements in the sheer drop below. But it was also my only option, a Hail Mary in a game where the stakes were life and death. I hung there, my arms burning from the strain, my breath shallow and rapid. Time stretched, each second an eternity as I waited, listened, prayed. Then I heard it, the sound of footsteps returning, this time ascending the tower, but bypassing my position, the person or thing unaware of my precarious perch. I waited until the footsteps receded until I was reasonably sure I was alone, then pulled myself back onto the landing, my muscles screaming in protest. I didn't waste time. I sprinted up the stairs, taking them two at a time, my focus singular. Reach the cabin, secure the door, prepare for what comes next. I burst into the room and slammed the door shut, locking it and bracing it with the chair. I was back in my cage, but at least it was a cage with walls, a fortress however fragile. 
As I stood there, catching my breath, another sound filled the air. A low, guttural laugh coming from just outside the door. It was a sound devoid of humor, a sound that promised things dark and terrible. And as I braced for impact, for the inevitable clash that would determine my fate, I realized the trap had sprung. But the question remained, was I the predator or was I the prey? And in the darkness of that moment, as the walls of the sentinel seemed to close in around me, I couldn't tell which was more terrifying. The air was thick with tension, each second stretching into an eternity as I stood there, my back against the door, my body a makeshift barricade. The laughter outside had ceased, replaced by a silence that was somehow even more unnerving. Then it came, the sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, approaching the door. A moment later the handle jiggled, a soft, almost polite gesture that belied the menace behind it. I braced myself, my muscles taut, my mind racing through scenarios, each one darker than the last. The door shuddered as something, someone threw their weight against it. Wood creaked, metal groaned, and for a moment I felt the barrier give, felt the inevitability of what was to come. And then, as if summoned by the very gods of the wilderness, lightning struck. The world exploded in a flash of light and sound, a cataclysmic burst that shook the tower to its very foundations. I was thrown off my feet, my body airborne for a split second that felt like a lifetime, but as I hit the ground, I realized something miraculous. I was unharmed. In the chaos, I had instinctively moved to an insulated stool, a lone piece of rubber in a sea of wood and metal. It had saved me, shielded me from the electric fury that had engulfed the tower. I scrambled to my feet, my senses returning, my eyes adjusting to the darkness that had reclaimed the cabin. And as I looked out the window, I saw them, two figures, sprawled on the ground below, their bodies twisted in postures of finality. I grabbed the radio, my hands trembling as I keyed the mic. Emergency at the Sentinel, I gasped, my voice a hoarse whisper. Lightning strike, possible casualties, I need help. The response was immediate, a flurry of voices, of coordinates and protocols, a symphony of action that shattered the night's malevolence. And as I stood there listening to the cavalry mobilize, I felt something else, a sense of relief, of deliverance, as if the storm had been a judgment and I had been found worthy. It didn't take long for help to arrive, for the night to be pierced by the wail of sirens and the glare of headlights. I was escorted down the tower, my legs shaky, my soul lighter than it had been in hours. The two figures were indeed casualties, their lives extinguished in that fateful moment. And as I looked at them, as I saw the handcuffs that dangled from one's belt and the shiv that lay beside the other, I realized the depth of the peril I had been in. They were escaped convicts, men with nothing to lose, men who had seen in me an obstacle to be removed. As I sat in the ambulance, a blanket around my shoulders, a cup of hot coffee in my hands, I knew that this was my last night as a park ranger, my last night in a tower that had been both prison and sanctuary. And as I looked back at the sentinel, its timbers charred but standing, its presence as imposing as ever, I felt a strange sense of gratitude. For in that moment of chaos, of life and death, it had been more than a watchtower. It had been a witness. Days turned into weeks, and the events of that fateful night became the stuff of local legend. A tale told in hushed tones, a cautionary story that parents whispered to their children. The sentinel was repaired, its timbers replaced, its purpose renewed. But for me, there was no going back. I had handed in my badge, my uniform, my identity as a park ranger. The wilderness had shown me its face, both beautiful and terrible, and I couldn't unsee it. I took a piece of the charred wood from the tower before leaving, a memento not of what could have happened, but of what did. It sits on my mantle now, a silent reminder of the night when nature itself seemed to pass judgment. But as the days stretch into a semblance of normalcy, as the memories fade into the recesses of my mind, something else lingers, a question, a doubt, a shadow that refuses to be banished. It happened a week after the incident. I was at home, going through the motions of a life that had been irrevocably changed, when I received a package. No return address, no note, just a small box wrapped in plain brown paper. I opened it cautiously, half expecting to find something innocuous, 
something that would make me laugh at my own paranoia. But what I found inside made my blood run cold. A pair of carved wooden eyes, identical to the ones I had seen on the railing of the sentinel, accompanied by a piece of reflective material, torn and tattered just like the one I had found. I stood there, my hands trembling, my mind racing. Who had sent it? How had they found me? And what did it mean? As I grapple with these questions, as I lock my doors and check my windows and jump at every sound, another thought occurs to me, one far more terrifying than any I've had before. What if the storm wasn't a judgment but a reprieve, a temporary stay in a trial that is yet to conclude? What if the eyes that watched me, that watch me still, belong not to a human, but to the wilderness itself, a force ancient, relentless, and insatiable? And as I sit here writing these words, I hear it, a creaking sound, low but distinct, coming from outside my window. I want to believe it's the wind, or a stray animal, or my own imagination playing tricks on me. But as I look out into the darkness, as I see a shadow move where no shadow should be, I realize the truth. The watch is not over. It has only just begun. And the eyes that see me, that see into me, are not just watching. They are waiting. Ray, Russell, Xavier, Connie, and I were driving down a dark and desolate road on a rainy night. The raindrops were pounding against the roof of the car, creating an eerie symphony of sounds that seemed to echo throughout the vehicle. The headlights illuminated the road ahead, but the darkness beyond the beams seemed to go on forever. As we drove deeper into the night, I felt a creeping sense of unease begin to settle in. The rain was making it difficult to see the road clearly and the wind was howling through the trees, creating an unsettling atmosphere. Suddenly the car sputtered and came to a stop. We all looked at each other in disbelief, wondering what had happened. Russell tried to turn the engine over, but it wouldn't start. Looks like we're stuck here, Xavier said, an unusual note of worry in his voice. We all got out of the car, huddling together in the rain as we tried to figure out what to do next. As we stood there, we heard a strange sound in the distance a low, guttural growl that seemed to come from the darkness beyond the road. We all froze, looking at each other with growing unease. Ray spoke up first. What the hell was that? they asked. I don't know, I replied, my heart racing in my chest. But we need to get back in the car and lock the doors. We hurried back to the car and scrambled inside, locking the doors and rolling up the windows. But the growling continued, growing louder and more menacing with each passing moment. Suddenly, there was a loud thud on the roof of the car, and we all jumped in fear. I looked up, and through the rain, I could see a dark shape moving across the roof. What the hell is that? Russell shouted, his voice shaking with fear. Before anyone could answer, the shape on the roof lunged at the windshield, cracking it with a sickening sound. We all screamed and huddled together in the back seat as the creature continued to attack the car. We were trapped with no way to escape the horror that was unfolding around us. As the rain continued to fall and the creature continued to attack, I knew that this night would be one that would haunt me forever. Before we started driving down that dark and desolate road on that rainy night, Ray had suggested that we take a shortcut through the woods. They had heard about it from a friend and claimed it would cut our driving time in half. I was skeptical at first, but Russell and Xavier were all for it, so I reluctantly agreed. We turned off the main road and onto a narrow dirt path that wound through the trees. The rain was already starting to fall, but we pressed on, thinking we could make it through before it got too bad. That's when we started to hear the strange noises, rustling in the bushes, footsteps crunching on the wet ground. We tried to ignore it, chalking it up to our imaginations, but the noises grew louder and more persistent. Then suddenly, we saw it a figure looming in the darkness ahead of us. It was too dark to make out any features, but it was definitely humanoid and seemed to be watching us. We all froze, not knowing what to do. That's when the figure started moving towards us, slowly at first, then picking up speed. We turned and ran back towards the car, but it was too late. The figure had caught up to us and attacked. We fought back as best we could, but it was like fighting against a force of nature. The figure was too strong, too fast, and seemed to be immune to our blows. 
It wasn't until Ray managed to grab a large branch and strike the figure across the head that it finally retreated into the darkness. We all breathed a sigh of relief and piled back into the car, shaken but alive. We should have turned back then, but for some reason we decided to press on. And that's how we found ourselves stranded on that dark and desolate road, with the creature still out there somewhere, waiting for us. As we drove down that dark and desolate road, we were all on edge after the encounter with the mysterious figure in the woods. But things only got worse from there. Russell, who had been quiet since the attack, suddenly turned on us. His eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, and he began muttering strange incantations under his breath. We didn't know what was happening, but we knew it wasn't good. Then, he pulled out a gun and pointed it at us. Fear coursed through my veins as I realized that we were all in danger. But just as Russell was about to pull the trigger, Connie, my partner, jumped into action. With a strength I had never seen before, they tackled Russell to the ground and disarmed him. But the figure wasn't done yet. It began to possess Russell even more fully, its otherworldly abilities taking hold of his mind and body. Connie and I fought back as best we could, but it was like trying to stop a force of nature. Russell, or whatever was controlling him, seemed to be too powerful for us. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, the figure suddenly released its hold on Russell and retreated into the darkness. We were all shaken, but thankfully, we were alive. And it was all thanks to Connie's quick thinking and bravery. As we continued down the road, I couldn't help but think about how lucky I was to have them by my side. As we continued down the dark and desolate road, a new feeling of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. Despite the danger we had just narrowly escaped, there was a sense that something even worse was coming. I glanced up at the rearview mirror and my heart nearly stopped at what I saw. Connie's eyes, which had always been a warm hazel, were now glowing with an otherworldly light, just like the figure's eyes had before. Babe, what's happening to you? I whispered, my voice barely above a whisper. But Connie didn't answer. Instead, their body began to shake and convulse as if they were fighting against some unseen force. The car swerved on the road, and I struggled to keep it under control as I tried to help Connie. But just as it seemed like all was lost, Xavier, who had been sitting in the back seat, jumped into action. With a strength that belied his small stature, he lunged forward and grabbed Connie by the shoulders, pulling him away from the driver's seat. Get out of the car! Xavier shouted as she opened the door and shoved Connie out onto the road. We need to get away from them! We scrambled out of the car and ran as fast as we could down the road, the rain pouring down on us in sheets. Behind us, we could hear Connie screaming, their voice distorted by whatever was possessing them. Eventually, we came across an abandoned gas station, and we huddled inside, trying to catch our breath and figure out what to do next. I was grateful to Xavier for saving me from the possessed Connie, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something even more sinister was lurking just out of sight, waiting for its next victim. Despite the fear and uncertainty that plagued me, I couldn't leave Connie to face the unknown alone. Without a second thought, I turned around and ran back towards the possessed figure and my partner. Xavier and Ray called out for me to come back, but their voices were drowned out by the pounding of my heart and the sound of the rain. I knew they were right to be afraid, but I couldn't leave my partner behind, not when I loved them so deeply. As I approached Connie, I could see that their body was racked with spasms, and their eyes were still glowing with an otherworldly light. When I reached out to touch them, something strange happened. The figure possessing them seemed to falter, as if confused by my presence. For a moment I thought that I might be able to help them, to free them from whatever was controlling them, but before I could do anything, a deep, guttural growl filled the air, and the figure turned to face me. Its eyes burned with an intense, malevolent light, and I could feel a wave of cold dread wash over me. I tried to back away, but it was too late. The figure lunged forward, its claws extended, and I felt a searing pain as they dug into my flesh. For a moment, everything went black, and I was certain that I was going to die. But then, I heard a voice calling out my name, and suddenly, the figure was gone. When I opened my eyes, I saw Connie kneeling beside me, their face twisted with worry. Behind them, Xavier and Ray stood, their expressions a mix of relief and concern. Are you okay? Connie asked, their voice shaking. What happened? 
I struggled to sit up, wincing as I touched the wound on my arm. It was deep and ugly, but already starting to heal. I don't know, I said, my voice unable to be above a whisper. But we need to get out of here, now. Connie helped me to my feet and we embraced tightly. I love you, we said to each other. As we continued down the road, the rain began to lessen, and the clouds above us cleared. The moonlight shone down on us, casting eerie shadows across the landscape. Suddenly we came across the source of all our troubles. It stood before us, a massive, imposing figure, with a deep, rumbling voice that seemed to shake the very earth beneath our feet. I knew then that I had to confront it, to put an end to its reign of terror. So, without a second thought, I stepped forward, my heart pounding with a mix of fear and determination. But just as I was about to speak, the figure vanished, leaving nothing but the sound of its laughter echoing through the night. I turned back to my friends, my face a mask of confusion and frustration. What the hell was that? I asked, my voice trembling. But there was no answer. Only silence, broken only by the sound of the rain and the distant howl of the wind. My friends had disappeared. In that moment, I knew that my troubles were far from over. The figure had eluded me once again, and I could only wonder what other horrors lay in store for us in the darkness ahead. With a deep breath, I stepped forward, my eyes fixed on the spot where the figure had been only moments before. I was determined to put an end to this once and for all. In the back of my mind, my friends called out to me, pleading with me to reconsider, to wait for backup. But I knew that there was no time to waste. The longer I waited, the more innocent lives could be lost. As I approached the spot where the figure had been, I could feel a chill run down my spine. I knew that this was it, the moment of truth. With a sudden burst of courage, I shouted out into the darkness, daring the figure to show itself, to face me in combat. But there was no answer, only the sound of my own heartbeat, pounding in my chest like a war drum. And then, out of the shadows, it emerged. A massive, twisted creature with glowing eyes that seemed to stare right through me. Without hesitation, I launched myself forward, my fists flying as I struck at the creature with all my might. Then, darkness. I woke up in a hospital bed, my body battered and bruised, with no memory of how I got there. My friends were all there, looking at me with concern and relief. But there was something in their eyes, a hint of fear and uncertainty that I couldn't quite place. As the days passed, I struggled to piece together what had happened, but the memories remained elusive. All I knew was that something terrible had happened that night, something that I could never forget. And as I lay there, recovering from my injuries, I knew that the darkness was still out there, waiting for its chance to strike once again, and I could only hope that we would be ready when it did. As I sat at the party surrounded by my friends, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. It had been a year since that fateful night, and although we had all moved on with our lives, I could never shake the feeling that something was still not right. I was chatting with Russell, and then Ray came up to me and asked if we could chat privately. Nothing too out of the ordinary for them. As Ray and I spoke about everything we'd missed in each other's life since we last caught up, they asked me a question, which slightly took me aback. They asked if I would be interested in going back to the forest where that fateful night had happened. I responded with a mix of anger and confusion. Why the hell would you ever want to go back there? They replied, I want to be where I'm strongest. Confused, I asked, Strongest? What does that mean? Ray turned to me, chuckling, and as our eyes met, I saw something that made my blood run cold. Their eyes were glowing, just like the otherworldly creature's eyes had so many years ago. Being a park ranger at Mount Rainier has always been my dream, one of those childhood fantasies that somehow became a reality. Yet here I am, grappling with an insidious nightmare that makes every breath a struggle. Ever since the start of 2022, a disturbing pattern of people vanishing without a trace began to emerge within the park. 25 people in total. All were healthy, all in their prime, all swallowed by the mountain. What unnerved me the most wasn't the frequency of these occurrences, but rather the nonchalance with which our park administration treated them. Each missing report was handled in the same cold, bureaucratic manner. We would reassure the distraught family members, promise them we'd leave no stone unturned. 
but as soon as they left, our superiors would subtly discourage us from investigating further. Instead, a third-party search and rescue company was contracted to handle the cases. I recall vividly the day the first directive came down. Focus on the trail conditions, they told us. Leave the search and rescue to the professionals. It stung, you know. This was our park. These were our people. Yet we were supposed to turn a blind eye and pretend as if nothing was amiss. A palpable tension began to stretch through our ranks, but none dared to openly question the orders. Each new disappearance added to the mounting dread that hung over us. Yet what could we do? Our hands were tied. An unspoken rule was established. We, the park rangers of Mount Rainier, did not interfere with the missing persons cases. At first I tried to rationalize it. A rough winter had left the trails in a bad state. Then there was the influx of novice hikers, with barely enough experience to set up a tent, let alone survive the treacherous park terrain. And of course, there was the pressure from higher-ups to keep the park's image clean. The last thing they needed was the media painting Mount Rainier as a place where people disappeared. I even found some comfort in this logic. It allowed me to sleep at night. Until, of course, it didn't. Even though I maintained my ranger duties on the surface, my mind never strayed far from the disturbing trend. I found myself studying the faces of the hikers I met along the trails, secretly hoping I wouldn't be the next one to report them missing. Working in the heart of such wild, uncontrolled beauty, it was easy to forget the danger that lurked behind the curtain of towering pines and serene rivers. But those faces, the ones that would only return to us in crinkled photographs, or desperate, hopeful pleas from relatives, were a harsh reminder of our powerlessness in the face of the unforgiving wilderness. Or was it something even more sinister? The silence of the park, which used to be my solace, began to echo with hidden threats. I was on edge, jumping at the rustle of leaves, the snap of twigs. But little did I know, the true horror was yet to come. And it all started with a simple hike up the Ipsut Pass Trail but I'm getting ahead of myself. To understand, you must first know the fear, the doubt, the questions that haunted each of us rangers at Mount Rainier. There's a peculiar solitude that comes with being a park ranger. It's not loneliness, but a state of oneness with the natural world, a feeling that you're a small part of something immense and ancient. My hike up to the Ipsut Pass was filled with such moments, broken only by the crunch of my boots against the trail and the occasional songbird. Despite the tension that had become my constant companion, I found myself lost in the raw beauty of the park, momentarily forgetting the unsettling occurrences. As I trudged along the winding trail, the gentle whisper of the wind through the evergreens and the soft rustle of unseen creatures served as my only companions. It was just another day at work, or so it seemed. As I approached a bend in the trail, a glinting anomaly caught my eye. An odd light shone from the forest floor, about fifty feet from the trail. Initially I dismissed it as sunlight bouncing off a patch of water, or some wayward hiker's discarded trash. But as I drew closer, I realized the light was constant, unchanging, not an effect of the shifting sun. Curiosity peaked. I made my way through the dense undergrowth, my heart pounding with a mix of thrill and apprehension. Thoughts of the missing hikers buzzed like an annoying fly at the back of my mind, but I swatted them away. There had to be a logical explanation, there always was. As I approached the source, the oddity of it stopped me in my tracks. The light wasn't just on the forest floor, it was emanating from underneath it. Removing my pack, I knelt down for a closer look. Kneading the soil beneath my fingers, it became clear that the glow was coming from beneath a thin layer of dirt and fallen leaves. I felt an odd sensation, like a shiver racing down my spine, and glanced around instinctively. The forest was as it always was, still, quiet, indifferent. Ignoring the uneasy feeling creeping up on me, I dug around the light source with my fingers. As I moved the dirt away, I felt the hard edge of something buried, a corner of what seemed to be a well-disguised trap door. It was meticulously camouflaged, blending almost perfectly with the forest floor. The realization was chilling. Without that faint light peeking through, I'd have walked past it a hundred times, none the wiser. Trepidation surged through me, but the lure of solving the mystery was too strong. Maybe this was related to the missing hikers, or maybe it was just a hidden seismometer. 
Either way, I had to know. Carefully, I lifted the door. The sliver of daylight that broke into the space beneath revealed a burrow of sorts, small and cramped, with an electric camping torch at one corner. Its dull, flickering light was what I had seen from the trail. At that moment, an icy dread began to fill me. This was no ordinary burrow. It was a piece of the puzzle that had been missing, the unknown variable in the disturbing equation of Mount Rainier. But little did I know, it was only the beginning. The real terror was yet to reveal itself. With the small trapdoor ajar, a sense of foreboding washed over me. My heart pounded in my chest as I peered into the confined space, barely large enough for a person. Inside was nothing more than a camping torch, sputtering with fading light. I found it strange to find such an item in a makeshift burrow. My pulse quickened at the realization that this wasn't something accidental. It was intentional, and whoever was responsible was coming prepared. Before my courage could wane, I thrust my head into the burrow for a closer look. The earthy smell of the soil was overwhelming. As I adjusted to the confined space, I noticed Polaroid photos tacked on the inner walls of the burrow. My blood ran cold at the sight. They were candid shots of hikers, each taken from a low angle, as though the photographer was crouching or lying on the ground. The pit in my stomach grew with each photo I recognized. The smiling faces of those reported missing over the past year, frozen in time. I felt sick, the full implication of my discovery washing over me. I was staring at the collected trophies of an unseen predator. This was no ordinary burrow. It was a lair, a hideout. It was as though someone, or something, was stalking the hikers, keeping track of their movements, their habits, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. My mind spun with gruesome possibilities. What if this person, this entity, was responsible for all the disappearances? It was horrifying to consider. I had unknowingly stumbled upon a concealed den of terror in the heart of Mount Rainier. My once cherished solitude suddenly felt like vulnerability. I was alone, far from help, with a potential predator lurking nearby. As I pored over the photos, my heart pounded in my ears. My own face stared back at me from one of the Polaroids. It was a recent photo, taken perhaps half an hour ago while I was walking the very same trail. The icy grip of fear clenched my heart. I wasn't just an intruder stumbling upon a lair. I was the next potential victim. The sound of a twig snapping behind me yanked me from my horrified trance. Adrenaline surged through my veins, and without a second thought, I scrambled out of the burrow, leaving the trapdoor gaping behind me. I ran back along the trail, not daring to look back, each rustle of leaves, each snap of a twig magnifying my terror. I didn't stop until I reached the safety of the wilderness cabin near Ipsut campground. Exhausted and shaken, I barricaded myself inside, waiting for the dawn to come, waiting for another ranger to find me. The peace and tranquility of Mount Rainier had been shattered, replaced by a menacing dread. But even in my worst nightmares, I could not have imagined what was to come. I was far from the end of my ordeal. The real terror was yet to unfold. Sleep evaded me that night, each creak of the cabin and rustle of wind outside echoing my rising panic. My discovery had turned the peace of the park into an echoing, empty void of terror. As the first rays of dawn pierced through the cabin's window, I breathed a sigh of relief. The arrival of another ranger later that morning did nothing to ease my mind, but at least I wasn't alone. I persuaded him to accompany me back to the trail though I remained cryptic about my reasons. He seemed annoyed, but agreed nonetheless. My hope was to find the burrow again, to share my horrifying discovery. However, after an hour of searching, the camouflage door was nowhere to be found. It was as if the earth had swallowed it whole, leaving no trace of the horror beneath. Doubt started to creep into my mind. Had I imagined it all? Was the stress of the job playing tricks on me? But the Polaroids, the faces, my face, all were too vivid to be mere hallucinations. Upon returning to the ranger station, I found myself confronted by my manager. His furrowed brow and sharp gaze made it clear that he was suspicious about my odd behavior and sudden need for time off. I mumbled some excuse about a family emergency, not daring to share the truth. I felt a strong instinct that sharing my findings would lead to more harm than good, perhaps even cost me my job. The eerie tranquility of my home was a stark contrast to the storm raging within me. 
I couldn't shake off the dread of the day's discovery, nor the nagging feeling of being watched. The forest, which once held beauty and peace, now only offered fear and anxiety. My troubling thoughts were interrupted by a glinting object inside the kitchen air vent. It was too big to be dust, too shiny to be debris. Kneeling down for a closer inspection, I realized it was a small object lodged within the vent. With a sinking feeling, I removed the grating and reached in. My blood turned to ice when I pulled out a Polaroid photo. It was a picture of me, taken earlier that day, making breakfast in my own kitchen. The same eerie low angle, the same candid capture, it was identical to the photos I'd found in the burrow. My heart pounded against my ribs as the full realization hit me. I wasn't alone. This silent predator wasn't confined to the wilderness of Mount Rainier. It had followed me, invaded my home, my sanctuary. The terror I felt on the trail resurfaced, multiplied a hundred times over. The unseen stalker was closer than I had ever imagined, observing, waiting, and I had no idea who or what it was. But one thing was certain, this was not the end. The danger was real, and it was far closer than I ever could have thought. The game of cat and mouse had escalated. The question was, could I uncover the truth before it was too late? As I held the Polaroid, my hands shaking uncontrollably, I realized the depth of my predicament. I was not just a witness to these horrifying events, but also the target of this insidious predator. The sanctuary I had created within my home had been violated. Whoever, or whatever, was stalking the hikers in Mount Rainier had trailed me home, turning my safe haven into another hunting ground. Days turned into nights in a blur. The isolation, once a source of tranquility, now became a prison. Each shadow held a threat, every noise a harbinger of danger. I was living on the edge, a prey waiting for the predator to strike. I began to investigate, my instincts as a park ranger coming to the forefront. I installed security cameras, kept an eye out for anything unusual, anything that could give me a clue about the identity of the stalker. But the stalker remained elusive, a ghost that lurked in the shadows. The tension was unbearable. Sleep was a distant memory. Every creak of the house, every rustling of leaves outside amplified my fear. My once peaceful home now echoed with unseen horrors, as did the vast expanse of Mount Rainier, which loomed ominously in the distance. The climax of my terror arrived one chilling night. I woke up to a sound coming from the living room. Adrenaline pumping, I crept down the stairs. The room was lit only by the faint moonlight streaming through the window. I held my breath as I peered around the corner. There, on my coffee table, was a pile of freshly printed Polaroids. I felt my blood run cold as I approached the table. The top photo was of me, taken from outside the window while I was asleep just a few moments ago. The same eerie, low angle, the same silent capture of the unassuming victim. I leafed through the photos each one a candid shot of me going about my daily life, utterly unaware of the silent watcher. My eyes widened in horror as I reached the final photo. It was not a picture of me but of my bedroom window, seen from outside the house. And there, in the reflection of the window glass, was the faint outline of a figure, too indistinct to make out any features but humanoid, crouched low to the ground, camera in hand. I felt a chill run down my spine as I dropped the photos, backing away, it was too late to deny the reality of my situation. I was not just living in fear, I was living with fear, a terrifying entity whose intentions remained unknown. The silent stalker of Mount Rainier had made it clear. The game had just begun. My ordeal was far from over. As the once comforting silence of my home was filled with ominous echoes of unseen danger, I was left with a terrifying certainty. I was not alone and I was being hunted but by whom or what I was still to find out. The terror of Mount Rainier had followed me home, turning my sanctuary into a terrifying trap. The first rays of morning light were just beginning to creep over the vast horizon, splintering through the towering trees of Yosemite National Park. My hands tightened around the steering wheel of the patrol truck, dirt and gravel crunching beneath its tires as I maneuvered through the dense forest path. The branches scraped against the windows like skeletal hands begging for attention. I'd always found a certain calm in these quiet, solitary drives through the park. 
It was a place filled with beauty, solitude, but also danger. A danger I was trained to mitigate. As a park ranger, I was the gatekeeper of this vast expanse of wilderness, tasked with protecting its visitors and nature alike. I had to keep an eye out for mischievous wildlife and fallen trees, as well as unruly hunters and clueless campers. But today was different. Today there was something else out there, something I couldn't quite place. A flicker of movement to my left drew me from my reverie. A lone figure stood in a rock-strewn field, silhouetted against the rising sun. A woman. My eyebrows furrowed in confusion. She was in the middle of nowhere, and the way she was standing there, all alone, seemed off. She had no hiking equipment, no backpack, nothing. I slowed the truck and leaned out of the window. The woman, having heard the truck, turned to look at me. Her face was expressionless, her eyes distant. Instead of acknowledging me, she began to march up the rocky slope. A chill of unease wound its way up my spine. In this wilderness, any sign of another human was usually met with relief, even joy. Yet she chose to walk away. Hey, miss, are you okay? I called out to her. No answer. She continued her ascent until she reached the top and vanished into the tree line. An odd feeling twisted in my gut, a sense of recognition, her face dot dot dot. T was familiar. Where had I seen her before? Intrigued, I pulled up a file on my laptop. The database was filled with photographs of people reported missing in this area. After scrolling through dozens of entries, my heart pounded in my chest as I finally found her. The same woman, the same face. She'd been reported missing eight months ago. But that couldn't be right, could it? She looked nothing like someone who'd been living in these harsh woods for eight months. She was too clean, too... normal. But her clothes, they were different. The unease began to twist into fear. I grabbed the radio, my hand trembling slightly, and reported my encounter to the station. Leaving the truck behind, I packed my gear and took off on foot, following the direction the woman had gone. I needed to find her, to figure out how she had survived, and to ensure she got home safely. The journey ahead was uncertain, but one thing was sure. I had to find her. The lone woman in the wilderness was a mystery I was determined to unravel. The answers were out there, hidden amongst the trees, waiting to be discovered. The forest of Yosemite was an emerald maze, and in the heart of this labyrinth, I found myself. The sky above was veiled by a thick canopy, leaving the undergrowth shrouded in half-light, and the air was heavy with the scent of pine and damp earth. Armed with my gear, I ascended the rocky slope, my eyes scanning for any signs of the woman. I found her tracks leading into the trees, their imprint fresh in the damp soil. Despite the worry gnawing at me, I felt a glimmer of relief. I was on her trail. Like a hunter, I traced her steps, winding through the dense forest. It felt like a game of hide-and-seek, only the stakes were infinitely higher. The further I went, the more uneasy I became. She had moved too far, too fast for someone who appeared to be in a condition of exhaustion or distress. It was as if she was leading me somewhere, or away from something. But suddenly the tracks vanished, swallowed by the forest floor. A chill ran down my spine as I stood there, alone in the vast wilderness. How could she have disappeared like that? I couldn't shake the feeling that I was missing something vital, a clue that was staring me right in the face. Driven by determination, I pushed forward, hoping that the trail would reappear further ahead. The forest was unyielding, each step was a battle against thick undergrowth and creeping roots, but I pressed on. The silent watch of the trees seemed to grow more oppressive, their gnarled shapes ominous in the dim light. Then I saw it, a staircase, in the middle of the forest. It stood starkly against the wild backdrop, eerily out of place. What the hell is that? I muttered to myself. My heart pounded in my chest as I moved closer, my brain struggling to make sense of the sight. It was ordinary in every way, save for its location. The wood seemed relatively new, free from the usual ravages of time and weather. What is this doing out here? I asked aloud, the echo of my voice a stark contrast to the silence of the forest. The staircase led to nowhere, ending abruptly after thirteen steps. The odd number sent a shudder down my spine. Was it a coincidence, or was there some significance to it? A strange pull, an unexplainable curiosity drew me towards the staircase. Despite the growing sense of unease, I found myself approaching it. As I neared, I felt the forest close in around me. The feeling of being watched intensified. 
and a prickly sensation ran down my back, but I couldn't turn back. I was drawn to the stairs, as if they were a key to unraveling the mystery of the lone woman. What was their purpose? What was their connection to her? Questions buzzed in my mind like angry bees. As I ascended the stairs, the forest seemed to hold its breath. With every step, my paranoia grew stronger, a sense of being followed, of not being alone. Yet every time I turned around, nothing but trees met my eyes. The solitude, the silence, the stairs, everything felt uncannily wrong. I should have turned back, I should have left, but I didn't, I couldn't. I had a mission, a duty to find the woman and get her to safety. Even if it led me deeper into the heart of the unknown, I was determined to see it through. And so, I ascended the mysterious staircase, unaware of the terror that was to come. As I reached the top of the staircase, a profound dread washed over me. My hand tightened around my walking stick, each nerve tingling with heightened alertness. What I was doing felt counterintuitive to my survival instincts, but I forced myself to press on. Looking down, my gaze met the towering trees, their branches rustling in the gentle breeze. There was no rooftop, no house, no structure to justify the presence of these stairs, just a sudden termination into the canopy, the staircase ending as abruptly as it began. Behind me, the silence was interrupted by a strange rustling. I quickly turned around but found nothing, just an array of undergrowth and trees, swaying eerily in the wind. Yet the feeling of being watched was more intense now, and I couldn't shake the sensation that something was wrong. Summoning my courage, I descended the stairs, my heart pounding in my chest. The air was cooler now, and I could feel the chill seeping into my bones. When I reached the bottom, I found the woman's footprints again, more profound and easier to follow. It was as if she had deliberately made her path clearer after passing the stairs. I followed her tracks through the dense woods, my senses on high alert. As I ventured further, I came across a small clearing where the moonlight filtered through the trees and illuminated the undergrowth. There, in the center, was a single folded piece of paper. It was the first real clue that I'd found since the tracks had disappeared. Cautiously, I picked it up and unfolded it. The note was written in a hurried scrawl, and it was clear the author had been under duress. The words were simple, yet chilling. They are watching. Don't trust the stairs. A cold shiver ran down my spine. They? Who were they? I found myself looking back towards the staircase, its ominous presence more unsettling now. I shoved the note in my pocket and pushed on, more desperate than ever to find the woman. I quickened my pace, her footprints leading me deeper into the dense forest. As I walked, the forest's sounds seemed amplified, every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig, and the eerily haunting hoot of an owl. I felt the pressure mounting, the darkness pressing in around me. The silence was no longer comforting. It was a menacing quiet that amplified my growing fear. Somewhere in the distance, a low growl echoed. I froze in my tracks. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to listen. I heard it again, a little closer this time. Panic surged through me. There was something out there with me. I wasn't alone. Gripping my walking stick tighter, I ventured further, hoping against hope that I was close to finding her. But as the growling grew louder, so did my fear. What had started as a simple rescue mission was quickly morphing into a nightmarish scenario. I'd always viewed myself as the protector, the hero. But out here, in the heart of the forest, faced with unseen threats and chilling messages, I was starting to question everything. I was no longer the hunter but the hunted, teetering on the brink of a precipice I hadn't even known existed. The feeling of impending doom was unbearable, but I knew I had to press on. I had to find her. As I continued to follow the footprints deeper into the forest, my mind raced. It was hard to keep my imagination from running wild as I tried to piece together what could have happened to the woman. Every odd-shaped shadow or strange noise sent a fresh jolt of terror coursing through my veins. Eventually, the tracks led me to a cave hidden amongst the thick undergrowth. The mouth of the cave yawned open like a monstrous beast, the darkness within promising untold horrors. I hesitated, looking back towards the distant staircase and the relative safety it represented, but I knew I had to go in. Taking a deep breath, I stepped into the cave, my walking stick tapping against the stone floor. 
The echo seemed to bounce endlessly off the walls, an ominous reminder of the loneliness and isolation I felt. As I ventured further, I could see faint scratch marks on the stone walls. Desperate attempts of escape? I shuddered at the thought. Suddenly, an inhuman screech reverberated through the cave. I froze, my heart pounding against my ribcage like a trapped bird. It sounded close, too close. Then I saw it, the entity. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before, a formless mass of shadow and menace. It moved with an eerie grace, phasing in and out of the cave walls as if bound by different laws of physics. I watched as it coalesced into the vague shape of a humanoid, its form flickering and shifting in the dim light. As it noticed my presence, the entity let out another deafening screech, its form lurching towards me. I was paralyzed with fear, my mind unable to process the nightmare that was unfolding before me. It was the embodiment of every childhood fear, every nightmare, every story of things that go bump in the night. In a flash of instinct, I thrust my walking stick towards it. The stick passed right through the entity, sending ripples through its form. It let out another horrifying scream, its shape momentarily destabilizing before it resumed its advance. I turned to run but stumbled over a loose stone. As I hit the ground, my hand brushed against something cold and metallic. Looking down, I saw an old iron dagger with strange runes etched onto the blade. It was just like the one depicted on the map, the one that was supposed to defeat the entity. With a surge of hope, I grasped the dagger tightly and faced the entity. I could feel the chill from its form seeping into my bones, sapping my strength. But I refused to give in. I had come too far to let fear stop me now. With a guttural cry, I thrust the dagger towards the entity. There was a blinding flash of light followed by an ear-splitting shriek. When I could see again, the entity was gone. The cave was silent once more. I fell to my knees, my body trembling from the adrenaline. The entity was defeated, at least for now. But where was the woman? Was she still alive? A wave of despair washed over me as I picked myself up and ventured further into the cave. What I saw next made my blood run cold. Tied up in the far corner of the cave was the woman, unconscious, but alive. I rushed over, my relief mingling with a newfound determination. I had defeated the entity, and I was going to get her out of here. I was going to get us both out of here. I untied the woman, her body slumping against me, unconscious but breathing. I had never felt so relieved in my life, but the relief was short-lived as I realized the daunting task ahead of us. We had to get out of this cave, back through the forest and down the staircase, all without attracting the entity's attention again. Slinging her arm over my shoulder, I began our arduous journey. Every step was a struggle, her weight slowing me down, but I gritted my teeth and pressed on, the thought of her dying on my watch spurring me on. The deeper we went into the forest, the more my fears began to resurface. What if the entity wasn't really gone? What if it came back for us? Every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig, every gust of wind had me on high alert. It was in the dead of the night when we finally reached the base of the staircase. My body ached with exhaustion, and I was pretty sure I had a couple of cracked ribs from a fall I took earlier, but there was no time to rest. The sooner we got down the staircase, the safer we would be. As I began to ascend, I realized that the climb was harder than I had anticipated. The steps were narrow and uneven, threatening to trip us at every turn. But worse than the physical strain was the fear. The fear that with each step I took, the entity could be right behind us, ready to strike. A low growl echoed in the distance and I froze. I looked back, squinting through the darkness. There was nothing. I breathed a sigh of relief and turned back around, but as I did, my foot slipped. I cried out as I tumbled down the steps, the woman in my arms. When I came to a stop, my entire body screamed in pain, but there was no time to dwell on it. I pulled myself up, wincing as I checked on the woman. She was still unconscious but alive. I breathed a sigh of relief and hoisted her back onto my shoulder. Every step after that was a battle. My body begged for rest, for respite, but I had to keep going. I had to keep climbing. As the first rays of dawn broke through the canopy, I saw the end of the staircase. A jolt of hope shot through me. We were almost there. With the last bit of strength I had, I pushed forward. The staircase seemed to go on forever, each step a painful reminder of the night's events. But finally, after what felt like an eternity, we reached the top. I collapsed on the ground, 
exhaustion taking over. The sun was fully up now, bathing the forest in a warm, golden light. It was a stark contrast to the cold, unforgiving darkness of the night. The woman stirred next to me. Her eyes fluttered open, confusion etched on her face. I offered her a weak smile and passed out. I had done it. We had escaped. We were free. I awoke in a bed, the sheets a crisp, sterile white. The scent of antiseptic filled my nostrils. The room was unfamiliar, lit by the soft glow of the morning sun filtering through the blinds. The hum of machines surrounded me. A hospital, I realized. My body ached as I pushed myself up to a sitting position, wincing at the sharp sting in my ribs. Looking down, I saw bandages wrapped tightly around my chest. The events of the past days hit me like a wave. The entity, the woman, the escape. It all seemed so surreal now. A knock on the door jolted me from my thoughts. A woman in a nurse's uniform walked in, surprise evident on her face. You're awake, she exclaimed, relief washing over her. She informed me that I had been out for two days and that the doctors were astounded I had survived the ordeal. But what about the woman? I asked, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't even know her name, and yet I felt a strange connection to her, bound by our shared trauma. The nurse's face softened. She's alive, she said, in a room down the hall, still unconscious but stable. You saved her life. Relief washed over me. We had made it. We were safe. But there was no time to relax. I needed answers. Who was she? What was that entity? And most importantly, why us? I spent the rest of the day grilling the hospital staff for information, but they knew little. They found us on the outskirts of the forest, both unconscious, near the bottom of the staircase. They had no clue about the entity or the strange occurrences surrounding the staircase. I couldn't help but feel frustrated. All that we had gone through, and still, there were more questions than answers. As I lay in bed that night staring at the ceiling, my thoughts wandered back to the woman. I wondered what she was like, what her life was before all this. I wondered if she remembered anything about the entity, about the staircase. With these thoughts swirling in my mind, I drifted off to sleep. My dreams were filled with shadows and dark figures, the entity lurking in the corners. I woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding, the nightmare felt so real, so vivid. As the days passed, I slowly started to recover. My ribs healed and the pain subsided, but the nightmares persisted, a constant reminder of the trauma we had endured. One day, as I was sitting in my room, reading a book to distract myself from my thoughts, the door creaked open. I looked up to see the woman standing there, her eyes meeting mine. She looked frail, but there was a determined set to her jaw a fire in her eyes. She looked like a survivor, just like me. A wave of relief washed over me. She was awake. We were both survivors. We had a chance to figure out the truth behind our ordeal. Together, we could face the aftermath of our encounter with the entity. The days turned into weeks, and the woman, I learned her name was Kate, and I slowly recovered, physically at least. The psychological scars ran deeper, Every night I was haunted by nightmares, replaying our desperate flight from the entity. Kate confided that she experienced the same. We became each other's support system, a beacon of strength in the enveloping darkness. One day Kate suggested we revisit the forest, to face our fears. I agreed, believing it could bring closure, help us move on. I knew not the folly of this decision. We arrived at the forest edge early in the morning the sunlight casting long shadows that seemed to dance and flicker with a sinister life of their own. I could feel the cold tendrils of fear curling in my stomach, but I gritted my teeth and pressed on, Kate beside me. The forest was silent as we made our way through. It was as if every creature, every whisper of the wind, held its breath, waiting. The staircase loomed ahead, as eerie and out of place as ever. It stood there, a monument to our harrowing past, unblemished by the ravages of time. We ascended slowly, the steps creaking under our weight. At the top, we paused, surveying the surrounding landscape. It was peaceful, serene even, a stark contrast to the terror we had experienced. Just as I started to relax, thinking that perhaps we had truly escaped the nightmare, I felt a cold chill rush down my spine. The air seemed to thicken, the light dimmed, and the forest fell silent. A familiar dread filled me, we turned simultaneously towards the staircase, 
It was happening again. The stone steps, moments before bathed in sunlight, now glistened with a deep malevolent darkness. I could feel the presence of the entity, stronger than ever. Its power washed over us like an icy wave. No. Kate whispered beside me, her face pale, her eyes wide with fear. The darkness swelled, oozing from the staircase, wrapping around us. I could hear it whispering, a cacophony of discordant voices that filled my mind, my soul with terror. I reached for Kate, my fingers closing around her hand. I could feel her trembling, matching my own fear. We backed away slowly, but the darkness followed, persistent, hungry. The entity had returned, and this time it felt stronger, more menacing. I tried to scream, to shout, but my voice was drowned in the consuming darkness. All I could see were Kate's eyes, mirroring my own terror. The entity closed in, its whispers growing louder, its power overwhelming. As the darkness consumed us, I realized that this was it. We were not survivors. We were prisoners, bound to this entity, to this staircase. We had tried to confront our past, to seek closure, but instead, we had walked straight back into the jaws of our nightmare. In our quest for understanding, we had become the hunted again, doomed to relive the horror eternally. And as the darkness enveloped us completely, I knew that the true terror had just begun. Every morning, as the sun stretched its rays over the tops of the mountains, I'd pause and watch as the day painted itself into existence. I was a park ranger, had been for a decade, and the Greywood National Park was my sanctuary. The melody of the birds floating through the crisp morning air was a familiar symphony that always welcomed me into the wilderness. This place was an unending canvas of serenity. I knew every dip and rise in the land, every old tree that had withstood the test of time, and every river that ran wildly, carrying with it stories untold. I had the privilege of immersing myself in this wonder every single day. But being a ranger meant more than just coexisting with nature. It meant understanding it, preserving it, and at times unraveling the mysteries it held within its depths. Over the years I had encountered a myriad of strange occurrences. There were tales spun around flickering campfires, stories of hikers disappearing into thin air, and campers swearing they had seen lights moving in patterns across the night sky. Each account was stranger than the last, but such stories were a part of the job, an eerie allure that kept the forest feeling forever unknown, forever wild. But of all the tales, one held a particularly ominous reputation, the Whispering Woods. It was a dark and dense patch of forest, where the trees huddled together like they were sharing secrets, their twisted branches reaching out, covering the sky and shrouding the area in an eerie darkness, even during the brightest of days. The forest floor was a world unto itself, housing epiphytes that found their homes in the tree trunks, never once touching the ground. The dense foliage was broken occasionally by vines that stretched between the trees like natural bridges. The whispering woods got its name from the stories of strange whispers that filled the night. Some claimed it was the ghosts of past wanderers, while others argued it was the voices of felled trees, their spirits restless after a storm that had ravaged the area years ago. But to me, it mattered little what the whispers were. I just knew that I wanted nothing to do with them. During my ten years at Greywood, I had explored every inch of the park, yet I had never set foot in the whispering woods. I had not the courage nor the curiosity to find out if the rumors were true. When your job involves the strange and the unexplainable, you learn when to respect the unknown. The woods were a mystery best left untouched. Yet, as I carried out my duties, patrolling the familiar trails and observing the grandeur of nature unfold, I couldn't shake off a feeling of dread. It was as if the whispering woods watched me from a distance, an unseen entity waiting silently for the right moment. It was unsettling, but I pushed the feeling aside. Little did I know, the forest was about to reveal a secret that would forever change the way I looked at it. And it all began with a group of terrified hikers. On a day much like any other, the tranquil hum of the forest was shattered by an echo of panic. A group of hikers stumbled into the ranger station, their faces ghostly white, their eyes wide with a fear I had rarely seen before. I heard it, I swear, one of them stammered, pointing in the direction of the whispering woods. Voices, 
They were whispering my name. Hesitant murmurs and frightened glances were exchanged among the group. I tried to reassure them, suggesting the wind or the rustling leaves could have played tricks on their senses, but they remained inconsolable. Their stories bore an eerie similarity to the old tales. As much as I wanted to dismiss their claims, a shiver of unease crept down my spine. I escorted the terrified hikers to the edge of the park, advising them to seek shelter in town for the night. As they walked away, I couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling. I stood there, watching the sun dip below the horizon, its golden light slowly giving way to an engulfing darkness. For the first time in years, I decided to stay back in the park overnight. A part of me hoped to put the rumors to rest, the other part yearned to understand what truly lurked within the whispering woods. I set up a small camp near the edge of the woods, far enough to avoid unwanted attention, yet close enough to hear any unusual sounds. The night was quiet, save for the gentle chorus of the nocturnal creatures. I was beginning to believe that the hikers had imagined their experience when I heard it. A low whisper, barely audible over the chirping crickets. It seemed to echo from the heart of the forest. My heart pounded in my chest, adrenaline racing through my veins. I approached the edge of the whispering woods, flashlight in hand, straining my ears to pick up the sounds again. I was met with an eerie silence. Moments passed, each second stretching into what felt like an eternity. I was about to abandon my post when I heard my name, whispered softly, as if carried by the wind. My blood ran cold. It wasn't a hallucination. The woods were indeed whispering. I staggered back, overwhelmed. The stories I had dismissed as mere campfire tales were turning into a chilling reality. What was supposed to be just another day at work had spiraled into a night fraught with fear and confusion. I retreated to my tent, my mind whirring with questions and apprehension. Throughout the night, the whispers continued. Sometimes they were so low that I thought I was imagining them. At other times, they were so loud that I was forced to cover my ears. I didn't sleep a wink that night, the horrifying truth echoing in my ears. By the time the sun peeked over the horizon, I knew what I had to do. I was not just a ranger anymore. I was an unwitting participant in a supernatural mystery that stretched back decades. I was drawn into a mission, whether I liked it or not, to solve the secret of the whispering woods. After all, the forest was my responsibility, my sanctuary, and I could not just turn a blind eye to the danger that lurked within. With the break of dawn, I found myself filled with an uncanny resolve. I was determined to uncover the truth about the whispering woods, regardless of how deep and dark the rabbit hole would go. Armed with my ranger gear and a newfound sense of purpose, I set out towards the town library, the repository of our small town's collective memories. Walking through the creaky doors of the old building, I was met with the familiar smell of age and wisdom, of secrets nestled in the yellowed pages of countless books. The librarian, Mrs. Anderson, looked up from her desk, peering at me over her spectacles. I wasn't expecting to see you here, she said with a smile, noting the serious expression on my face. Need help finding something? I do, Mrs. Anderson, I replied, motioning towards the section of local history. I briefly explained my mission, though I left out the part about hearing my name whispered in the woods. Even in our town, where folk tales were part of daily life, I feared my experience would be dismissed as a wild imagination. Her eyes widened as I finished my story, a mixture of excitement and worry gleaming in her gaze. Well, if it's the old tales you're after, you'd better buckle up. There's more to those stories than you'd think. Guided by her expertise, we spent the morning rummaging through dusty records, worn-out maps, and old newspaper clippings. The tales varied, but a single thread ran through them all. Voices in the whispering woods, mysterious disappearances, and an unexplainable sense of dread that had loomed over the town for generations. As the hours passed, one story caught my attention. It was about a local girl who had vanished in the woods 50 years ago, never to be seen again. She had been a respected forest ranger, just like me, and her disappearance had sent ripples of panic through the town. The case was never solved, and over the years, it faded into yet another unsolved mystery of our town. I couldn't help but feel a connection with her. We shared the same job, the same love for the forest, and now, the same eerie experience. 
A chill ran down my spine as I thought of her fate. Could I meet the same end if I continued to investigate? But then, I thought of the hikers, their faces ashen, their voices trembling with fear. I thought of the whispering woods, their secrets shrouded in darkness. No, I couldn't let fear stop me. If there was a threat lurking in the woods, it was my duty to face it, not run away. Armed with the information gathered, I thanked Mrs. Anderson and headed back towards the park. As I left the library, the sun was setting, painting the sky with hues of orange and red. I could feel the weight of the town's history pressing down on me, a symphony of whispers in my ears. There was no denying it any longer. The whispering woods were more than just a forest. They were an enigma cloaked in decades of fear and unanswered questions. As I stepped into the cooling evening, one thing was certain. I had a long night ahead, a night that was sure to bring me closer to the truth or throw me deeper into the shadows of the past. Night had descended, blanketing the town in a comforting darkness. But as I stared into the depths of the whispering woods, comfort was the last thing on my mind. Each rustling leaf and distant animal call only heightened my senses, my heart pounding like a drum in my chest. I knew this was it. Tonight I would either uncover the truth about the voices, or I would become yet another unsolved mystery of our town. Equipped with my ranger flashlight and a walkie-talkie, I ventured into the woods, my boots crunching on the foliage below. Each step further into the labyrinth of trees felt like stepping into another world, a world that was eerie and alive with whispers. I could hear them clearly now, the whispering voices, their ethereal tones reverberating off the trunks of the ancient trees. It felt like they were guiding me, leading me deeper into the forest. I fought the urge to call out, focusing instead on following the strange trail that seemed to open before me. After what felt like hours, I reached a clearing. Bathed in moonlight, it felt oddly serene amid the cacophony of whispers, and in its center stood an ancient tree, its branches stretched wide as if embracing the sky. Its bark was scarred, marking the passage of countless years, its gnarled roots burrowing deep into the earth but what caught my attention was the shadowy figure standing before it. Tall and indistinct, it was a shape more than a person, as if the night itself had taken form. My heart pounded in my chest, my hand instinctively reaching for the walkie-talkie. But something stopped me, a sense of familiarity, a strange comfort that washed over me, drowning the fear that had been brewing in my heart. I've been expecting you, the figure spoke, its voice echoing with the whispers of the forest. I could barely make out its features, but its eyes shone like two bright stars in the darkness. You are the one brave enough to seek the truth, to seek me. Who are you? I asked, my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and excitement. What's happening in these woods? I am a guardian, it replied, stepping into the moonlight, revealing a face not of a monster, but a woman. Her skin seemed to glow, her hair floating like a cloud around her head. She was beautiful and terrifying all at once. She was the girl who had disappeared, the ranger who was lost but never forgotten. Long ago, I was chosen by the forest to protect it, but I failed and was consumed by it. Now it's your turn, she said, her voice soft yet authoritative. You must uncover the truth about the whispering woods, reveal its secrets, and save those who dare to enter. Her words were like a punch to my gut. I was a forest ranger, yes, but a guardian of an ancient woodland entity. The reality of it all was overwhelming, yet as I looked into her eyes, I knew I couldn't back down. And so, under the light of the moon, by the ancient tree in the whispering woods, I accepted my destiny. The whispers quietened, the forest sighed, and the woman disappeared, leaving me alone with my resolve. The woods were no longer a mystery. They were a responsibility, a mantle I had to bear. And I knew, come morning, I had a lot of work to do. Having embraced my newfound role as the guardian, I returned to the town, greeted by the morning sun. The townsfolk looked at me with curious eyes, their whispers hushed as I passed by. I didn't mind. My purpose had transcended their idle gossip. But as I walked the familiar paths, I felt a chilling wind follow me, the whispers of the woods trailing behind. It seemed that accepting the mantle didn't silence the voices. Instead, they were growing louder, more desperate. In the heart of the town, the whispers coalesced into an echoing plea. I turned to see our town's ancient statue, 
a tribute to our founding ancestors. But something was amiss. The stone faces of the founders, usually stern and silent, seemed to grimace, as if in agony. My instincts kicked in. I rushed to the statue, scanning its rugged surface. The whispers crescendoed into a haunting melody, the voices entwining around the stone figures. My hand instinctively reached out, pressing against the cold stone. Suddenly, a surge of energy passed through me, a jumble of thoughts, memories, and voices. Images flashed before my eyes, our founders, the Whispering Woods origin, the girl, me. It was a kaleidoscope of history, tangled in the roots of the town and the woods. Then came the truth, darker and more horrifying than any tale our town had spun. The founders hadn't stumbled upon these lands. They had sacrificed the forest's original guardian, damning her spirit to the woods, to gain control of the town's destiny. And each subsequent guardian, including the girl and the ranger, had met the same fate, consumed by the relentless whispers. I staggered back, my breath ragged. The town we lived in, the woods we feared, were built on lies and betrayal. The whispers weren't just voices, they were screams of the forest's stolen guardians, their pain and desperation echoing through centuries but the most terrifying realization was yet to come. The whispers grew louder, no longer just in my ears but in my head, their pleas turning into commands. I felt the woods calling out, pulling at my very soul, a magnetic force that was both terrifying and irresistible. The whispers promised peace, an end to the suffering. But at what cost? I ran. I ran not out of fear but determination. I had to break the cycle, free the forest, and the spirits trapped within. I had to confront the town with its sinister past and ensure that no future guardian would suffer the same fate. My resolve, however, did not silence the whispers. Instead, they became a terrifying symphony, their voices merging into a single chilling refrain, join us. And as the shadows of the whispering woods stretched out towards me, the chilling wind howling with their sorrowful melody, I knew my fight was only just beginning. The road ahead was long and fraught with danger, and the terrifying whisper of the woods would be my constant companion. But I was ready, ready to face whatever lurked in the shadows. For I was no longer just a forest ranger. I was the guardian, the only hope for my town and the tormented souls of the whispering woods. I've always had the ability to find myself in places where the map ends and the wilderness begins. My home is one of those dots on the map that you'd miss if you blinked. Nestled in the mountains, it's a town so small that calling it a town feels like an overstatement. We're a hundred souls, give or take, and I've only ever laid eyes on about a fifth of them. I recently landed a job in a city that requires a drive through winding mountain roads, a journey that's as treacherous as it is isolating. The road is a mess, potholes the size of craters, stretches of uneven pavement that'll rattle your bones and no shoulder to speak of, just ditches and steep drops that make you wonder if anyone would ever find you if you went over. And then there's the wildlife, raccoons, possums, coyotes, and deer. They saunter across the road like they own it, turning my 30-minute commute into a 40-minute obstacle course. Tonight, as I prepared for work, my ADHD was acting up worse than a rattlesnake in a heat wave. I was all over the place, scattered, unfocused, a whirlwind of half-finished tasks. My work uniform, soaking in the washer, my coffee, cold and forgotten, my eggs, burning in the pan while I stared at them, lost in a maze of thoughts. I finally managed to pull myself together. Uniform in the dryer, I sat down to a meal of cold coffee and slightly burnt eggs. My phone was in my hand and I found myself doom-scrolling through social media, another rabbit hole that I couldn't afford to fall into. But I did. Time slipped away like sand through my fingers. Finally, I snapped out of it. I put on my shoes, hoping the worst of my scatterbrain was behind me. I tossed the dishes into the sink, grabbed my keys, and headed out the door. I knew I had to be careful. Spacing out at home was one thing, but on that road? A momentary lapse could mean hitting a deer or worse driving off a cliff. I sat in my car, gripping the steering wheel, trying to collect my thoughts. I'd seen some meditation techniques on TikTok, yeah, TikTok of all places, and figured it was worth a shot. 
I closed my eyes, took deep breaths, and focused on the here and now. When I felt like I had a grip, I started the car and eased out of the driveway. Driving with full attention was a revelation. I noticed houses I'd never seen, churches that had blended into the background, even a rock quarry that was news to me. It was like driving down a brand new road, and for a moment I felt good. I felt in control. But then it hit me. My uniform. It was still in the dryer. I'd been so focused on the road, so wrapped up in not screwing up, that I'd forgotten the one thing I absolutely needed for work. And just like that, my newfound focus shattered into a million pieces. The realization hit me like a bullet. My uniform was still in the dryer, warm and forgotten. I'd been so hell-bent on keeping my focus on the road that I'd let the most crucial detail slip through the cracks. The irony wasn't lost on me. I'd mastered the road but failed the basics. I was about halfway to work, and the clock was ticking. My options were limited. Either show up to work out of uniform and face the consequences, or turn back home and risk being late. I chose the latter. I had about five minutes of driving before I could safely turn around, and that's when I approached Evans, a small town that was more of a blip on the map than a community. Evans had always been my favorite part of the drive. It was a flat stretch of road surrounded by tree-covered mountains, a stark contrast to the winding uphill battle I usually faced. It reminded me of where I grew up, flat as a pancake but comforting in its simplicity. Evans was the only place to turn around after leaving my house, and as I drove into its boundaries, I felt a sense of calm wash over me. But that calm was short-lived. My mind started to drift again, replaying the events of the evening, cursing myself for forgetting my uniform. Before I knew it, I was pulling into a small mechanic shop at the edge of Evans. It was the only place to turn around, and I figured I could also take a moment to refocus. I parked the car and sat there, gripping the wheel tightly. My mind was a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces, and I needed to find them before I could move forward. I closed my eyes and took deep breaths, mimicking the TikTok meditation techniques that had worked earlier. After a few minutes, I felt like I'd regained some semblance of control. I started the car and made the U-turn, mentally berating myself for the oversight, but grateful for the chance to correct it. As I drove back, my mind kept circling back to that mysterious hill I'd passed earlier. How had I never noticed it before? Was my attention that fragmented? The hill seemed to beckon, a dark enigma that I couldn't shake off. But I pushed the thought aside. I had more immediate concerns, like making it to work on time. I was almost home when I saw it. The rock quarry, the churches, the houses that had caught my attention earlier. But this time they seemed less significant, overshadowed by the looming presence of that hill. It was as if the landscape had shifted, rearranging itself to highlight its most unsettling feature. I pulled into my driveway, rushed inside and grabbed my uniform from the dryer. It was still warm, a small comfort in an evening that had spiraled out of control. I changed quickly, got back into my car, and headed out again, my mind a whirlpool of thoughts and emotions. As I drove past Evans for the second time, I couldn't help but glance at the mechanic shop. It was closed now, a dark silhouette against the night sky. But something told me that it held secrets, secrets that were intertwined with that mysterious hill. And as much as I wanted to ignore it, I knew that I was being pulled into a mystery that I couldn't easily escape. I was back on the road, Uniform on, and a fresh cup of coffee in the cup holder. I'd lost time, but I was still in the game. The road stretched out before me, a winding path through the mountains that I'd come to know like the back of my hand. Except, of course, for that hill. As I approached the spot where I'd noticed it earlier, my heartbeat quickened. There it was, rising up like a dark wave against the night sky. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was out of place like a puzzle piece jammed where it didn't belong. It was steep, lined with trees on both sides, and had a single streetlight at its base that seemed to struggle against the encroaching darkness. I slowed down as I reached the bottom of the hill. Something about it felt off, like static in the air before a storm. I could see the moon in the sky, mostly full, but its light seemed to stop at the edge of the hill, as if swallowed by some unseen force. I hesitated, my foot hovering over the gas pedal. Then I shook off the feeling and started the climb. Halfway up I felt it, a strange smell that seemed to seep into the car. It was a mix of roses, cedar, and honey, 
but with an underlying stench of rotting meat. My stomach churned and I rolled down the window, hoping for a breath of fresh air, but the smell only intensified and I quickly rolled the window back up. I reached the top of the hill and drove on, but my mind was racing. What was that smell? Why did the hill feel so out of place? And why, for the love of God, had I never noticed it before? I was so lost in thought that I almost missed the turnoff for the mechanic shop in Evans. I pulled in, my tires crunching on the gravel. The shop was closed, but the lights were still on, casting a warm glow on the empty parking lot. I sat there for a moment, my mind a swirl of questions and half-formed theories. Then the front door of the shop creaked open, and out walked the owner, a scruffy older man with a weather-beaten face. He approached my car, and I rolled down the window. You all right? He asked, his eyes narrowing as he looked at me. Saw you turn around earlier. Everything okay? I hesitated, unsure of how much to reveal. Thought I'd forgotten something at home, I said finally. Turned out I didn't. Just heading back to work now. He stared at me for a moment, then grinned. A slow, unsettling grin that didn't reach his eyes. I saw you turn around earlier, he repeated. I'm sure whatever you left back there is better off that way. You should just keep going. A chill ran down my spine. What did he mean by that? And what did he know about the hill? I nodded, mumbled a quick, thanks, and pulled out of the parking lot. But as I drove away, his words echoed in my mind, adding another layer of mystery to an already puzzling night. I was being pulled into something dark and inexplicable, and as much as I wanted to turn back, I knew I was already in too deep. I was back on the road, my mind a storm of questions and unease. The mechanic's words had added fuel to the fire of my curiosity, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. I needed answers, and I knew where to find them. That damned hill. I drove past Evans, my eyes darting to the mechanic shop as I passed. It was empty, the lights off, but I could almost feel the owner's eyes on me, watching as I drove by. I shook off the feeling and focused on the road ahead. The hill was coming up, and I needed to be ready. As I approached, my heart pounding in my chest, I saw it, the streetlight at the bottom of the hill, casting its feeble glow on the asphalt. I slowed down, my eyes scanning the darkness beyond. Then I pulled over, my tires crunching on the gravel at the side of the road. I took a deep breath, bracing myself for what was to come, and stepped out of the car. The air was thick with that strange smell, stronger now, almost overpowering. I fought back the urge to gag and started walking, my phone's flashlight cutting through the darkness. The hill seemed steeper now, more menacing, as if it had changed since my last visit. I pushed on, my legs burning with each step, my mind racing with thoughts of what lay ahead. I was about halfway up when I heard it, a rustling in the trees, followed by a low growl that sent shivers down my spine. I froze, my flashlight trembling in my hand, and scanned the darkness. Nothing. I took a shaky breath and continued, my steps quickening as I neared the top. And then I saw it, the hut, dilapidated and crumbling, standing at the edge of the road like a sentinel. I approached cautiously, my flashlight illuminating its broken windows and rotting wood. It looked abandoned, but something told me that appearances could be deceiving. I circled around it, my eyes peeled for any sign of life, and then stepped inside. The air was stale heavy with the smell of decay and dampness. I shone my flashlight around, revealing a small empty room with a dirt floor and walls that looked like they could collapse at any moment. But it was what was in the center of the room that caught my eye. A circle of stones, arranged in a pattern that I couldn't quite make out, surrounded by what looked like dried blood. I stared at it, my mind struggling to make sense of what I was seeing. And then it hit me. The realization that I was standing in the middle of something far darker and more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. I turned and ran, my footsteps echoing in the night, my mind screaming at me to get as far away as possible. I reached my car and fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking as I started the engine and sped away. But as I drove, my eyes glued to the rearview mirror, I knew that I had crossed a line, that I had ventured into a world that I couldn't easily escape. And as much as I wanted to forget what I had seen, to go back to my old life and pretend that none of this had ever happened, I knew that it was too late. I was in too deep, and there was no turning back. 
I had been driving for what felt like hours, my mind a labyrinth of dread and confusion. The hill, the mechanic, the hut, all of it swirled in my thoughts like a dark cloud. I needed to clear my head to make sense of what was happening. So I did what any sane person would do. I pulled into a gas station, parked at the far end of the lot, and just sat there, staring into the void. I thought about calling someone, anyone, to share the burden of what I'd discovered. But who would believe me? Hell, I barely believed it myself. I was about to start the car and head back home when my phone buzzed. A text message. Unknown number. Don't come back to the hill. You won't like what you find. My blood ran cold. Who could have sent that? The mechanic? Some other unseen watcher? I looked around, half expecting to see someone lurking in the shadows, but there was no one. Just the flickering lights of the gas station and the distant hum of the highway. I couldn't just sit there. I needed to do something, anything, to get to the bottom of this. So, I made a decision, one that I knew I might regret. I was going back to the hill, not to explore or to find answers, but to confront whatever it was that was pulling me into its web. The drive back was a blur, the road empty and the night sky devoid of stars. It was as if the world was holding its breath, waiting for what was to come. I reached the hill and parked at the bottom, my heart pounding in my chest like a drum. I took a deep breath, grabbed the flashlight, and stepped out of the car. The smell hit me immediately, stronger now, almost suffocating. I fought back the urge to vomit and started up the hill, my flashlight cutting through the darkness like a knife. I was almost at the top when I heard it, a low growl followed by the sound of footsteps, heavy footsteps coming from behind me. I turned around, my flashlight trembling in my hand, and there it was, the creature. It was massive, its body covered in pale, rotting flesh, its eyes empty sockets that seemed to stare into my soul, and on its head, a human face twisted into a grotesque smile. I was paralyzed, my mind screaming at me to run but my legs refusing to move. And then it spoke, its voice a guttural growl that shook me to my core. You shouldn't have come back. I found my voice, though it was barely a whisper. What are you? It grinned, its teeth razor sharp and stained with blood. Something you can't escape. Something you'll never forget. It took a step toward me, and that's when I broke free from my paralysis. I turned and ran my legs carrying me down the hill faster than I'd ever run before. I reached the car, fumbled with the keys, and sped away, not daring to look back. As I drove, my mind a whirlwind of terror and disbelief, I knew that my life had changed forever. I had stared into the abyss, and the abyss had stared back. And though I didn't know what the future held, one thing was clear. I was in too deep, and there was no way out. I'd been avoiding that road, that hill, like the plague, my new route to work added an extra hour each way, but it was a small price to pay for avoiding whatever that thing was. I even started seeing a therapist to talk about the stress I was under, though I never mentioned the real reason. How could I? It was unbelievable, even to me. Days turned into weeks, and the memory of that nightmarish encounter began to fade, like the remnants of a bad dream upon waking. I almost started to believe it was all in my head, that is, until the package arrived. It was a small, unmarked box left on my doorstep. Inside was a piece of paper with a single sentence written in shaky handwriting. You can't escape what you've seen. Underneath the paper was a small object wrapped in cloth. I unwrapped it and gasped. It was a stone, one of the stones from the circle in the hut. I dropped it as if it were on fire, my heart pounding in my chest. This was impossible. How did it get here? Who sent it? My mind raced through the possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. I had to get rid of it. I grabbed the stone, wrapped it back up, and drove to the nearest river. With a sense of finality, I hurled it into the water and watched as it sank out of sight. That had to be the end of it, right? I drove back home, my nerves frayed, but my spirit lifted. Maybe now I could finally move on. But as I pulled into my driveway, my headlights illuminated something that made my blood run cold. There, sitting on my doorstep, was another box, identical to the first. I got out of the car, my legs shaky, and approached the box. I already knew what was inside, but I had to see it for myself. I opened it up and there it was, the stone back in its place, as if mocking me. But that wasn't the worst part. On the paper, 
a new sentence had appeared below the first. You're part of this now. I looked up, my eyes scanning the darkness, and that's when I saw it. Standing at the edge of my property, barely visible in the shadows, was the creature. It was watching me, its human-like face twisted into that same grotesque smile. And as our eyes met, I heard its voice in my head, as clear as if it were standing next to me. You can't escape. You're part of this now. I ran inside, locked all the doors, and collapsed on the floor, my body shaking uncontrollably. I knew then that there was no escape, no way out. I was part of something far darker and more terrifying than I could ever have imagined, and it was never going to let me go. As I sat there alone in the darkness, I heard a sound that made my skin crawl, a low growl coming from just outside the window. I looked up, and there it was, its face pressed against the glass, its eyes meeting mine, and as I stared into that abyss, I knew that my life as I knew it was over. I was part of this now, and there was no turning back. I've always been a city girl, born and bred on the East Coast, where skyscrapers touch the heavens, and the closest thing to wildlife is a stray cat darting between alleyways. But when Annette, my college roommate and lifelong friend, announced her bachelorette party would be a week-long camping trip in Yosemite National Park, I couldn't say no. Annette was always the adventurous type, the kind of woman who'd choose a hiking trail over a shopping mall any day. Think about it, Laura, she'd said, her eyes gleaming with excitement. A week under the stars, surrounded by the most breathtaking scenery you can imagine, it's going to be epic. So here I was, crammed into a rented SUV with Annette, Sarah, Emily, and Megan, driving through the heart of California. The landscape changed as we moved, from the sprawling suburbs to rolling hills, and finally to the jagged peaks of the Sierra Nevada. I felt a sense of awe creep over me, a feeling I hadn't experienced since I was a kid visiting the ocean for the first time. We reached the park in the late afternoon, the sun casting long shadows over the valley as we drove in. The first sight of Yosemite Valley was like stepping into a cathedral, a sacred place where every towering cliff and cascading waterfall felt like an altar. Even Annette, who'd seen her fair share of national parks, was speechless. We're not staying down here, she finally said, breaking the silence. Too touristy. We're heading up to the high country. Trust me, it's the real Yosemite experience. I glanced at Sarah, Emily, and Megan in the rearview mirror. We were all city girls, more accustomed to the concrete jungle than an actual one. But we nodded in agreement, captivated by Annette's enthusiasm. The drive up to the high country was a winding journey through narrow roads and hairpin turns. By the time we reached our campsite near the iconic Half Dome, the sun had dipped below the horizon and the first stars were appearing in the sky. We set up our tents in the fading light each of us claiming a spot on the forest floor. Five's an odd number for tents, Annette observed. They're all two-person tents. Laura, you okay bunking alone? I hesitated for a moment, my mind flashing back to every horror movie I'd ever seen. But then I looked around at the towering redwoods, the distant peaks silhouetted against the night sky, and felt a sense of peace wash over me. Yeah, I'm good, I said, unrolling my sleeping bag inside my tent. It's not like we're really alone out here anyway. Annette laughed. That's the spirit. Just wait, Laura. This trip is going to change your life. As I zipped up my tent and settled in for the night, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. It was as if the forest itself was watching us, its ancient eyes hidden in the shadows. I told myself it was just my imagination, the city girl and me not used to the sounds and sights of the wilderness. But as I lay there, listening to the distant howl of a coyote and the rustling of leaves in the wind, I couldn't help but wonder what else was out there, in the dark, watching and waiting. And so began our dream vacation, a journey into the heart of one of America's most beautiful landscapes. But as I would soon discover, even the most breathtaking beauty can hide the darkest secrets. Sleep didn't come easy that first night. Every rustle of leaves, every distant animal call, seemed to reverberate through my tent like a warning. I lay there, eyes wide open, staring at the nylon ceiling as if it could offer some sort of protection. When dawn finally broke, 
I felt more exhausted than when I'd crawled into my sleeping bag. I unzipped my tent and stepped out into the morning light. Annette and the others were already up, gathered around the remnants of last night's campfire. Their faces were tense, eyes darting around the campsite. Morning, I mumbled, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. What's going on? Something got into our supplies, Annette said, her voice tinged with frustration. Tore right through the cloth bag and scattered food wrappers everywhere. I looked over at the hanging bear bag, still intact, swaying gently from the tree branch where we'd hoisted it. But the bear bag's fine. How's that possible? Annette shrugged. I don't know. Maybe it was a raccoon or something. Either way, we need to clean this up and report it to the park rangers. We spent the next hour picking up the scattered remnants of our food supplies. The mood was somber, the earlier excitement replaced by a sense of vulnerability. We were no longer just visitors in this wilderness. We were intruders, and something had marked its territory. After cleaning up, we made our way to the nearest ranger station to report the incident. The ranger behind the desk listened to our story with a practiced air of concern, nodding at all the right moments. Sounds like you had a run-in with a nuisance bear, he said, filling out a report. Best to move your campsite. We'll issue you a permit for a different spot. A bear? I asked, my voice tinged with disbelief. Wouldn't we have heard it? Seen it? The ranger looked up, meeting my eyes for the first time. Bears can be surprisingly stealthy, especially if they're used to human food. Don't take any chances. Move your camp. We thanked him and left, a new camping permit in hand. The drive to the new campsite was quiet, each of us lost in our thoughts. When we finally arrived and began setting up our tents again, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was as if the forest had eyes, and they were fixed squarely on us. Hey, you okay? Annette asked, snapping me out of my reverie. Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just a little on edge, I guess. Annette chuckled. You're such a city girl. This is all part of the adventure. Trust me, there's nothing out here that wants to hurt us. I wanted to believe her, I really did. But as we settled into our new campsite, the sun dipping below the horizon and casting long shadows through the trees, I couldn't escape the feeling that something was out there, lurking in the dark. And so we bedded down for another night, a thin layer of nylon the only thing separating us from the untamed wilderness beyond. But as I lay there, listening to the sounds of the night, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone, and whatever was out there, it knew we were here. Day four rolled around, and the tension from the previous day's incident had somewhat dissipated. Annette and the girls were all set to go canoeing on a nearby lake. I opted out. My body was sore and my mind was still reeling from the unsettling events. I needed a break, a moment to breathe. I'm going to stay back and sunbathe, I told Annette as they prepared to leave. She looked at me, her eyes narrowing slightly. You sure you're okay? Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just need some me time, you know? Annette nodded, her face relaxing. All right, enjoy your day. We'll catch up later. I watched them leave, their laughter and chatter fading into the distance. I was alone, but it was a different kind of solitude, one I had chosen. I spread my towel on the sandy shore of the lake, put on my sunglasses, and lay down. The sun felt good on my skin, and for a moment, I forgot about the lurking fears and unsettling noises. I was lost in the beauty of the place, the way the sunlight danced on the water, the distant sound of birdsong. That's when I noticed him. A man, around my age, sunbathing a few yards away. He had a rugged look about him, with hazel eyes that seemed to sparkle in the sunlight. Our eyes met and he smiled. Beautiful day, isn't it? He said, breaking the silence. I smiled back. It is, absolutely perfect. He got up and walked over, extending his hand. I'm Rowan, Laura, I replied, shaking his hand. We got to talking. Rowan was from Colorado, an avid hiker and outdoorsman. He'd been coming to Yosemite every summer since he was a kid. We talked about the beauty of the park, our favorite trails, and the serenity that comes from being in nature. Somehow being out here makes all the problems of the real world seem insignificant, don't you think? He said, his eyes meeting mine. I nodded. I know what you mean. It's like an escape. Our conversation shifted to the strange occurrences at our camp. I told him about the raided food supplies, the move to a new campsite, and the unsettling feeling of being watched. Rowan's face grew serious. Sounds like a mountain lion to me. A mountain lion? I asked, my heart skipping a beat. Yeah, he said. 
They're elusive creatures. You'll only see one if it wants to be seen. If you can't see it, that's when you should be worried. His words sent a chill down my spine. The thought of a mountain lion stalking us was terrifying, but somehow coming from Rowan, it felt like a warning, not a threat. Be careful out here, he said, his eyes locking onto mine. Yosemite is beautiful, but it's also wild, and in the wilderness, you're never truly alone. As he spoke, I felt a strange sense of comfort. Maybe it was his confidence, or maybe it was the sincerity in his eyes. Either way, for the first time since arriving at Yosemite, I felt like maybe, just maybe, everything was going to be all right. Would you like to have dinner tonight? He asked, breaking the silence. I looked at him, my heart pounding in my chest. I'd love to, I said, and for a moment all my fears seemed to melt away. Dinner with Rowan was like a scene from a movie. We met at one of the park's restaurants, a rustic place with wooden beams and a roaring fireplace. The atmosphere was cozy, the food surprisingly good. Rowan was charming, attentive, and funny. For a few hours, I forgot about the lurking fears and unsettling events. I was just a woman on a date with a man who seemed almost too good to be true. As the evening wore on, Rowan suggested we head back to his campsite. I've got some wine back there, he said, his eyes meeting mine. What do you say? I hesitated for a moment, my mind flashing back to the warnings about mountain lions and the strange occurrences at our camp. But then I looked at Rowan, his eyes filled with warmth and sincerity, and I pushed those fears aside. Sure, I said smiling, let's go. We left the restaurant and made our way up the winding trail to his campsite. The night was clear, the sky filled with stars, and the air crisp with the scent of pine. As we walked, Rowan slipped his arm around my waist, pulling me close. It felt good, comforting. I let myself believe that maybe, just maybe, everything really was going to be all right. We reached his campsite, a secluded spot surrounded by towering trees. Rowan lit a campfire and we sat on a log, sipping wine and talking. The firelight flickered on his face, casting shadows that made him look both boyish and rugged at the same time. I'm a little cold, I said, shivering slightly. Rowan looked at me, his eyes twinkling. Would you like a sleeping bag? I nodded, standing up. I'll get it, I said, walking towards his tent. That's when I heard him. Laura, wait. I unzipped the tent and froze. There, in the sleeping bag, was a woman. Her auburn hair was spread out like a halo, her face peaceful in sleep. I turned, my face flushed with anger and humiliation. You have a girlfriend, and you brought me here? Rowan's face was a mask of confusion and panic. Laura, it's not what you think. She's not... I don't care, I yelled, cutting him off. I can't believe I fell for this. I turned and stormed off, my heart pounding with betrayal and rage. Rowan called after me, but I didn't look back. I just wanted to get as far away from him as possible. As I made my way through the dark forest, my mind was a whirlwind of emotion. How could I have been so stupid, so naive? But as I walked, something else began to creep into my consciousness. The sound of footsteps, soft but deliberate, echoing my own. The rustling of leaves, the snapping of twigs. The feeling of eyes on me, watching, following. I stopped, my heart in my throat. Rowan's words echoed in my mind. In the wilderness, you're never truly alone. And as I stood there, in the dark, I realized just how terrifyingly true that was. I was disoriented, my mind clouded by betrayal and the wine from dinner. But as I stood there in the dark, the reality of my situation began to sink in. I was alone, in the middle of the wilderness, and something was stalking me. I reached for my phone fumbling in the dark. No service, but the flashlight app would have to do. I turned it on, the beam cutting through the darkness, revealing nothing but trees and shadows. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my racing heart, and started to walk. That's when I heard it again. The soft, deliberate footsteps, mirroring my own. The rustling of leaves, closer now. My skin prickled with fear, my senses on high alert. I remembered Rowan's warning. A mountain lion will only be seen when it wants to be seen. I turned off my flashlight, plunging myself back into darkness. My eyes strained, trying to adjust, searching for any sign of movement. And then I saw it, a shadow, darker than the rest, moving between the trees. I felt a surge of adrenaline, my fight-or-flight instincts kicking in. I chose flight. Ignoring the voice in my head telling me not to run, 
I bolted, my feet pounding against the forest floor, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I didn't know where I was going, didn't have a plan. All I knew was that I needed to put as much distance between me and whatever was stalking me as possible. I dodged trees, leapt over rocks, my body fueled by pure adrenaline, but I couldn't keep it up forever. My legs began to ache, my lungs burning with each breath. In a desperate bid for safety, I spotted a redwood tree with low-hanging branches and scrambled up, my hands gripping the bark, pulling myself higher and higher until I was at least ten feet off the ground. I sat there, my body trembling, my eyes scanning the forest below. I heard it before I saw it, the soft, deliberate footsteps circling the tree, and then silence. I held my breath, my body tense, waiting. Minutes passed, each one feeling like an eternity, and then just as suddenly as it had started, it was over. The footsteps moved away, fading into the distance. I waited, my body rigid until the first rays of dawn began to filter through the trees. Only then did I allow myself to climb down, my legs shaky, my entire body sore. I had no idea where I was, but I knew I needed to find my way back. Using the morning light as my guide, I started to walk. Hours passed. I was dehydrated, exhausted, and on the verge of collapse when I finally stumbled upon a trail. I followed it, each step a struggle, until I saw something that made my heart soar, a sign pointing the way to the campgrounds. I quickened my pace, my body running on fumes but fueled by the promise of safety. And then, just as I rounded a bend, I saw them, Annette and the others, their faces filled with relief and disbelief. We thought you were dead, Annette said, rushing over to hug me. I wanted to cry, to laugh, to collapse. But all I could think about was the shadow in the forest, the feeling of being hunted. And as I stood there, surrounded by friends, I realized something. I may have escaped, but I would never be free. I was back at camp, but the relief was short-lived. Annette's face was ashen, her eyes red from crying. Two uniformed officers stood nearby, their expression stern. We need to talk, one of them said, motioning for me to follow. They led me to a makeshift table where a couple of photos were laid out. The first was of Rowan, or as they called him, David Michael Whittle. The second was of a woman with auburn hair, the same woman I'd seen in the sleeping bag. Do you recognize these individuals? The officer asked. Yes, I said, my voice shaky. The man told me his name was Rowan. We had dinner last night. The woman was in his tent. The officer's face hardened. That woman is Alexis Fletcher, a park employee. She's been missing for a week. The man you dined with was the last person seen talking to her. We found her body this morning. She was murdered. My stomach churned, my head spinning. But I saw her in his tent. She was sleeping. The officer shook his head. She couldn't have been sleeping, ma'am. She was dead. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. I had been inches away from a murderer, from his victim. I felt sick, violated. We need to search your camp, the officer continued. This man is dangerous, and we have reason to believe he might have been stalking you. The search turned up nothing, but the damage was done. The trip was cut short, everyone too shaken to continue. We packed up, our movements robotic, our conversations strained. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, the terror that had gripped me in the forest. As we drove out of Yosemite, I looked back at the towering trees, the majestic peaks, and felt a shiver run down my spine. This place had promised an escape, a refuge. Instead, it had become a hunting ground, a place of nightmares. Weeks passed, but the fear remained. I triple-checked my locks at night, jumped at every sound. My therapist said it was PTSD, that it would take time to heal. But deep down, I knew the truth. I would never be the same. Then one night, as I was lying in bed, I heard it. A soft, deliberate footstep outside my window. My heart stopped, my body frozen in terror. I mustered the courage to look, pulling back the curtain just an inch. And there he was, standing in the moonlight. Rowan, or David, or whatever his name was. His eyes met mine, and he smiled. That same charming smile that had once made me feel special. As I reached for my phone to call 911, I noticed something in his hand. It was a photo, the same one the police had shown me. Only this time it wasn't just Alexis in the picture. It was me, standing next to her, both of us smiling, unaware. My scream was swallowed by the night, a chilling realization settling in. 
I had escaped, but he had found me, and in that moment, I knew. The hunt was far from over. I've always had a knack for finding trouble, or maybe trouble has a way of finding me. Either way, when I told my folks about the camping trip to Kosia National Park, their faces turned a shade paler. Romania isn't exactly the poster child for safety, and they knew it. My mom's eyes narrowed, a sure sign she was about to launch into one of her cautionary tales. Romania, you know people disappear there, right? Kidnapped, murdered, who knows what else, she said, her voice tinged with that maternal worry I'd come to know so well. My dad chimed in, your mother's right, why can't you pick a safer place? Somewhere without a reputation for, well, you know. I had my counter-argument ready. We're staying in a hotel, okay? Right near the park. It's a tourist area. What could go wrong? The lie slid off my tongue easier than I'd like to admit. A hotel stay was far from our rugged, back-to-nature plan, but it was the only way to get them off my back. They exchanged glances, and I could see the gears turning in their heads, weighing the odds. Finally, they nodded, their faces still etched with concern. All right, but promise you'll be careful my mom said, her eyes searching mine for sincerity. I promise, I replied, crossing my fingers behind my back. Two days later, my boyfriend and I were on a train departing from Bucharest, our backpacks stuffed with everything we'd need for a four-day adventure in the wilderness. The train was a relic, its compartments worn and tired, but it was our ticket to freedom. As we settled into our compartment, I couldn't help but feel a sense of elation. The compartment was empty, a rare luxury on Romanian trains. I looked at my boyfriend, his eyes mirroring my excitement. Looks like we've got the place to ourselves, I said, stretching my legs out. He grinned. Yeah, let's enjoy it while it lasts. We both knew the solitude wouldn't last long. Romanian trains are notorious for being overcrowded. But for those first few minutes, it felt like the universe was giving us a break, a small pocket of peace before whatever awaited us at Cozia National Park. As the train chugged along, the landscape outside the window shifted from the urban sprawl of Bucharest to the rolling hills and dense forests that make up much of Romania's countryside. I felt a sense of anticipation building within me, each mile taking us closer to the unknown. And then, just when I'd started to think we'd won the lottery with our empty compartment, the door slid open. A man stepped in, followed by a German shepherd that looked more like a wolf than a dog. My heart sank a little, but I had no idea just how much that encounter would change everything. As the door closed behind them, sealing us in with our new companions, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were on the edge of something, a precipice beyond which lay things I couldn't yet see or understand. And whether it was the thrill of adventure or a premonition of dangers to come, I knew one thing for sure. This trip was going to be anything but ordinary. The door slid shut with a finality that made my stomach churn. The man who just entered was tall, his face unreadable, framed by a curtain of dark hair. His eyes, however, were what caught my attention, cold, calculating, as if sizing us up. The German shepherd at his side was equally unsettling, its eyes almost human in their intelligence. Mind if we join you? The man's voice was smooth, almost too smooth, like river stones worn down by years of flowing water. Of course not, I replied, forcing a smile. It's a public train, after all. He nodded and took the seat across from us, his dog obediently settling at his feet. There was something about that dog, a stillness, an intensity, that made me uneasy. What's his name? I asked, nodding toward the dog, trying to break the ice. Yuchi Gashul, he said, his eyes never leaving mine. The killer? I translated, my eyes widening. That's an unusual name for a dog. He's trained to kill. It's what he's good at the man replied, his voice devoid of emotion. I glanced at my boyfriend, who shot me a look that clearly said, let's not go there. I took the hint. So, you're familiar with Kosia National Park? I ventured, steering the conversation toward safer ground. The man's eyes lit up, a spark of enthusiasm breaking through his otherwise stoic demeanor. Ah, yes, beautiful place. You should visit the monastery at the base of the mountain. And don't miss the Latery Shore, a waterfall with a cave behind it. There's also a local restaurant you might want to try. His sudden chattiness was disconcerting, but also a relief. 
Maybe he was just a nature enthusiast, I thought, trying to reassure myself. Thanks for the tips, I said, genuinely grateful for the information. We're new to the area, so any advice is welcome. He nodded, seemingly satisfied, and then fell silent. The rest of the journey passed in an uncomfortable quiet, punctuated only by the rhythmic clatter of the train on the tracks. I found myself counting the minutes, eager to reach our destination and put some distance between us and our unsettling travel companion. Finally, the train began to slow, the scenery outside the window coalescing into the recognizable shapes of buildings and roads. We had arrived. I felt a sense of relief wash over me, as if I'd been holding my breath and could finally exhale. We're here, I said, looking at my boyfriend, then back at the man and his dog. It was nice meeting you. The man nodded, his eyes unreadable once again. Enjoy your stay, he said, his voice tinged with something I couldn't quite place. Was it a warning, a threat, or just my imagination running wild? As we grabbed our backpacks and stepped off the train, I took one last look back. The man and his dog were gone, vanished as if they'd never been there at all. It was as if the universe had swallowed them whole, leaving me to wonder if they were ever real to begin with. And yet, as we made our way toward Kosha National Park, I couldn't shake the feeling that our paths would cross again. And next time, I feared, the stakes might be much higher. The train station was a blur of activity, a hive of travelers and locals, each absorbed in their own world. We stepped off the platform, our backpacks heavy but our spirits light. The mysterious man and his dog were behind us, or so I hoped. Now it was just us in the wilderness, a blank canvas waiting to be painted with our adventures. We started our trek toward Kosha National Park, the map in my boyfriend's hand our only guide. The landscape was breathtaking, rolling hills giving way to dense forests, the air tinged with the earthy scent of pine and damp soil. It was a different world, far removed from the hustle and bustle of Bucharest, and I felt a sense of freedom I hadn't felt in years. That's when we heard it, a soft whimper, a cry of distress that seemed to echo through the trees. My boyfriend looked at me, his eyes saying, don't even think about it. But I was already moving toward the sound, my instincts overriding any sense of caution. And there he was, a chubby puppy, his fur a patchwork of white and brown, lying in the middle of the road as if he'd given up on life. His eyes met mine, and in that moment, I knew our trip had just taken an unexpected turn. We can't leave him, I said, already scooping the puppy into my arms. My boyfriend sighed, a mixture of resignation and affection. What are we going to call him? Rudolph, I said, looking into the puppy's eyes. He looks like a Rudolph. Just when we thought our adventure had reached its quota of surprises, we heard another whimper, this one softer, more desperate. Following the sound, we found another puppy, probably Rudolph's sister, half submerged in a nearby river. Someone had tried to drown her, a thought that made my blood boil. We're taking her too, I said, my voice leaving no room for argument. And so, we became a party of four, two humans and two puppies, each with a story to tell. We continued our trek, our new companions adding a layer of complexity, but also a sense of purpose to our journey. As we walked, we came upon the monastery the man on the train had mentioned. It was an imposing structure, its stone walls weathered by time, a testament to faith and endurance. We wanted to go in, but the stern look from the priest told us that our four-legged friends were not welcome. Let's keep moving, my boyfriend said, his eyes scanning the map. We circled the monastery, taking in its gardens and the sense of peace that seemed to permeate the air. Soon, we reached the base of the mountain, the first leg of our journey complete. That's when we saw it, the Three Anitza, a small religious landmark tucked away in the woods. It was a simple structure, a roof and four walls, but inside was an icon and a Bible. I picked up the Bible, its pages torn and weathered, and saw the words that sent a chill down my spine, I will find you. I looked at my boyfriend, then back at our two puppies. We were a long way from home, in a land of beauty and mystery, and I couldn't shake the feeling that our adventure was just beginning. But as I closed the Bible and we resumed our trek, I also knew one thing, we weren't alone. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows that danced and flickered in the dying light. 
We had set up camp near the Thryanitsa, its religious icon and that haunting Bible now a stone's throw away. I tried to shake off the unease that clung to me like a second skin, but it was easier said than done. We should get the fire going, my boyfriend said, breaking the silence that had settled over us. I nodded, my thoughts still on the words I'd read in that Bible. I will find you. Who had written them? And why? Questions swirled in my mind, each unanswered, each adding a layer of complexity to an already puzzling situation. As the first flames of our campfire flickered to life, casting a warm glow on our makeshift home, I felt a momentary sense of relief. Fire has a way of doing that, pushing back the darkness, both literal and metaphorical. But that relief was short-lived. A guttural grunt echoed through the forest, a sound so out of place it made my heart skip a beat. My boyfriend and I locked eyes, a silent communication that needed no words. Something was out there, watching us, studying us. Did you hear that? I whispered, my voice barely rising above the crackling of the fire. He nodded, his hand inching toward the pocket knife he always carried. Stay close, he said, his eyes scanning the darkness beyond the firelight. And then we saw it, a slithery figure, its form barely discernible, darting between the trees. It moved with a speed that seemed unnatural, its outline blurring and shifting as if not entirely of this world. What the hell was that? My boyfriend muttered, his voice tinged with disbelief. I don't know, I replied, my mind racing, but it's gone now. We both knew that was wishful thinking. Whatever it was, it was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to reveal itself. As if on cue, the fire let out a series of sparks, each one soaring into the night sky before disappearing into the forest. But something was off. The sparks didn't fade away like they should have. Instead, they seemed to hang in the air, their glow intensifying, changing color from a hellish red to an eerie green. Are you seeing this? I asked, my eyes fixed on the spectacle unfolding before us. My boyfriend nodded, his face a mask of confusion and awe. I've never seen anything like it. It was as if the fire was beckoning us, urging us to venture deeper into the forest, into the heart of the unknown, and for a moment I was tempted, tempted to follow the sparks, to unravel the mystery that had ensnared us from the moment we'd stepped off that train. But then I looked at the trees surrounding our camp, their trunks marked by shapes that looked eerily like eyes, hundreds of them, all staring at us, all watching our every move. We're not alone, I whispered my voice tinged with a fear I couldn't quite shake. My boyfriend took my hand, his grip firm and reassuring. No, we're not, he said, his eyes meeting mine. But whatever's out there, we'll face it together. And as the fire continued its ghostly dance, casting shadows that seemed to come alive in the darkness, I knew he was right. We would face it, whatever it was, and come what may. But as the night stretched on, each minute an eternity, I couldn't help but wonder, what were we up against, and would we make it through the night? The fire had dwindled to embers, its once vibrant flames now reduced to a soft glow. My boyfriend had dozed off, his breathing steady, a counterpoint to the erratic rhythm of my own heart. The puppies, Rudolph and his sister, were curled up beside him, their tiny bodies rising and falling in sync with his breaths. I should have felt comforted, but I didn't. The night was too still too quiet, as if holding its breath in anticipation. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes, a sound so soft it could have been the wind. But I knew better. My eyes darted to the spot, my body tensing, every instinct screaming at me to run, to hide, to do something. But I was paralyzed, caught in the grip of a fear so primal it defied logic. I nudged my boyfriend awake, my fingers trembling as they touched his arm. Listen. I whispered, my voice barely audible. He stirred, his eyes meeting mine, and in that instant he knew. Something was out there, something that didn't belong, something that had no place in the natural order of things. We both peered through a small opening in the tent, our eyes straining to make sense of the darkness. And then we saw it, a human head, emerging from the very bush that had caught my attention. Slowly, almost painfully, the figure revealed itself its body lit by the moon and the dying embers of our fire. It was him, the man from the train, his face twisted into a grotesque mask, his eyes devoid of humanity, 
and he was naked, his body exposed as if daring us to look, to bear witness to his madness. My heart was pounding, each beat a drum roll in my ears, drowning out all other sounds. The man moved closer to our fire, his hands reaching down to pick up branches and rocks, methodically dismantling the very thing that had given us a semblance of security. And then, as if satisfied with his work, he retreated, his body disappearing into the bush, swallowed by the darkness. I looked at my boyfriend, my eyes wide with disbelief. Did that just happen? I asked, my voice shaky. He nodded, his face pale, his eyes haunted. It did, and we need to do something about it. We unzipped the tent, our movements cautious, deliberate. The fire was out, its embers cold, its warmth a distant memory. We gathered more wood, our hands working in unison, each piece a building block in our fortress against the unknown. As the fire roared back to life, its flames licking the night sky, I felt a sense of defiance wash over me. We were still here, still standing, still fighting. But as I looked into the flames, their dance a mesmerizing blend of light and shadow, I knew we weren't out of the woods yet, literally and figuratively. We'll stay awake, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with resolve. We'll keep this fire going and we'll make it through the night. I nodded, my eyes meeting his, and in that moment, I knew we would. We had to, because whatever was out there, whatever had visited us on this godforsaken night, it wasn't done with us yet. And as the fire cast its glow on our faces, revealing but also concealing, I couldn't help but wonder, what would the dawn bring? And were we ready to face it? The first rays of dawn should have been a relief, a promise of a new day and an end to the night's terrors. But the sky remained dark, as if the sun itself had forsaken this patch of Romanian wilderness. The fire was our only source of light, its flames now more necessity than comfort. We should have seen daylight by now, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with an unease that mirrored my own. I nodded, my eyes scanning the horizon for any sign of morning's approach. But there was nothing, just an endless expanse of darkness that seemed to stretch on forever. That's not possible, I whispered, my voice barely rising above the crackling of the fire. The sun has to rise. It's just how it works. He looked at me, his eyes filled with a fear that needed no words. Maybe we're not where we think we are, he said, his voice heavy with implication. Before I could respond, a sound pierced the air, a howl, guttural and primal, echoing through the trees like a death knell. It was answered by another, and then another, a chorus of voices that seemed to come from all directions at once. They're closing in, my boyfriend said, his hand gripping the pocket knife as if it could ward off the impending doom. The puppies, Rudolph and his sister, were awake now their eyes wide, their bodies trembling. They seemed to sense the danger, their instincts a warning we couldn't ignore. And then, as if on cue, the figures emerged from the forest, their forms barely visible in the firelight. Wolves, at least half a dozen, their eyes glowing an unnatural red, their snouts pulled back in a snarl. But there was something off about them, something that defied explanation. They moved in unison, their steps perfectly synchronized, as if controlled by a single malevolent will. We need to go now, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with desperation. I nodded, my body already in motion, my mind racing through scenarios, each more terrifying than the last. We grabbed the puppies, their tiny forms pressed against our chests, and made a run for it, our feet pounding the earth in a frantic rhythm. But we didn't get far. A figure stepped into our path, his form illuminated by the dying embers of our fire. It was the man from the train, his eyes now a glowing red that matched those of the wolves, his grin a grotesque parody of human emotion. You can't run from what's in you, he said, his voice a low growl that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. And as the wolves closed in, their eyes fixed on us, their snouts dripping with anticipation, I realized the horrifying truth. We were never meant to leave this place this patch of wilderness that existed outside of time, outside of reality. We were part of it now, part of its eternal darkness, its insatiable hunger. As the first set of jaws closed around my arm, its bite a searing pain that shot through my body, I let out a scream that seemed to echo through the ages, a final, desperate cry that went unanswered. Because in that moment, 
As the darkness closed in, I knew there would be no dawn, no escape, no end to the nightmare that had claimed us. And as my vision blurred, the last thing I saw was the man from the train, his eyes glowing brighter than ever, his grin widening in triumph. I have a habit of daydreaming, not the kind where you're half listening to a teacher drone on about algebra while you're mentally on a beach somewhere. No, I'm talking about daydreams so vivid you can smell the salt in the air, feel the sand between your toes, and hear the waves crashing. It's a gift and a curse, really. A gift because it makes long road trips bearable, and a curse because sometimes the line between what's in my head and what's real gets a little too blurry for comfort. We were packed into our new RV a hulking beast of a vehicle that my dad was still figuring out how to maneuver. Best investment I ever made, he declared, gripping the wheel like he was wrestling an alligator. Mom was in the passenger seat, her eyes scanning the road ahead, probably contemplating the wisdom of letting dad drive this monstrosity. I was in the back, my younger sister next to me, her nose buried in some teen romance novel. Florida, here we come, dad announced his voice tinged with that kind of forced enthusiasm parents muster when they're trying to make something sound more fun than it actually is. We'd been driving for hours, the landscape outside shifting from the familiar to the increasingly foreign. The sky was a dull gray, the kind that makes you forget the sun ever existed. But we were heading south, towards warmth and sunshine, and that was enough to keep everyone's spirits up. Eventually, we pulled into a rest stop near Lake City. The place was a hive of activity, buzzing with travelers, truckers, and families with screaming kids. All right, everyone out, Dad said, parking the RV with a finality that suggested he was glad to be done with driving, even if it was just for a little while. I stepped out and stretched, my muscles aching from hours of sitting. The air smelled like gasoline and fast food, a combination that was oddly comforting. I made my way to the vending machines, my eyes scanning the options. Just as I was about to make my selection, a man sidled up next to me. He was middle-aged but fit, his skin tanned to a shade that suggested he spent a lot of time outdoors. I like those Snickers bars the best. Leave me a couple, would you? He said, flashing a grin that was all teeth. Sure, I replied, making small talk as I punched in the numbers on the vending machine. His name was Alex, he told me, a businessman from Arizona. Everyone needs a vacation, he said, waving away my questions about what brought him to Florida. Something about the way he looked at me made my skin crawl. It was like he was sizing me up, cataloging details for some purpose I couldn't fathom. I felt like a specimen under a microscope, and I didn't like it one bit. Time to go. Mom's voice cut through the air, pulling me out of my thoughts. Nice meeting you, I said, taking a step back from Alex. The pleasure was all mine, he replied, his eyes locking onto mine for a moment too long. As I walked back to the RV, a shiver ran down my spine. Something about that encounter felt off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Shaking off the uneasy feeling, I climbed back into the RV. Little did I know that wouldn't be the last I'd see of Alex, and the line between my vivid daydreams and reality was about to get a whole lot blurrier. The RV rumbled into the campground, a patchwork of tents, trailers, and outdoor enthusiasts trying to escape the grind. Dad backed the behemoth into our rented lot with the precision of a surgeon, or at least he liked to think so. Like a glove, he announced, stepping out of the driver's seat as if he'd just landed a plane. Mom was already flipping through a campground brochure, her eyes darting over the activities listed. There's a nature trail that leads to a conservation area, she said, looking up. We should explore it. I was already ahead of her, my new digital camera in hand. I was thinking the same thing, I said, eager to capture the raw beauty of Florida's wilderness. My sister rolled her eyes, more interested in the campground's Wi-Fi password than the great outdoors. We're coming too, Dad declared, pulling out a pair of binoculars from an overhead compartment. Can't let you have all the fun? I hid my disappointment. I'd been looking forward to some alone time, maybe even sneaking off to smoke a bowl or two. But with my parents tagging along, that plan was as good as dead. We set off on the trail, a narrow path that wound through towering trees and thick underbrush. The air was heavy with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves, a smell I found oddly comforting. Birds sang from hidden perches, 
their melodies filling the air. Dad was in full explorer mode, his binoculars pressed to his eyes as he scanned the treetops for exotic birds. Mom was a few steps ahead, her pace brisk, her eyes set on the path ahead. I lagged behind, my camera ready, waiting for the perfect shot. We reached a fork in the trail, a wooden sign pointing the way to the conservation area. This way, Mom said, leading us down the path. As we walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. My eyes darted from tree to tree, half expecting to see Alex lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing, just the rustling of leaves and the distant sound of a creek. We reached the conservation area, a sprawling expanse of wetlands that stretched as far as the eye could see. Wow, I breathed, lifting my camera to capture the scene. Beautiful, isn't it? Mom said, her eyes taking in the view. It's something, Dad agreed, lowering his binoculars. I snapped a few photos, my finger pressing the shutter as I tried to capture the essence of the place. It was wild, untamed, a slice of Florida that had somehow escaped the relentless march of progress. As I looked through the lens, my mind began to drift. I imagined the people who had once called this place home, their lives intertwined with the land in ways I could barely comprehend. It was a daydream I knew, but it felt real, almost tangible. And then, just as I was about to lose myself in the fantasy, I heard it, a voice calling out from the trail behind us. I lowered my camera, my heart sinking as I turned to see who it was. It was a voice I recognized, a voice I'd hoped I'd never hear again. And as I stood there, my camera hanging limply from my neck, I knew that the line between my daydreams and reality was about to be shattered. We were on a footbridge that spanned a murky stretch of swamp water, the wooden planks creaking under our weight. Dad was squinting at a map, trying to figure out where we were, while Mom was busy snapping photos of a heron in the distance. I was leaning on the railing, my eyes scanning the water below for any sign of alligators. Look at this, Dad said, pointing to a spot on the map. There's a lookout tower not far from here. We should check it out. Before I could respond, a movement in the water caught my eye. A ripple, then a flash of scales, and for a brief moment I saw it. An alligator, lurking just below the surface. Holy moly, that's a big one, Dad exclaimed, following my gaze. I raised my camera, but the creature had already vanished, leaving only a trail of bubbles in its wake. Missed it, I muttered, lowering the camera in disappointment. Just then, I heard footsteps approaching. I turned and felt my blood run cold. It was him, Alex, the man from the rest stop. He was talking to a park ranger, a woman who looked utterly captivated by whatever he was saying. Come on, kiddo, Mom said, tugging at my arm. Let's go get eaten alive in this dirty damn swamp. I let her pull me away, but my eyes stayed on Alex. He was watching me, his gaze unsettlingly intense. As we walked off, I saw him say something to the park ranger, who then handed him a red hairband she'd been wearing. The moment we were out of earshot, I turned to my parents. I think we should head back, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Why, we're just getting started, Dad protested. I don't feel well, I lied, hoping they'd take the bait. Mom looked at me, her eyes narrowing. You're not trying to sneak off and smoke that stuff again, are you? No, Mom, I swear, I just don't feel good. She sighed, her face softening. All right, let's head back. As we retraced our steps, I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was about to happen. My mind kept drifting back to Alex, to the way he'd looked at me, to the red hairband he'd taken from the park ranger. It all felt wrong, like pieces of a puzzle I couldn't quite put together. We reached the RV and I practically sprinted inside, locking the door behind me. My parents exchanged puzzled glances but didn't say anything. I collapsed on the couch, my heart pounding in my chest. For a moment I considered telling them about Alex, about the unsettling feeling he gave me, but then I thought better of it. They'd think I was paranoid, overreacting, so I kept it to myself, hoping I was wrong, hoping it was all just a figment of my overactive imagination, but deep down, I knew it wasn't. Something was off, something I couldn't quite put my finger on, and as I sat there, staring out the window at the fading light, I had the sinking feeling that our trip to Florida had just taken a dark and dangerous turn. The next morning, I woke up with a sense of dread hanging over me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, that we were in danger. I tried to push the thought out of my mind as I stepped out of the RV. 
the Florida sun already beating down. Morning, sleepyhead, Mom greeted, flipping pancakes on a portable grill. Want some breakfast? I forced a smile. Sure, thanks. As I sat down to eat, my eyes scanned the campground. Families were out and about, kids riding bikes, parents setting up lawn chairs. Everything seemed normal, but the feeling of unease wouldn't go away. We're going to the beach today, Dad announced, sipping his coffee. You coming? I hesitated. The thought of being out in the open made me nervous, but staying behind alone seemed even worse. Yeah, I'll come, I finally said. We packed up and headed to the beach, a short drive from the campground. As we spread out our towels and set up our umbrella, I couldn't help but feel like we were being watched. I looked around, half expecting to see Alex lurking nearby, but there was no sign of him. Let's hit the water, Dad suggested, already in his swim trunks. I followed him to the shoreline, the waves crashing at our feet. For a moment, I forgot about my worries, lost in the simple joy of the ocean. But then, as I was wading into the water, I saw him. Alex was standing on the beach, not far from where we'd set up. He was staring at me, his eyes cold and calculating. A shiver ran down my spine. I turned and hurried back to our spot. We need to go, I told my parents, my voice tinged with panic. What's wrong? Mom asked, concerned. I just saw that guy from the rest stop, Alex. He's here and he's watching us. Dad looked skeptical. Are you sure it's him? I'm positive. We can't just pack up because you're feeling paranoid, Dad argued. I'm not being paranoid, I insisted. Something's not right about that guy. We need to leave now. Mom looked at Dad, her eyes filled with worry. Maybe we should go, she said softly. Dad sighed, clearly frustrated. Fine, let's pack up. As we hurriedly gathered our things, I kept an eye on Alex. He was still there watching us. And as we headed back to the car, I saw him pull out his phone and make a call. The drive back to the campground was tense, no one speaking. As we pulled in, I noticed a police car parked near the entrance. My heart sank. We need to talk to them, I said, pointing to the police car. Dad nodded. All right, let's see what they have to say. As we approached the officers, I felt a mix of relief and dread. Maybe they could help us, or maybe we were already too late. But as I looked back at the campground, at the people going about their day, oblivious to the danger lurking among them, I knew we had to try. We approached the police officers, their uniforms crisp and their faces stern. Dad took the lead, explaining that we'd seen someone suspicious, someone we'd encountered before. Alex, I added, from Arizona. He's been following us. The officers exchanged glances. We've had a report of a missing park ranger, one of them said. You think this Alex is involved? I can't say for sure, Dad replied, but something about him doesn't sit right. The officers took down our information and promised to look into it. As we walked back to the RV, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were running out of time. We should leave, I said, my voice urgent. We should pack up and go now. Dad hesitated, looking at Mom. What do you think? I think our son is scared, she said softly, and that scares me. We started packing, throwing our things into the RV with a sense of urgency. I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see Alex at any moment but he was nowhere to be seen, and that somehow made it worse. Finally, we were ready to go. Dad started the engine, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Maybe we'd dodged a bullet. Maybe we were going to be okay. And then I saw her, the park ranger who'd been talking to Alex. She was standing at the edge of the campground, her eyes vacant, her face expressionless. And she was holding something in her hand, a red hairband. My heart stopped. Dad, wait. He slammed on the brakes, looking at me in confusion. What is it? Her, I said, pointing to the ranger. She's not herself. Alex did something to her. Dad looked at the ranger, then back at me. You can't know that. I do, I insisted. I can feel it. Suddenly the ranger moved, her hand reaching up to touch the hairband. And then, in a voice that was not her own, she spoke. I could have taught you, she said, her voice dripping with malice. But you chose to run. A bad choice. My blood ran cold. It was Alex's voice coming from her mouth. He'd taken her over just like he'd said he could. Dad floored the accelerator and we sped away, leaving the possessed ranger standing alone. No one spoke for a long time, each of us lost in our own thoughts, our own fears. Finally, Dad broke the silence. What was that? What the hell just happened? I looked at him, my eyes filled with tears. 
I think we just escaped something terrible, something evil. He nodded, his face pale. I think you're right. As we drove, I couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if we'd stayed, if we'd ignored that feeling of dread. And as I looked out the window, watching the Florida landscape speed by, I knew one thing for certain. We were lucky to be alive. But I also knew that Alex was still out there. And that thought filled me with a dread I couldn't shake. We drove for hours, the tension in the RV as thick as the humid Florida air outside. No one wanted to talk about what had happened, as if speaking it aloud would make it more real, more terrifying than it already was. But the silence was its own kind of horror, each of us alone with our thoughts, our fears. Finally, we crossed the state line, leaving Florida behind. I felt a small sense of relief, as if we'd put a physical distance between us and the evil we'd encountered. But I knew it wasn't that simple. Whatever Alex, or the thing that had been Alex, was, it wasn't confined to one place, one state. It was something older, darker, something that couldn't be outrun. We stopped at a rest area, the first we'd seen in miles. I need to stretch my legs, Dad said, his voice shaky. Anyone else coming? I'll stay here, Mom replied, her eyes never leaving the road ahead, as if she could see something we couldn't. I got out of the RV, my legs stiff, my body aching. I walked around the rest area, my eyes scanning the faces of the other travelers. Were they who they appeared to be? Or were they like Alex, something else wearing a human face? As I was about to head back to the RV, my phone buzzed in my pocket. A text message. I pulled it out my hands trembling as I read the words on the screen. I'm disappointed in you, it read. We could have had so much fun together. It was from an unknown number, but I knew who it was from. My heart pounding, I looked around, half expecting to see Alex standing there, watching me. But there was no one, just families on their way to vacations, truckers on long hauls, people living their lives, unaware of the darkness that lurked among them. I got back in the RV my hands shaking as I showed the text to my parents. We need to go to the police, Dad said, his voice tinged with fear. We need to tell them everything. And then what? I asked, my voice hollow. Do you think they'll believe us? Do you think they can stop him? Dad didn't answer, and he didn't need to. We both knew the truth. There was no stopping Alex, no escaping him. He was out there, somewhere, and he would find us, no matter where we went no matter what we did. As we got back on the road, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that we were never truly alone. And as I looked out the window, at the endless road stretching out before us, I knew that we were heading into a darkness far deeper than the night, a darkness that would never end. And somewhere, out there in that endless dark, Alex was waiting. <laughs>